Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodian, custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's indigenous people. Documents. Clark. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committee to meet during the sittings of the Senate? Clark. Yes, Mr President. Committees have lodged proposals as shown at item 4 of today's order of business. An additional proposal has been lodged by the Human Rights Committee for a private meeting from 6.30 p.m. today. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I call the Leader of the Government, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, I seek leave to move Government Business Notice of Motion No. 1. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Mr President. I thank the Senate. Mr President, I so move Government Business Notice of Motion No. 1 relating to uh, the Safe and Respectful Workplaces Training Program and providing uh, procedures for Senators to declare that they have undertaken training in relation to that program. Uh, Mr President, I wish to uh, place on the record the government's thanks uh, to all parties and crossbenchers across this place and across the parliament uh, for the constructive manner in which they have engaged in this motion, as indeed they have engaged constructively through all stages of the response to the foster review that was undertaken uh, to help to provide um, for um, a better process in relation to uh, the receipt and handling of complaints uh, in relation to workplace bullying and sexual harassment uh, in this place, uh, as well as, Mr President, uh, the establishment of the training program. Uh, I acknowledge that many, many members of parliament and staff have already undertaken this training, uh, and this motion will provide uh, a clear means for uh, members and senators to uh, have registered, as the government indicated would occur, uh, publicly. Uh, that they have undertaken the training in accordance with those recommendations. Uh, the government looks forward to continuing to work across the parliament with all members and senators uh, in relation to the implementation uh, of the Foster Review and also uh, of the Jenkins Review, uh, which we expect to be uh, released in coming days. I thank the Senate. There being no further contributions, I'll put Senator Waters. Uh, yes, President, I'd like to speak on the motion, please. You have the call, Senator Ward. Thank you very much. Well, it's very interesting timing. I thought we were going to see this motion at 12.20, and the government's brought it forward to deal with this morning. Now, obviously, we welcome the substance of this, but it's very convenient for the government to try to chew up time whilst it's trying to avoid a different stoush on the floor of the chamber pertaining to which private member's bill will be debated. Um, but we'll have that debate shortly. Can I just place on record that we are here with this development of the Parliamentary Workplace Support Service because of brave souls like Brittany Higgins. And I want to place once again on record my admiration for her courage. Um, and on behalf of women everywhere, we salute the resilience that you have demonstrated and the guts and the metal that you have shown at every turn um, to hold your own party to account, which has ultimately led to what we're seeing today, which is uh, training uh, for all MPs and their staff on sexual harassment and workplace safety. Now, we should have been doing this training anyway. This should have been mandatory from the day dot. But thanks to people like Brittany Higgins and others like um, Dania Marnie and Chelsea Potter and the many other brave women who've spoken out about the harassment that they've received in the political setting, 
we now have a formal process. So I, my office has done the training. It's very good. It, of course, should be mandatory for all MPs and their staff. I understand that's not the case yet. The Greens have made it mandatory, and we would urge other parties to make sure that their own people undertake this training as well. Um, but I want to note that this is not a complete solution. People still realise that there are no consequences that will flow for MPs where those MPs are the abusers, where they are the harassers, where they are the rapists. Constitutionally, the Department of Finance has not been able to deal with that issue. That is still an issue that needs a resolution because our staff know um, and they unfortunately perceive that MPs are untouchable. Now, that's not a safe workplace, is it? When the boss, if the boss is the predator, can get away with it. And we see staff shuffled around from office to office, problem not really dealt with, staff just, staff just moved around, and ultimately it's those staff, generally women, that then leave. Now, that is deeply unfair and unacceptable. And uh, my final point is we had a chance to fix that. We had the debate on the Respect at Work bill um, several sittings ago, and this government squibbed it. It did not implement that key recommendation that there be a positive duty on employers to provide a safe workplace for all of its workers. We had that chance. Greens moved amendments for that, the opposition moved amendments for that, and this government voted them down every time. So it's a bit rich, really, for this government to be uh, holding out that it somehow dealt with this situation when it has not. There is a gaping hole at the heart of workplace protection for women everywhere, not just in parliamentary settings, but workplaces right around the country, because there still is not that legal obligation for employers to provide a safe workplace. The government needs to fix that, and if they won't, they need to get out of the way. Now, I note that the Jenkins report is due to be handed, ta uh, handed down, I believe it's tomorrow, um, and we understand that this uh, PWSS and the foster recommendations were always meant to be an interim treatment of this matter. Um, we very much look forward to the Jenkins report, and we hope that this government will take them seriously and implement all of the recommendations, unlike the 55 Respect at Work recommendations, where the key one was ignored. You better do better tomorrow because women are watching and we won't be placated with this uh, partial down payment on our safety. Women deserve safety in their workplaces right across the country with no excuses. I will put the question. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Senator Rustin, are you seeking the call? Thank you, Mr. President, um, I move that the following bills be considered today at a time for private senators' bills, ensuring Northern Territory Rights Bill 2021 and Health Insurance Legislation Amendment Transparent Patient Outcomes Bill 2021. I'll put the question on the motion. Those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. Private senators' bills um, ordered the day. Resumption of debate on ensuring Northern Territory Rights Bill 2021. The quorum is present. Senator Gallagher, Gallagher are you? Uh, I can assist and perhaps I jump ahead of Thank Senator you. McMahon and speak first, and that will allow her time to. Yeah. Uh, come to the chamber. I, I don't understand what's going on here. Yeah, Senator McMahon was just in the chamber, um, but I. Senator Gallagher, you, you have the call. I, have I think. The call. I think. Yeah, I think your mic is on. Yeah, I can. Yeah. 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 I couldn't hear that. <laughs> no, I'm, it's too I, much. I, I can. <laughs> okay. All right. Yes, Thank Senator you very Gallagher, much. You have the call. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and um, I welcome the opportunity to speak on this bill. I ha would have preferred to have spoken second um, because I understand that Senator McMahon is, um, is planning on moving amendments to her bill which would significantly amend uh, the bill and um, I would welcome those amendments. So my comments would be uh, basically that made following the amendment to her bill. But I would say to get to this point it has been an extraordinary uh, process. Um, this bill 
has been tabled by Senator McMahon some months ago. She attempted to debate it last week. The gov the, her own government refused to allow it to be listed and instead listed a One Nation um, bill in its place. And then we've had some difficulty getting to this point today. We thought it was important that Senator McMahon be allowed to debate her bill. She is leaving the Senate at the next election, as I understand it. Uh, and this bill and the debate on this bill this morning was to provide her with the only opportunity she was going to get to have that debate heard. Um, and she, um, you know, and Labor was happy to facilitate that. In fact, we have given up our spot on the bill. Um, on our own bill this morning to allow Senator McMahon to have uh, that bill debated. As a Territory Senator, though, I am very keen uh, to see passage of legislation in both chambers of this parliament that would allow uh, citizens of the territories uh, to enjoy the same democratic rights as any other Australian. At the moment, there is a difference uh, where, in my in my area, in my neck of the woods, somebody in Queanbeyan, a person who lives in Queanbeyan, has greater democratic rights than a person who resides in the ACT. That is fundamentally unfair. Uh, we don't see it in other areas of law, uh, only in this area. And whilst there may be mixed views about uh, what pe uh, you know, um, voluntary assisted dying and the, the laws that surround that, this bill simply would get rid of, once Senator McMahon has amended it, would allow the overturning of a law made some 24, uh, almost 25 years ago that extinguished the rights of Territorians to be able to debate end-of-life matters in their parliament. Uh, now that has remained on the statute book because the federal parliament has been unable to resolve it. Um, and Certainly as a Territorian, as a senator, as someone who has served in the ACT Legislative Assembly, um, I believe that's fundamentally unfair. There have been bills in this place similar to the bill that Senator McMahon's amended bill will um, progress, and they have failed very narrowly by um, two votes the last time this was tested. Um, and we believe and certainly I believe if it gets to the point where there is a vote on this bill, and that is a matter of a conscience vote for people in the Labor Party, that it is a, that it is a vote that the parliament should support. Because times have moved on. Uh, in 1997, even though I didn't agree with it at the time, uh, that legislation passed this parliament and it put in place this discriminatory regime. But since then, there has been significant international and national progress on laws surrounding the rights of those um, around euthanasia or voluntary assisted dying. In fact, in every single state or territory, there has been progress on this, either the passage of legislation or legislation before their chamber. Uh, which is currently waiting to be voted upon, I think, in New South Wales' uh, instance. So there has been enormous change. We know that across the community, if you ask people, they do believe they should have greater rights when it comes to end-of-life decision-making and rights about control over their own care. Yes, there have to be protections with it, but we leave those matters to the state and territory parliaments to pursue. Um, that is the right place for those matters to be debated. They represent their community um, and they engage with their community as they are shaping those laws. But the thing the federal parliament could do is to overturn the ban on the territory parliaments even being allowed to debate it. I mean, because that's the crazy situation we're in now, where for hundreds of thousands of Australians, their rights are different because of where they live, and that's the only reason. Because they decide to live and work and bring up their families in a territory, they are not allowed, through their local parliament, the ability to debate the end-of-life decision-making or voluntary assisted dying laws. It is crazy. It is, it is, we wouldn't stand for it in any other part of um, lawmaking in terms of the role of the federal parliament. And it is, a, it is something that has existed for 24 years and it is something that should be overturned. That is all this bill, based on the amendments that I understand Senator McMahon will move, will allow uh, to occur. 
It won't put in place any laws around voluntary assisted dying. It won't impose any restrictions. It won't, it, it, it won't change anything for people in the territories immediately. But what it would allow is for legislation to be brought forward in those parliaments and for people to be able to have the debate. And this is an area where I have, um, you know, I, I think advocated certainly for my entire time in politics that that we should have enjoy the same democratic rights as anyone else just because we live in the ACT that shouldn't it affect that. But unfortunately it's not something that Senator Seselja has chosen to support. And we are in the extraordinary situation where we have a senator for the ACT representing the people of the ACT actually saying that his constituents should not have the same democratic rights as anybody else. He's actually saying that his constituents should have less democratic rights than the people who live over the border or who live in Tasmania or who live in WA or South Australia or Queensland. That is the extraordinary position we are in here. We have every federal member other than Senator Selja supportive of the overturning of these laws. We have every member of the Legislative Assembly, even though those members of the Legislative Assembly I know from experience would not all back voluntary assisted dying legislation. They wouldn't, and that is their right. And I completely accept every individual member of parliament and every individual member of the community to have their own formed views on this. And it will change, and they will be different, and there will be disagreement. But allowing the debate to occur is the important thing. And Senator Seselja won't even allow it the debate to occur in the Legislative Assembly, a parliament that he was a member of as well. And we know this because we've been written to by every member of the Legislative Assembly, including the Canberra Liberals, all of them who have petitioned their federal representatives saying, please allow us to have this debate in our parliament. They've actually written to us asking for that through, through their Speaker of their, their Assembly. And we're still in the position where Senator Seselja remains a roadblock to this reform. And it is important, I think, because I think it would change things if you had a Conservative member of the parliament, someone who has strong views around voluntary assisted dying, standing with his colleagues representing the same constituents just to allow the debate to occur, because it's not like we would see these bills overturned or this legislation overturned, the Andrews legislation, and then automatically something would happen in the Assembly. That is not how it would happen. These are mature parliaments. We, we give the ACT and the Northern Territory parliaments the right to legislate and represent their constituents on every other matter that the states are allowed to do. So they run the emergency services, they run the health system, they run the justice system, they run the education system, they run, in the ACT's case, all of the municipal services, all of the infrastructure. They run a budget, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars every year. You know, the parliament's been in place since 1989 in the ACT. They've managed to look after the community very well. Both sides of, of politics have managed in government, and yet for some reason we still have this paternalistic view that the territories can't be trusted when it comes to matters around euthanasia. And this is another example where the community moves faster than the parliament. You know, we've seen it in other areas. We saw it on marriage equality, where the community wondered what all the fuss was about in here. And it's a similar thing on voluntary assisted dying. It is an emotional issue. It is a serious issue. There can be really no other more serious ones than matters of life and death. I accept that. And I accept people will bring their own views to the debate. And I, I support that. And I'm not even sure if I would support the legislation that the Assembly might look at. Both my parents have passed away from cancer in very, very difficult circumstances. I watched both of them pass away. I nursed them. I understand how these are incredibly difficult issues for people. 
for family, for loved ones, for individuals themselves. But at the moment, to anyone who is considering, you know, the end of life due to a terminal illness or the end of life of one of their loved ones, if you are in the ACT, bad luck. You can lobby your local government all you like. Because you know what? At the end of the matter, it, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Because your parliament that you elected, your assembly, is not allowed to debate this matter that might be the most important thing to you. We can debate everything else in the, on the floor of that parliament, but you're not allowed to debate end of life matters. It is absolutely unfair. It is outrageous that it has remained on the statute books for this long, for a quarter of a century. As the community views have changed, as debates have raged and been won and lost, and laws have been passed, as you know, millions of people will have died over that time, you know, all of that, and the territories have been unable to represent their citizens and advocate their point of view in their parliament because of this outdated paternalistic law that the government seems intent on not dealing with. Well, a Labor government, in, if elected, would deal with it. We understand that there will be mixed views on the Labor side about end-of-life decision-making, but one thing that we have from um, Mr Albanese is a commitment that he, that he would allow a private member's or private senator's bill to be put to this chamber and the other chamber if elected, because he recognises the rights of this place to debate it and also the rights of those parliaments, uh, if passed, if legislation passed these chambers, to, to debate end-of-life decision-making too. So this is important. I welcome um, and thank Senator McMahon for bringing this bill um, to the chamber. I think it is right that she be given the opportunity to put this bill. She's worked hard on it. She has sought to engage others in it. I understand she will move amendments that take out certain parts of the bill that Labor was not able to agree with. Um, if those amendments are moved and are put, um, it does change the nature of the bill. And whilst Labor had a position to oppose the bill, if those amendments are moved, it would allow us to move to a conscience vote on the remaining elements of the bill. And as an ACT senator, uh, if we got to that point, I would certainly uh, vote in favour of the McMahon bill with an amendment to incorporate the ACT uh, if that was the remaining provisions of the bill that the Northern Territory and the ACT are allowed to debate voluntary assisted dying legislation with a complete repeal of the Andrews bill, then I would absolutely support that, as I have supported other bills in this place. And I would hope that the Senate, despite people's own views about end-of-life care and voluntary assisted dying, would at least allow every Australian citizen to enjoy the same democratic rights as those citizens who live in the state, because at the moment that isn't what happens. And it's not fair, and it's outdated, it's paternalistic, and we should believe in these state governments who have run our pandemic response and do everything else to be responsible in how they embark on a, decision, on a discussion with their community about voluntary assisted dying. And, and the, frankly, the federal parliament should get out of the Thank way. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Your time has expired. Senator McMahon, you need to seek leave to speak. Uh, I seek leave, uh, Madam Deputy President. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator McMahon. Thank you, um, Madam Deputy President, and um, thank you to, to Senator Gallagher. Um, uh, thank you for acknowledging the work that I have done, and I thank all of my colleagues um, in the Senate for um, for hearing me out on this issue, and for granting me the opportunity to bring this legislation, uh, my private senator's bill, to bring it to the Senate and to have the opportunity to debate it. Um, it is important. 
Um, now, the Northern Territory is, I believe, a very unique place. Um, now, everybody probably believes that about where they live. They probably believe that it's, it's special, um, it's unique, and uh, it's the best place in the world. Um, but the Northern Territory, I believe, is, is unique. It's a huge landmass. I mean, we've got over 1.4 million square kilometres. We don't have many people. We have a very large indigenous population. We have a great deal of difference in um, our socio-economic areas. You know, you've, you've got Darwin, which is a quite metropolitan, cosmopolitan um, city, and, and many people who live there as, as they would in, um, you know, inner city Melbourne or inner city Sydney. And then we have the smaller towns. And now Catherine is, is where I'm from. Catherine is a, a small, well, it's actually about, it's the fourth largest town in the Northern Territory at a population of about 10,000 people. So it really would count as quite a small country town in uh, the rest of Australia. Uh, and then we have uh, our Indigenous communities, which are spread throughout the Northern Territory, often in some very beautiful but inaccessible locations. A lot of these places are not well serviced by roads, um, and, and the people live out there um, in quite a, a, a very small community um, and quite a traditional lifestyle. Um, and we have our cattle stations, uh, isolated farms, isolated properties. Um, some people on, on some of these properties, uh, it might be an 800 kilometre trip one way to go shopping. So, um, you know, it is, it is quite a sparse and unique and different place. Uh, some of our places are also not even accessible by road for most of the year. They have to get their supplies brought in by barge or by small plane. Now, being such a, a small area, we are a territory. We are the Northern Territory, territory the same as the ACT, although the ACT is obviously geographically very small. Um, but, but we are capable of making our own laws. We are capable of governing our people and, um, and making our own decisions and deciding what is best for Territorians. Now, I've just described a little bit of the uniqueness of the place. Now, how can you expect someone who lives in Melbourne or Sydney or Canberra to understand what makes the place and the people tick and to know what is best for those people? You know, only those that live there in that environment, that live with those people, can truly know what is the best thing for Territorians. Um, now, the Northern Territory was the first jurisdiction in the world to legalise voluntary assisted dying or voluntary euthanasia laws. The Rights of the Terminally Ill Act, 1995, was introduced into the Parliament by then Chief Minister and Member for Fanny Bay, Marshall Perrin, on the 22nd of February 1995. Mr Perrin actually resigned his Chief Ministership. Um, that's, that's how important this issue was to him. He resigned his Chief Ministership to introduce the Private Members Bill so as not to influence his colleagues by the weight of his office. That is, that is a pretty big decision to take and, uh, and just shows you the conviction that he had in introducing these laws for Territorians. Mr Perrin said at the time, and I quote, this bill is based on a relatively simple principle. If there are terminally ill patients who wish to end their suffering by accelerating inevitable death, and there are sympathetic doctors who are willing to help them die with dignity, then the law should not forbid it. There are such patients and there are such doctors, and the law does forbid it. So Mr Perrin recognised that um, with the laws forbidding this from occurring, um, that you were taking away people's rights to die without suffering and to die with dignity. Um, his Rights of the Terminally Ill Bill was passed by the Northern Territory's 
Legislative Assembly on 25 May 1995. The Rights of the Terminally Ill Act 1995 entered into law on 1 July 1996, 25 years ago. Now, the following year, the Commonwealth Parliament intervened to overturn this Act. Section 50A was added to the Northern Territory Self-Government Act 1978 to prohibit the Northern Territory from making laws in respect of voluntary assisted dying. In June 1996, Mr Kevin Andrews, member for Menzies in the Commonwealth House of Representatives, announced his intention to introduce a private member's bill to override the rights of the Terminally Ill Act. On 9th of September 1996, he introduced the bill entitled Euthanasia Laws Bill 1996 in the House. On 7th of November 1996, while debate on the bill continued in the House of Representatives, the Senate Selection of Bills Committee recommended and the Senate agreed that the provisions of the bill be referred to the Senate Legal and Constitutional Legislation Committee for inquiry. The report was tabled in the House March 1997. On 9 December 1996, the House of Representatives agreed to the bill with amendments. The Rights of the Terminally Ill Act in the Northern Territory was in force for nine months, during which time four people died by medically assisted procedures. Um, the overturning of this legislation by the Commonwealth was seen at the time in the Northern Territory as taking away the rights of Territorians to legislate for themselves. Now I understand, I, I, I get it, that at the time we were the first jurisdiction in the world to do this. So I understand that, that people in this place went, well clearly they're all mad, they can't make decisions for themselves, um, they've lost the plot, they can't govern responsibly, so we're going to step in and we're going we're to look after those poor people up there in the Northern Territory whose, um, whose government has quite clearly lost the plot. I get that, but that was 25 years ago. Um, time has moved on and the world has moved on and the world is a very different place and there are now many, many jurisdictions that have legislation around voluntary assisted dying, including most states of Australia. And they can make those laws. The states can make those laws. The territories can't. Uh, the territories are still prohibited from legislating for their people. In this way, Northern Territorians are being treated as second-class citizens, and so are the residents of the ACT. The residents of the territories are being treated as though they can't govern for themselves. Now, as we've heard, the territories have, have multi-million, billion-dollar budgets. Um, they look after everything else. They, they legislate for everything else that affects their citizens. But they can't do this one thing that all the states are saying we need to do for the people. Now I get that 25 years ago the Northern Territory was ahead of its time. Uh, his history has proved that. We weren't crazy back then. We were not crazy. We were just ahead of our time. And the fact that almost every other jurisdiction in Australia has, has passed or is considering these laws shows that. We've been vindicated. We, we weren't mad. Uh, we were just ahead of our time. And you might say, well, for the Northern Territory, I mean, you're just a small place, you don't have many people. How could that be? Well, maybe that's why. Maybe that's why. Maybe that because we are a small, tight-knit community that look after each other, because we are isolated up there, because we've, uh, we've grown up with having to look after ourselves and each other. Maybe that is why we were ahead of the game. Maybe that's why we're ahead of our time. Uh, we got together, we saw what was happening, we saw what people wanted, and our Legislative Assembly at the time had the fortitude to pass voluntary assisted dying laws 
for the people of the Northern Territory. Now, I'm, I'm not here to debate what those laws might look like um, or to debate um, the attributes or otherwise of voluntary assisted dying, because that's a matter for the Northern Territory Legislative Assembly to do. That is where they're placed. They can debate those laws. Um, they can bring them into effect if they want to, or they, they can't currently, but they could. Um, so that, that is not for me to debate. Um, I, I am a, an advocate for voluntary assisted dying. I'm a veterinarian. Um, I see what effect the relief of pain and suffering has on animals and their loved ones um, all the time. But that's, that's not the purpose of this. This is not to make laws about voluntary assisted dying or assisted euthanasia. This is to empower the people of the Northern Territory to enjoy the same representation and to enjoy the same uh, power to make their own laws for themselves that almost everyone else around Australia does. You know, the, the two territories are cut out of this. They can't even have this debate. Um, but everyone else in Australia can. Now, is it fair? Is it right? Is it just that just because you happen to live in the ACT or the Northern Territory, you don't enjoy the same right to have the same governance that someone who lives in New South Wales or West Australia or Tasmania does? Is that right that those people don't enjoy that same freedom to have their government pass laws for those people? And that is my argument. That is not right. That is not just. The Commonwealth, the Commonwealth is standing back in every other argument saying, well, it's up to the states. It's up to the states to you know, decide if they, if they want to have um, biosecurity in place. It's up to the states to decide about quarantine. It's up to the states to decide this. Um, but in this area, the Commonwealth government is still saying, no, you can't. We're going to stop you. We're going to override your right to make fair and just and needed laws for your people. And that is absolutely not right. Um, that is not fair. It is time for the Commonwealth to pull back from this argument and to say to the territories, we got, it, we got it wrong 25 years ago. We thought you were mad, we thought you were nuts, we thought you lost the plot, but we were actually wrong. You didn't. Turns out you're ahead of the game and we will give you back the right to make laws if you so desire. If you so desire, we give you back the right to make laws around this very, very sensitive topic it is sensitive, it is emotive, and there are different points of view. But we give you the right to have that debate, to have that discussion with your people, and if that is what they want, to pass laws around, around voluntary assisted dying, if that is what you decide is right for your people. It is time, it is time, Madam Deputy President, for the Commonwealth to get out of the way of the territories, to let them make laws around this, the way they let them make laws around everything else that governs everything from you know, economic policy to, to life and death decisions um, that affect people's everyday lives. Let them make laws around voluntary assisted dying, if they so desire, that will have an effect on people's lives. Territorians, Territorians no longer want and certainly don't need voluntary assisted decision making. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McMahon. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on this bill. And I'll just flag it's very interesting that we are debating this bill this morning. This is private members' time, and normally we'd be debating a Labor bill. Now, there was a big stoush over the weekend when this bill was sought to be listed. And the government, of course, have now caved because they'd rather avoid losing another vote on the floor of the parliament. So I just want to flag that this is a government that's lost 
control now of both houses, and it's caved in and it's listed this bill uh, because it was going to lose the vote. This bill was going to come on anyway. Uh, so that's, a, that's my first point and observation to, to those watching. Now, the other observation I have before I talk to the substance of this bill is the hypocrisy of this government. They are desperate to shed powers to the states when it comes to environmental protection. They've been trying to give away their powers uh, to approve developments that would have a significant impact on matters of national environmental significance since Tony Abbott, Mr Tony Abbott. Uh, so they've been desperate to get rid of those powers. Of course, they've taken a hands-off approach to building quarantine facilities in a global pandemic. I tried to say that wasn't their responsibility. That was up to the states. And yet, on matters of ideology, it wants to tell the states and territories what it can and can't do. Take the religious discrimination uh, bill, for example. It would seek to override states' protections in certain anti-discrimination laws. Uh, what, what an absolute farce. Now, the other, the other uh, thing that's just happened overnight is the federal government have told Queensland and Victoria that it can't sign on to an international pledge to try to limit global warming to less than two degrees. So this government is being highly selective at when it wants to flex its powers, um, when it suits them and when it suits their ideology. They want to tell the states uh, what to do, and when it doesn't suit their ideology, then they're happy uh, for the states to do the heavy lifting. And so we now have today this bill uh, to give rights to the territories. Um, currently, the bill as drafted is just to give rights to the Northern Territory. And I understand there's an amendment to include the Australian Capital Territory uh, within the bill, which the Greens would support. We now have this bill for territories' rights. Now, we strongly support territories having these rights. In fact, the Australian Greens passed a bill in 2011 in this very chamber to ensure that territories had those rights. Naturally, the bill unfortunately did not pass the House, but we passed that Territory Self-Government Legislation Amendment Disallowance and Amendment of Laws Act 2011, which would have uh, removed federal powers to overturn the laws passed by the legislative assemblies of the territories. So we have always been strong supporters of territories' rights, and we support this bill uh, with the amendments, both those flagged by Senator McMahon and those, I understand, just circulated by the Labor Party. Why should people in the territories have fewer rights than the rest of Australia? Why should those legislative assemblies be restricted in what they can even discuss? I'll be very interested to hear what Senator Seselja has to say. I understand he's next on the speaker's list, so I'll keep my comments short because there's also another territory senator, Senator McCarthy, who's listed to make a contribution. I want to make sure those folk have the chance to, uh, to make a contribution. But my understanding is Senator Seselja is the lone person in his party in the ACT that doesn't want uh, this bill to pass. I understand that uh, Canberra Liberals have been begging him uh, to support this bill. So I can't wait uh, to hear what he's got to say about why he wants his very voters to have fewer rights. And I would suggest that, in fact, the ACT this coming election has the chance to elect a Green in place of Senator Seselja, fabulous First Nations woman, Janara Gurengarang, who would back territories' rights and back climate action and action on wealth inequality, for that matter. Uh, but I'll return to the substance of this bill. We have always advocated for the rights of elected assemblies in the territories, uh, in Norfolk Island, in the ACT, to legislate in the interests of their citizens, including on the crucial issue of dying with dignity. We've long advocated for the repeal of the Euthanasia Laws Act of 1997, uh, and voluntary assisted dying is an issue that affects so many families, countless families, medical professionals, healthcare and aged care workers across Australia. I want to flag that some recent polling uh, found that 76 per cent of Australians support voluntary assisted dying, and they support the Commonwealth removing restrictions on the Territory governments uh, to enact voluntary assisted dying laws. In fact, essentially every credible opinion poll over the last two decades has shown that similar level of support for the concept of dying with dignity. And the number of passionate submissions, in fact, on this uh, bill inquiry was a testament to the significance of this issue. 
So since the Euthanasia Laws Act of 1997 overturned the historic 1995 NT Rights of the Terminally Ill Act, which would have allowed euthanasia in the Northern Territory, many of the states uh, have now in fact passed voluntary assisted dying laws. Uh, Victoria, WA, Tassie, South Australia, most recently Queensland, and I understand uh, New South Wales is now well on the way. There's no compelling rationale to allow citizens uh, of the Northern Territory and the ACT to be denied the opportunity to engage in similar debates, particularly in the light of the Northern Territory having led the way on voluntary assisted dying all those decades ago. Given the importance of dying with dignity to so many Australians, all Australians should have, at the very least, the right to have their elected representatives debate the issue and to make laws for voluntary assisted dying um, if they have the majority of those uh, votes on the floor. And I acknowledge that many people have said, well, perhaps they wouldn't support the substance of voluntary assisted dying laws, but that they would support the ability of territories to at least have the debate. Now, the Greens support both, but we absolutely uh, think that there should be no restriction on what the legislative assemblies can even debate. Citizens in the Northern Territory and citizens in the ACT deserve these rights. They want to have this conversation. And this government, uh, this bill from this uh, backbencher, would provide those rights, and this government won't let the bill come to a vote because <laughs> it doesn't want to lose another vote on the floor. It's all about politics with this government. It's not about the rights of people. It's not about the rights of Territorians. It's about making sure the Prime Minister isn't left with egg on his face once again after losing a vote uh, on the floor of the House last week. All about politics, never about the right thing, what's good for the community or what's good for the planet. So bring on the election. Let's turf this awful mob out. The Greens support the intention of this bill. We support the amendments to remove some of the uh, objectionable provisions, um, and we would support the amendment circulated by the opposition to include the ACT in this bill. I'll conclude my remarks early so that we can hear from the two Territorian representatives. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Zazelja. Uh, thank you very much, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak on this bill. And, um, I'll have to start by responding to some of the contribution of Senator Gallagher, who, um, of course, um, right throughout this debate, I think, has sought to make it about a personality issue, uh, and particularly, I think, some of the uh, mistruths and untruths she has peddled in relation to where we are today. In fact, the ver very fact we are debating this bill today undermines one of the key arguments that uh, Senator Gallagher has been making throughout this time, and it is that somehow uh, I have been blocking debate on this bill in the Senate. It's not true, and the fact that it was able to be brought on today is another example of that fact. And in fact, uh, I would well, I would put this I would put this point because Senator Gallagher has been making the argument and saying that she's been committed to this issue uh, and she's been fighting for this issue. But you wonder how much she wants to use it as a political wedge rather than progress the issue because. There's been a lot of labour slots in the last three years for private senators' business, and I'm not aware that during all of that time Senator Katie Gallagher took even one of those slots, and as manager of opposition business, took even one of those slots to introduce her own bill, to bring on another bill, and to have a debate. So, if, if you were fair to income about this after we after we dealt with this issue in 2018, uh, you may have actually brought forward your own bill. Uh, and, and Katie and I, Senator Gallagher and I, have both been very clear on our positions on this issue, uh, but she has not sought to progress the issue, and what she has sought to do instead is to misrepresent my position and, and indeed misrepresent Senator McMahon's position in quite a deliberate way. And, and I, I note the petition, which I think was tabled uh, the other day by Senator Gallagher, and it contained clear falsehoods, falsehoods that were, she was alerted to. Uh, well before she tabled the petition. Uh, in the petition, uh, she claimed that I was deliberately blocking one of my own co coalition colleagues from including the ACT in a private senator's bill to restore territory rights. That, that's untrue. And in fact, if she was in any doubt about whether that was untrue, um, Senator McMahon actually actually wrote to her. Uh, actually wrote to her um, soon after she'd uh, made public that petition to alert her to the fact that it was incorrect. 
and yet she ignored it and she tabled a false petition which she knew to be false. Um, and Sen and Senator McMahon wrote to Senator Gallagher um, uh, on the 19th of July. Um, saying, um, writing in relation to uh, the issue around euthanasia, amongst other things, it says in your public commentary, as well as a, in a petition you have launched, you claim that Senator Zed Seselja deliberately blocked me from including the ACT in my proposed legislation. I wish to clarify to you that your assertions are completely false, baseless, and incorrect. And she goes on. She goes on to emphatically state. Uh, that what Senator Gallagher is putting in her petition to the people of the ACT, so getting them to sign on to a false petition, uh, is incorrect. So she completely misrepresents uh, not just myself but Senator McMahon and seeks to use her as a wedge for her political argument here in the ACT. But as I say, uh, not only did she have the opportunity to bring it on herself over the last three years, and she hasn't devoted one minute of, of the Senate's time to debating a bill that she brought forward. Uh, she then goes on to misrepresent uh, myself and Senator McMahon and in, in relation to the nature of her bill. So the very fact that we are having this debate uh, puts a lie to it, but the fact that the Senator Gallagher has only sought to bring on debate right at the last minute uh, and not sought to use the last three years demonstrates, I think, the political motivations. The other point I would make is that for a long time, uh, people have argued, when I have got up and I have said, I have a position against euthanasia, well, I've been told, no, these bills are not about euthanasia, they are about territory rights. That's what we've consistently been told. When Senator McMahon brought forward a bill that actually dealt with issues including euthanasia but other issues of territory rights, what did the Labor Party say in relation to that? The Labor Party said they would not be supporting that bill. So let's just be clear, the Labor Party's position is not to support territory rights, it's to support euthanasia. Um, if, if that's the case, bring that debate on, and that's part of the debate we're going to be having. Uh, but don't pretend that you actually care about territory rights, because you, you've said when Senator McMahon sought to broaden the issues and deal with other issues that she felt needed to be dealt with for the Northern Territory, the Labor Party, including Northern Territory uh, Labor senators, said they wouldn't support it. So do you support territory rights, or do you just support voluntary euthanasia. And if that's the case, that's fine, but let's be clear about what debate we're having. Uh, and so there needs to be some honesty when we, when we have these discussions, because uh, Senator McMahon brought forward, I think in good faith, her bill uh, that she wanted to. Now we understand it's going to be amended, uh, and then that will bring forward a conscience vote where we deal with the issue of euthanasia. Now, uh, I've put a lot of things on the record, uh, including in the lead-up to the last election. This was last debated uh, in the Senate uh, in uh, 2018, I believe, a few months out uh, from the 2019 election. Uh, and I won't repeat all of the words uh, that I uh, used and all of the points that I made during that debate, but there are a number of, of important points uh, as, we, as we look at this issue. And one of them uh, is in relation to—and just, and just finally on the issue of territory rights, uh, as I say, the Labor Party uh, not only wouldn't support Senator McMahon's bill, but also in the past have voted directly to overturn Northern Territory bills uh, on mandatory sentencing. Uh, so when it comes to issues that they don't support, uh, they have been very happy to utilise the Commonwealth constitutional powers in relation to territories to override uh, a law of the Northern Territory. And that has been the Labor Party's view, and I believe even the current leader of the opposition uh, was part of the opposition that actually voted for that. Um, so then we heard from Senator Gallagher in relation to, uh, she says, well, in, in the ACT, uh, if you go over to Queanbeyan, uh, they have more rights. Well, let's be clear on what the Senator Gallagher and others are arguing for for the ACT. Uh, they are arguing actually for 13 members of the Territory Assembly to have actually more rights. Uh, than those in New South Wales, because uh, yeah, yeah, what happens in New South Wales is they have this thing called an upper house, uh, which is a check and balance uh, on the power of the lower house. That is something that we don't have in the ACT or indeed in the Northern Territory. And so when she says she wants to have the same rights, actually she wants 13 members of this Labor Greens government to have far more power uh, than the New South Wales government has, because if it were to pass in New South Wales in the lower house, it would go through uh, the detailed inquiry and the scrutiny of an upper house. Now we don't have that for the territories, uh, and the only check on territory power is this Commonwealth Parliament. Now, we exercise that intervention very rarely, it must be said, very rarely. Uh, but it came together in a conscience vote many years ago, and it was tested again in a conscience vote, and we saw Labor members, 
We saw Liberal members, we saw Nationals members and crossbenchers uh, voting uh, not to overturn the Andrews legislation uh, in 2018. In relation to um, another couple of important points I'd like to make on the issue more broadly, uh, when we look at the issue of assisted suicide and whether or not we can, we can trust the 13 members uh, of the ACT Assembly uh, to deliver uh, fair and just laws in relation to assisted suicide, uh, I would just point uh, members of the Senate to the performance of the ACT government and their health system. Uh, the management of the health system under this government has been an absolute disgrace. And anyone who thinks uh, that uh, when they've underinvested in palliative care, when they have some of the longest waiting times for elective surgery in the country, uh, that passing these type of laws in the ACT unchecked, and make no mistake, uh, they would be the most extreme uh, unchecked uh, euthanasia laws in the country by far. Uh, if they were to pass those, would that improve the situation for, for those who are doing it tough and going through the health system, those experiencing palliative care? Would we see more investment compared to the underinvestment in palliative care from the ACT government? Would there be an incentive for them to do that? Uh, you know, we, heard, we heard from Michael Chapman, Dr Michael Chapman, uh, Canberra Hospital's Director of Palliative Medicine, who said our pressing priority to provide end-of-life choices in the ACT requires people to have real access to quality palliative care, which is currently not always the case for many and not always the case when we need it. People often receive too little or too late or no services at all. And Dr Chapman's evidence to the inquiry into end-of-life choices in the ACT confirmed that there are just four full-time equivalent palliative palliative medicine specialists operating in the Territory, half the number required for the size of the population. And given that the Territory treats many patients from the surrounding regions, this number again falls short. Um, John Watkins, the chair of the board of Canberra's Calvary Hospital, also notes, uh, rather than weakening current protections, we should instead be talking about how we best support the dignity and personal needs of those reaching the end of their life in addition to their families and make sure that care is available and accessible to all. It's also significant to note uh, that the 2016 review of the National Palliative Care Strategy found that there remain significant barriers to access to palliative care services for a number of people within the population, particularly for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And there is work to be done in developing culturally specific activities to address the needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to improve access for those who need it. Indeed, Senator Pat Dodson uh, in this place uh, spoke to this issue. Uh, when we debated uh, this, a similar bill uh, in uh, the Senate uh, in 2018. And I'll quote from uh, Senator Dodson, uh, where First Nations people are already overrepresented at every stage of our health system, it is irresponsible to vote in, in favour of another avenue to death. Paving the way for euthanasia and assisted suicide leaves First Nations people even more vulnerable, when our focus should be on working collectively to create laws that help prolong life and restore their right to enjoy a healthy life. Uh, so Senator Dodson uh, makes an important point, and I'd, I'd just note uh, on that, um, when Senator Gallagher seeks to uh, make it about uh, my position, which has been on the record uh, for many years, including uh, ahead of the last election, uh, where the Labor Party sought to make this a, a, an issue uh, at the election, and they, they encouraged people, as is their right, to vote against me because of my views on issues including euthanasia. But when, when um, they seek to make it simply about my vote, being one of the 39 senators who voted against the bill last time, it's also a criticism uh, of her colleagues. It's also a criticism of her colleagues, including Senator Dodson, uh, who happen to have a different view. Uh, and as I, say, as I said at the outset, uh, you know, when, when, when Senator Gallagher and others try and claim uh, that it's not about your views on euthanasia, it's actually about territory rights. Well, that has been the, the lie to that has been put by the way they have treated Senator McMahon's bill. If it was not about the issue of euthanasia, if it was simply about the issue of territory rights, then why wouldn't you support all aspects of Senator McMahon's bill? Why wouldn't you be simply removing any restrictions on the Northern Territory to legislate in exactly the same way as a state? Well, it doesn't have that same right, and if this bill, in its amended form, were to pass, it would continue 
to not have those same rights. So we, we are brought back to this conscience issue, uh, which I know uh, in this chamber and across the country people have different views on. Uh, I've put my views on that issue on the record, uh, but to try and misrepresent them in the way that Senator Gallagher has throughout this debate, uh, to misrepresent that in any way I tried to block Senator McMahon from bringing this bill forward, that's incorrect. It's absolutely incorrect. And the fact that you've got to uh, misrepresent the situation in terms of making your argument. I mean, we had the embarrassing situation where the ACT Assembly wrote to all senators, wrote to all senators and repeated that falsehood uh, that Senator Gallagher had put in her petition. The embarrassing situation that an assembly uh, arguing to have more rights, to have more power, uh, to deliver laws, couldn't even deliver an honest statement, had to actually have a complete misrepresentation in terms of making its argument, I think undermines uh, those arguments. Just finally, uh, in the time I have left, um, uh, former Labor Prime Minister Paul Keating uh, has had significant things to say about this, but he talked about um, the he talked about um, what happens with the further liberalisation of these type of laws. Uh, that when you pass euthanasia legislation, uh, what you see is the further liberalisation. Well, we've seen that in Europe. We've seen extreme versions of that in Europe. And I would put to you, put to the Senate, that in fact even in the parliaments in Australia that have passed it, in Victoria, uh, we saw significant restrictions and significant safeguards when it was passed. We've seen less in WA and less again in Queensland. Uh, I would put it to you what we will see. Uh, should we see uh, the ACT uh, legislating on this issue is uh, laws with the least safeguards in the country. Uh, we do still have some constitutional responsibilities here. We can choose to exercise those. We do it very rarely. We do it on some of the most significant issues. Uh, and, but in terms of this bill, uh, as it's going to be amended, as I understand it, uh, which I understand will be a conscience vote, uh, I won't be supporting the bill. Thank you, Senator Sazilja. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I certainly rise to stand and support Senator McMahon's bill for territory rights for the people of the Northern Territory and for the people of the ACT. Could I just put on the record, though, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, what a load of rubbish uh, some of the words that came from Senator Sazelja. This bill would not have come before the Senate if it had not been for the Australian Labor Party uh, pushing for uh, Senator McMahon's bill to come before the Senate. Why? Because the federal government, the coalition government, the prime minister himself has intervened to stop Senator McMahon to be able to bring anything to this Senate, which is outrageous, Madam Acting Deputy President, absolutely outrageous. It is systemic of this government to bully, to intimidate, to antagonise and to stop the rights of people having their democratic say, in particular here in the Parliament of Australia, to be able to have their rights to speak in the House, to speak here in the Senate. Senator McMahon brought this bill on with great sincerity on behalf of the people of the Northern Territory. And this bill should have been listed well before this government was forced to bring it in five minutes before the bells rang this morning. Why did they do that, Madam Acting Deputy President? They did it because they had no choice. They knew that there was support for Senator McMahon's bill because we want to see in the Northern Territory Parliament and the ACT Parliament the ability for those members in those parliaments to debate these laws. Why is it, Madam Acting Deputy President, that the people of the Northern Territory and the ACT are second-class citizens? Why is it that nearly every other state parliament in this country can debate, end of, uh, debate laws for, for end of days? You know, why are we afraid to enable the people of the Northern Territory and the ACT to do exactly that? For me personally, I don't support voluntary assisted dying. It is not something that I would want to see. But I support very much the right of the people of the Northern Territory and indeed the Northern Territory Parliament to debate itself. 
the right, the democratic right, where they can argue, where they can speak passionately about issues impacting or possibly affecting their very own constituents who put them in there. So why do we think we have to be the big brother or the big sister stopping the people of the ACT and the Northern Territory to be able to debate what happens at the end of life for their families, brothers and sisters, their mothers and fathers, to be able to speak with the medical fraternity, to be able to talk to the aged care, to be able to talk to the churches. Why are we afraid to enable them to do that? And yet we expect the people of those territories to do everything else, this parliament says. You know, as Senator Gallagher pointed out, the Prime Minister keeps throwing everything back to the state and territory premiers. Oh, you're responsible for quarantining. You're responsible to put people in the hotels. It's interesting, isn't it? What it is this parliament, and I think uh, Senator Waters actually raised that point, this parliament likes to dictate what it can and can't do in the territories. And yet here we have a government senator, a very courageous government senator, backbencher, who has not only stood up to her colleagues, both in the Nationals and the Liberals for the people of the Northern Territory, on this particular bill coming forward today, but she also fought with me to save the seat of Lingiari, so that we could have two seats in the Northern Territory and not revert back to one. And again, the bullying and harassment that went on to prevent Senator McMahon from even being able to do that is absolutely outrageous. And these are the reasons why people do not stand for politics. These are the reasons why women in particular think twice about standing for politics. It's an absolute disgrace that members on that side have not given the Territory Senator for the country Liberal Party the support that she needed to get this bill here into the Senate and the support and the respect and dignity to be able to speak. There's only two of us, for goodness sake. There's 12 of you in every other state, 12 senators, all bullying one on your side. Is that an indication of what you think of the people of the territories? Because that's the only thing we can take away from that. If this is how you treat your senator, then no wonder the people of the Northern Territory and the people of the ACT think they don't matter, that their voice is not important, because that is the only image you give when you do that not only to this particular bill but to the particular senator who has tried to bring it forward. And I commend Senator McMahon for doing this. As I've said, I do not support voluntary assisted dying. I have my personal reasons for that. But I will fight vehemently for the rights of the Northern Territory Parliament and the ACT to be able to debate it most passionately, with great maturity, with great compassion. So I urge senators here today to realise the significance of this moment in this parliament this year and the fact that we've had to, as the Labor opposition, force this private senator's bill to the floor this morning. Next year it will be a hundred years when the Northern Territory was able to have its first member in the Australian Parliament. A hundred years. And that was one seat. We've only got two seats in terms of Solomon and Lingiari. So our voices have not grown significantly at all. Do not diminish us just because you can. Do not silence us just because you can. And do not bully us just because you think you can, because that will not be tolerated. 
With this particular bill, the Ensuring Northern Territory Rights Bill, we'd certainly like to see the amendments come forward, Madam Acting Deputy President, in terms of uh, uh, the two aspects that Labor does not support, and that is not because we don't support Territory Rights Bill. We have had this discussion uh, with the senator opposite that uh, the Australian Labor Party has concerns about the fair work rights aspect of it and obviously the aspects around the land. And I understand uh, when Senator McMahon does move those two amendments from it, uh, we will absolutely be supporting this bill wholeheartedly. And certainly uh, Senator Cody Gallagher will be moving to include the ACT. And I think it's, uh, I I think it's really interesting to observe Senator Zazelja's comments around this. Uh, Senator Cady Gallagher was no way in all uh, reluctant to see this bill come forward. In fact, it's her bill, her private senator's bill, that's been removed completely from today's debate. In fact, not sure when we'll get it back on again. I mean, who knows? Are we coming back after these parliamentary sittings? Will we be here before the next election? Who knows? But Senator Gall Gallagher has willingly given up her spot on a very, very important senator's bill for her uh, to enable this debate to take place. So whatever Senator Zazelja has to say on it really shows little comfort at all, if any, to the fact that he's had any willingness uh, to support the territories to be able to uh, have their rights empowered again in these parliaments uh, so that that discussion and debate can take place. And I think shame on you, Senator Zazelja, for trying to uh, bring to this Senate such disrepute uh, in saying that you brought this bill on this morning, that it was the government. Uh, no, it wasn't. Not at all. This was us. This was completely the Labor Party. And this was done because we fairly believe in the sincerity of Senator McMahon's bill to improve the rights for the people of the ACT and the Northern Territory. I think, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, one of the things that I'm acutely aware of, uh, should this bill pass, that there will be passionate debate, in particular in the Northern Territory. I know that with over 100 Aboriginal languages there, the importance of communication, the importance of being able to understand what uh, the ability to debate this in the Northern Territory Parliament would mean. It would come back to the 25 members of the Legislative Assembly in the Northern Territory to discuss and debate. And I have no doubt that each and every one of those 25 members of the Northern Territory Assembly will have to dig deep. They will have to dig deep and find out where do they stand on this issue of voluntary assisted dying. It has been over two decades since the Northern Territory led the way. And I have to say and agree with Senator McMahon's comments there that it was the Northern Territory that courageously brought this forward well ahead of its time. You know, were we mad? Were we crazy? Were we all these things? Well, let's have a look at the state parliaments around the country who have now had their own debates. And no doubt every single parliamentarian in each of those states that have debated uh, end, of, end of life have no doubt dug deep to find out what it means for them and their conscience and their family and their Christian beliefs and their ability to sit comfortably or uncomfortably with it. But that's because we're a democracy. Isn't that what we pride ourselves on as Australians? Isn't that the one thing that really does hold us together? The belief in our ability to speak respectfully, respectfully. And I have to raise that because there are many views of late in thinking that uh, shouting at people, uh, threatening people and bullying people is democracy. Well, that's not democracy. It's not the democracy I want, that's for sure. It's the ability to stand up and agree to disagree. It's the ability to listen respectfully, but also know that uh, in this particular instance, it's about the Senate, the House of Reps and parliamentarians at the Australian government level realising that sometimes 
Democracy is also about letting go. Let go of the power you hold on to so fiercely in this place and let the peoples of the Northern Territory and the ACT be able to make up their own minds and have the right to do so. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Uh, Senator Patrick, I think, was on feet. Senator McMahon. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to move the amendments on sheet 1469 together. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I just rise to make a short contribution to this debate. Uh, I will, in opening up, simply state that. Uh, I do support euthanasia. This bill is not about that, however. This bill is about how responsible systems of government work. In a responsible system of government, we have the government responsible to the parliament who are responsible to the people. So it's not really a matter for me to decide how laws are passed in the ACT or the Northern Territory. That is a matter for the parliaments of the Northern Territory and for the Parliament of the ACT. It's not for Senator Smith to decide what the laws are in the Northern Territory. It's not for um, Senator Sullivan to decide what the laws are in the ACT. It's not for Senator Waters to decide what the laws are in uh, the ACT or Northern Territory because uh, she's not responsible to that electorate. Okay? The principle ought to be that those who legislate, those who pass laws that affect the conduct and the rights of people are responsible to those people and ultimately those people can rid themselves of, uh, of that member if they don't like the way in which they vote. So it, it is pretty important that we understand that uh, that is what this is about. This is about proper systems of government where we hand responsibility to the parliaments that actually um, are voted in by their respective, uh, their respective people. Um, I do hope this do does come to a, 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 a debate because, it, in some sense, it is a proxy for, for euthanasia. I, I can't imagine why anyone would vote against allowing a parliament to set their own laws, a parliament of the state to set their own laws, unless they had a feeling that they, did, that, that they didn't like those laws. Um, and uh, I just note that in this chamber, in the last week or so, we've had uh, a number of coalition MPs crossing the floor to vote for choice. And uh, one would hope that if this does come to a vote, uh, some of those people that were voting for choice would also vote to allow choice in the Northern Territory and in, uh, and in uh, the ACT. Under responsible systems of government, we should let the Parliament of the ACT and the Northern Territory uh, pass laws that relate to their people. S Senator Patrick, oh. Sorry, I was whether Senator Patrick would like to seek leave to continue his remarks. Yes, I would like to uh, Thank you, seek Senator leave to Patrick. continue my remarks. Thank you, Thank you. Senator Patrick. Uh, Clark. General Business Order of the Day number 95, Health Insurance Legislation Amendment Transparent Patient Outcomes Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Grief. Uh, thank, you, uh, thank you, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President. This bill will improve health outcomes, the outcome of the surgery and, most importantly, the outcome for the patient. For the very first time, patients who are facing surgery will be able to make an informed choice about their practitioner and their hospital, rather than flying blind by accepting without question the surgeon and the hospital selected by their GP. This bill does this by allowing the Health Minister to create public-facing databases that will detail the performance record of individual surgeons. These databases will also detail the surgical outcomes of the hospitals and clinics in which surgery occurs. Too regularly, we hear of horror stories of patients who were scarred for life, left in agony. 
patients who have had to undergo numerous corrective surgeries, otherwise known as revisions, and whose lives are forever impacted by the careless knife of a cocky or inexperienced surgeon. As many in this place would know, the slow-moving regulator often seems close to useless in this space. You only have to look at the most recent media story of surgical incompetence to see this, that of cosmetic surgeon Daniel Lanza, who has reportedly agreed to stop practising in Australia after a joint Four Corners and Fairfax investigation. It took the media to uncover his appalling practices and put an end to him. Where was the regulator, the medical board, the college? How did valid patient complaints not result in the outcome that one media investigation did? This is not an unfamiliar story. We've all read harrowing style stories of patients who have undergone a botched procedure and then find themselves in a traumatic battle with the hospital, their surgeon and the system in their often hopeless attempt to get answers and ensure others don't suffer the exact same fate. Consumers need more power in their hands to make informed decisions, and that is the sole reason that I am proposing this bill. This bill will empower the Health Minister to make rules to create and maintain a transparent patient outcomes register for a range of medical specialties. Each register will be a public-facing database that will give patients information on the number and types of procedures performed by each surgeon, their surgical revision rates, their mortality rates, their patient demographics, the type and class of prosthesis used, if that is relevant, and perhaps even their fees. It is intended that these registers would also detail the performance standards of each facility and for each surgical specialty, because where surgery happens also influences surgical outcomes. This bill will also require the Minister to consult with the Information Commissioner to ensure the rules don't breach any privacy rules. Ultimately, the information included on these registers would be determined by the relevant minister, but the aim is to include the relevant information for each specialty that would allow patients to make an informed choice about the skill of their prospective practitioner and the standards of each particular facility. The rules in this bill are not prescriptive. It gives the minister flexibility about how a transparent patient outcome register will deal with newly minted surgeons who are still building up their bank of experience or how to deal with complaints about incorrect information. This bill is not about creating gotcha databases that undermine professionals. It will ensure that registers are not used in unintended ways and it specifies that information collected for or held on the registries cannot be used against surgeons in civil or criminal proceedings. Even so, I know many of the medical colleges won't support it at all. They like to have a closed shop. We found that recently with the IVF industry, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later. They will claim that the bill will create perverse incentives and penalise average performers. I absolutely disagree. Patients want to know if their surgeon is competent. High fees are no guarantee of this. Neither are framed certificates on a surgeon's wall or the letters after his or her name. Results speak for themselves. And where there is transparency, there is always improvement, every single time. Bringing this performance information into the light will ensure surgeons persist with their ongoing education and keep their skills up to date. It will likely root out complacency and may even help ensure that those who charge the highest fees do in fact earn them. The successful collaboration and launch of the Your IVS Success website earlier this year demonstrated the value and public interest in public disclosure of surgical performance outcomes. That first step improve medical transparency significantly, and it should be the model for all surgical specialties. The process of building such databases did not need to be complicated. 
I know that this data already exists for some specialties, and for instance, orthopaedics uh, has absolutely outstanding data uh, going over, I think, well over 20 years. The Australian Orthopaedic Association National Joint Replacement Registry contains information on all hip, knee, shoulder, elbow, wrist, ankle and spinal disc replacement surgery performed in public and private hospitals throughout Australia. It also collects what they call patient-reported outcome measures, pre- and post-surgery regarding pain and outcomes of the surgery. This data exists. It is shared with surgeons, but not the public. Individual performance data is available for each surgeon to view and to see how their performance tracks against unidentified peers. They can see whether they plot above or below their fellow orthopaedic surgeons and how many of them are in the low or high ranges. Wouldn't that be valuable information if you're about to undergo a hip replacement or a knee replacement? This database has existed since 2002. One intention of this disclosure and ranking process and one of the great benefits is that it will encourage poor performers to lift their game. The registry shows that a few surgeons continue to use poorly performing prosthesis. It also shows a small but significant number of surgeons perform well below expected standards with much higher revision or repeat operation rates for joint replacement than their peers. Currently, the public only get a small window to see the wealth of orthopaedic surgery data and have no idea whether their surgeon, the surgeon that they are seeing, is a good or poor performer. Orthopaedic surgeons perform a significant proportion of all surgeries. This means they affect a significant proportion of patients. In fact, 15% of all hospital admissions in 2017-18 were for orthopaedic surgery, including knee and hip replacements. 15 per cent, a massive, massive number. Given the life impacts of poor prosthesis and surgical revisions, I would argue that these households, these thousands of people in households who have been orthopaedic patients should be able to get objective performance data about their surgeon before they go under the knife. Every patient who undergoes any invasive surgery should have this information available to them. It's their money and their health at stake. Their health. They shouldn't just have to rely on the reassurances of their surgeon or referring GP that everything will be fine. This is a bill for consumers. It's not a bill to protect people that are not doing the right thing, that are not up to scratch. It is a bill for consumers. They are often sidelined or feel ignored when things go wrong, as surgeries sometimes do. The Transparent Patient Outcomes Register created through this bill can alleviate some of this needless suffering by helping guide patients before they set off down a road that they may well regret. The databases could also serve to reassure an anxious patient. Those considering surgery will be able to look up the performance record of their intended surgeon and know whether their doctor is well versed in their particular operation or just a dabbler. Research shows that surgeons who perform fewer surgeries of particular types compared to their peers have increased revision rates, which again are repeater operations going back in to likely fix a problem. Um, and they have poorer patient outcomes overall. A 2014 study that looked at complications arising from hip replacement surgery found that patients whose surgeons have performed 35 or fewer hip um, surgeries in the previous year had an increased risk of dislocation and early revision. If you're about to have a hip operation, wouldn't you want to know whether your surgeon choice meant a greater or lower risk? I would. I think everyone here would, but currently that information is unavailable to you. The bill also deals with an administrative hurdle that would otherwise require data from a minority of specialties, including orthopaedic surgery, to be collected twice from hospitals. 
the Orthopaedic Association National Joint Replacement Registry is deemed a quality assurance activity under the Health Insurance Act 1973. Identifying data collected for the purpose of a quality assurance activity currently cannot be disclosed to another person or a court without consent at the risk of serious penalty. Now, the intention behind the provisions in the Act is to provide protection from civil liberty claims. Now, this bill seeks to retain this protection by doing two things. First, it will prohibit data collected for or held on a transparent patient uh, outcomes register from being used in court. And second, it creates an exemption for disclosure of quality assurance activity data if it is, is in accordance with the rules set by the minister. The bill intentionally prevents data collected for or held on a transparent patient outcomes register from being used in unintended ways that cannot be supported by health facilities and practitioners, such as to sue surgeons or to bring criminal proceedings against them. That is not what this is about. As I stated previously, the intention of this bill is to provide objective and useful performance data that will help patients make an informed choice about their doctor and their hospital before they proceed to surgery. If patients have a clear review of their surgeon's performance and revision rates, it will help them steer clear of surgeons who aren't experienced in their procedure or who have higher than average revision or repeat operation rates. Without doubt, it would mean fewer complications and surgical trauma for the patient. That is a most worthy outcome. In an environment where we can't rely always on the regulator, the colleges and the hospitals to rally around patients, we should help them help themselves. This is a most important bill, a very important bill to me, and I hope all senators here will support it. Thank you, Directing Deputy President. I rise today to speak on the Health Insurance Legislation Amendment, Transparent Patient Outcomes Bill 2021, which was introduced to the Senate by Senator Griff on the 23rd of November 2021. As Chair of the Senate Community Affairs Legislation Committee, I wish to make a brief contribution to the debate. I also wish to acknowledge Senator Griff's interest in and active participation and involvement in a number of inquiries undertaken by this committee. Senator Griff has a particular interest in the transparency of outcomes, as evidenced by another of his bills, the Aged Care Financial Transparency Bill, which is also before the Senate, as well as his ongoing influential and determined support for the transparency in relation to IVF clinics, which saw the launch of the Your IVF Success website earlier this year. This website, together with a searchable database that provides comparable fertility clinic success rates across Australia, was developed in association with UNSW Sydney. The development of this informative and interactive site was funded through a Medical Research Future Fund grant provided by the Australian Government and is a testament to the outcomes that can be achieved through collaboration. The IVF Success Estimator allows people to make informed choices about their conception options. It draws on the experience of over 600,000 IVF cycles performed in clinics across Australia to formulate an individualised estimate of IVF success for patients. This then informs the discussion between the patient and clinicians. What a great outcome, and thank you, Senator Griff, for your determination to see it eventuate. I have many friends who have been through the IVF program in the past, and this valuable tool would certainly have assisted them at that time. I note that in a speech to this place, around the time of the launch for the IVF website, Senator Griff foreshadowed the tabling of the bill before us today, when he stated that it was his, and I quote, hope that one day we will have similar performance transparency for all specialists performing all surgeries in both public and private hospitals. Transparency and accountability are key to improving health outcomes for all of us. They also mean that outliers have nowhere to hide and must lift their game, all to the benefit of patients and to the benefit of the health system." End quote. Senator Griff believes that public disclosure of any surgical performance outcomes, including such areas as gynaecological, cardiothoracic, orthopaedic, plastic and reconstructive surgeries, would all be relevant to the proposed transparency of outcome and would provide consumers with greater control in determining their, determining their surgical provider. 
As outlined in Senator Griff's second reading speech, this bill would enable the minister to make rules to create a transparent patient outcomes register that would include information such as the number and type of surgical procedures performed by a practitioner, their surgical revision rate, their patient mortality rate, any prosthesis device they may use, patient data and any other information deemed relevant to that specialty. When reading Senator Griff's speech, I noted that he focused on joint replacement surgery as one example of where a pa patient may wish to select an orthopaedic surgeon who has undertaken significantly higher proportion of surgeries than other. As a consumer in this space, it is something that I can definitely relate to and note that I relied on considered advice from my medical practitioner, personal investigation and research and third party references to determine the surgeon that I propose to use for my knee replacement. As outlined by Senator Griff earlier, although data in relation to orthopaedic surgeon performance and patient outcomes is collected by the Australian Orthopaedic Association National Joint Replacement Registry, which is funded by the Health Department, the information held by the register is not available for use for any other purpose. It's simply a quality assurance activity as required by the Act. Senator Griff's bill seeks to access this data and allow the reuse of relevant data that is already being collected to be provided for the purpose of a transparent patient outcomes register. The explanatory memorandum provided by Senator Griff details how the transparent patient outcomes bill will preserve the current protections afforded to this information. The explanatory memorandum also includes details on how the bill seeks to provide protection from liability for secondary disclosure of quality assurance data, which is collected for or contained on a transparent patient outcomes register. Orthopaedic surgery is one example. However, as mentioned earlier, there are many others where shining the light on surgical outcomes may assist consumers as they make decisions about potential surgeries. Cosmetic and plastic surgery has been highlighted over recent months through a number of media stories, including Todd Sampson's documentary, Mirror Mirror. Examples of unaccepted outcomes from surgeries performed by inexperienced and often barely qualified health professionals in that field have been highlighted. Interestingly, this phenomena has also come to light during the Community Affairs Reference Committee's inquiry into the administration of registration and notifications by the Australian Health Practitioners Regulation Agency, APRA, and related entities under the Health Practitioner Regulation National Law. This inquiry is continuing and will report in the new year. However, from evidence received already, it is quite possible that access to more transparent and accountable patient outcomes may have enabled different decisions to have been made by those who have approached the committee with their concerns as well. As those in this place would be aware, the Australian Government is working with states and territories under the 2020-25 National Health Reform Agreement, the NHRA, to improve access to timely, fit-for-purpose information which is needed to make informed decisions about healthcare. All levels of government are working with the health sector to better understand and remove systemic barriers to improving healthcare and outcomes. And under the NHRA, progress is being made. The National Health Reform Agreement Long-Term Reforms Roadmap was endorsed by all Australian health ministers at the health ministers' meeting on the 17th of September this year. Providing flexibility to achieving the outcomes is a key component of the roadmap, allowing jurisdictions to respond to changing circumstances. They will have the flexibility to identify priority reforms and determine the scope and timing of activities to best suit local needs and support local health system diversity, readiness and funder and provider capabilities. The roadmap includes an extensive plan for each reform area, including a vision statement, aim, case for change, links to other reforms, intended outcomes, key concepts and COVID-related developments. The roadmap identifies actions, deliverables and timeframes for the following key areas of reform nationally cohesive health technology assessment, paying for value and outcomes, joint planning and funding at a local level, empowering people through health literacy, prevention and wellbeing, enhanced, enhanced health data and interfaces between health, disability and aged care systems. So one of the key components contained in the roadmap, obviously enhanced health data, clearly aligns with the intent of Senator Griff's bill 
subject to access being made available to the specified data. The rationale for the enhancement of health data, as explained in the document, states that this reform supports Australia's governments in their commitment to realise the value of public health data through greater data sharing and information access to transform healthcare, drive efficiency and safety, create productivity gains and allow better decision making. It will ensure that relevant, robust and timely data is available to the appropriate people to support shared patient-clinician decision-making, improve service delivery, evidence-informed policy development, research and analytics, and system planning. Maintaining data security and preserving individuals' privacy will be central to the reforms. By expanding public reporting on quality, safety and value of health services, it is possible that we will see improvements in the health system and improve accountability for outcomes. The NHRA work will build on the Australian Health Performance Framework and ex existing hospitals, excuse me, an existing hospital level reporting by the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare on inf information such as emergency department performance, elective surgery waiting times and healthcare associated infections. The long-term health reforms under the NHRA are intended to provide better coordinated care in the community, focus on prevention and keeping people healthier longer and to reduce pressure on hospitals. These systemic reforms will also help improve the experiences of people using services across the health, aged care, disability and mental health sectors. The stated intent overall is that the long-term reforms will make it easier for people to manage their health. I understand that the Minister for Health, the Honourable Greg Hunt, has undertaken to consult further with key stakeholders in relation to Senator Griff's bill and is anticipating that a report will be provided to him early in the new year. The findings of the report will be discussed with Senator Griff and other interested parties at that time as we look to provide more information to the Australian public in support of their health care decisions of the future. Thank you. Thank you, Sandowski. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Health Insurance Legislation Amendment Transparent Patient Outcomes Bill 2021. Um, Labor supports the goals of this bill and we welcome this debate and we thank Senator Griff through you, Acting Deputy President, uh, for the forethought uh, and um, the care and compassion that has gone into the thinking behind this bill. Labor thinks there's a good philosophical point in that which Senator Griff has pr proposed. It's, after all, it's hard to, under, to overestimate the importance of the ability of people to make informed decisions about their own lives. This applies to goods they may buy, to how they spend their time and to their decisions about health care. Senator Griff's bill is driven by an understandable impulse that people make better decisions when they have more information about the decisions they are making. And could I add on that, of course, is we don't want to be um, patronising or patriarchal in terms of how people spend their lives, what decisions they make, and indeed, really what is most important uh, if, we can, you know, if we consider that health is a, one of the most important aspects of our life, that having good health is one of the most important aspects of our lives, then of course this bill goes to enable people to allow them to make decisions around their health and uh, is very important. So we thank Senator Griff. You know, this has been a long-term philosophical aspect of democracy. So, you know, Cicero in the century before the birth of Jesus Christ, you know, the great Roman statesman, lawyer, orator and consul, and I'm actually just rereading De Republica at the moment, he said that the safety of the people should be the highest law. And Thomas Jefferson followed on from that thought and said, the care of human life and happiness and not their destruction is the first and only object of good government. So in light of those, that philosophical line of, of reasoning, this bill goes to enable people, enable Australians to go to a health system that will support it, and support it in ways where they are comfortable with the decisions they can make about their health care. And I would say, uh, you know, there's a view that successful leaders, true leaders, understand that true power comes from not exercising control, but from empowering others. And that's what this bill seeks to do. It seeks to empower all of us uh, to have the requisite information to make decisions about our own health care. 
you know, when, when, whether you go to a pub, through the public system or the private system, or indeed, as a lot of people do, a combination of those systems, what we're really asking is that should, should people have to rely on the good luck of having a GP who perhaps is a good diagnostician, a GP who has a, an excellent Rolodex with specialist na names in it, but really that shouldn't be the measure of whether you have good health care and whether you, when you're going to see a specialist, whether it be, uh, as Senator Askew was, um, was talking about, a, a surgeon, a, whether it's an obstetrician gynaecologist, uh, whether it's a cardiologist, really you want to be able to make that decision yourself. And I think there would be some people who might be more comfortable with you know, a doctor of a, of a particular gender for some issues. This bill enables the Minister for Health to establish pu public databases of surgical procedures and patient outcomes. The intent is that for people to considering a particular surgical procedure that they will be able to make a more informed choice about their health care and, in particular, their health care provider. Currently, there's little information in the public domain that allows patients to assess the performance, skills and outcomes of individual facilities as well as practitioners. This bill amends the Health Insurance Act 1973 to enable the minister to make rules to establish and maintain transparent patient outcomes registers. These registers may contain data such as the number and type of surgical procedures performed at a facility, the number and type of procedures performed by a practitioner, surgical revision rates and patient mortality rates, any prosthesis device used, patient demographics or any other information set out in the rules by the minister. The provision, provisions of the Transparent Patient Outcomes Bill can, can be applied to any medical specialty. And that's one of the beauties of it, that it is not just uh, you know, reliant on one or related to one particular specialty. It can be used across the board. Many factors determine, as we know, the overall success of a surgery, including a patient's age, their health and their individual diagnosis, as well as the patient's behaviour and willingness to follow doc doctor's orders post-surgery. The bill recognises these facts and allows the minister to ensure they are accounted for, so as not to provide the false impression that outcomes are always solely tied to practitioners' skills or decisions, nor to facility characteristics. But no one can deny that surgeon's skill and familiarity with a particular procedure is also a key determinant of outcomes. It is a key determinant that this bill aims to make transparent. While the bill attempts to provide for information indicating a practitioner's skill, to be made available on transparent patient outcomes registers, we should acknowledge that in reality we can only measure relative practitioner skill indirectly through outcomes. And of course, to be effective, a transparent patient outcomes register resulting from the provisions of this bill will allow for the identification of individual practitioners. It will not require practitioner-related information to be de-identified or provided anonymously. The intent being to inform patient choices, anonymous information is seen as far less useful and not consistent with the objective of the bill. To be effective, the Transparent Patient Outcomes Registers must also contain some degree of patient data. This raises questions of patient privacy, which is acknowledged by the bill, as subsection 124 ZCB bracket 6 bracket stipulates that the rules must prohibit the publication of sensitive information including identifying health information about an individual. So there's balance in this bill. Recognising there is a limit to what patient data can and should be provided through outcomes registers due to legitimate privacy considerations, we must also acknowledge such limits also have implications for the usefulness of outcomes data in registers to inform patient, potential patients. The information to be provided in the transparent patient's outcome register is not intended to be prescriptive or exhaustive. The Minister will have broad discretion in deciding what information is to be made public through the register. However, it is intended that the minimum, inf minimum information included in any such rules will allow consumers or patients to make useful comparisons and judgments about a surgeon's experience and capabilities. To do otherwise would defeat the intent and utility of a tra transparent patient outcomes register. However, Labor acknowledges that you know, there's a danger in this approach 
and the possibility of unintended consequences. As I mentioned above, there are numerous factors that play a role in the final outcomes related to medical procedures, including surgeries. If not designed carefully by the Minister, the Transparent Patients Outcomes Register could have the opposite effect of its intention. Take, for example, the case of an exceptionally highly skilled surgeon who, as a result of his or her skills, tends to attract the most difficult surgeries in a given specialty and a given location. So you can imagine this could skew data. Maybe this is represented by patients who have challenging comorbidities, or maybe it is represented by the needs for a particularly difficult technique employed in these cases more frequently than others. The point being, when measuring aggregate outcomes, by definition we lose specific information that could be relevant in making a comprehensive and objective assessment of performance and skill. This is true, of course, in any field of endeavour, and no less true in surgery. A simple accounting for average patient outcomes by practitioner could represent this surgeon as performing worse than his or her peers, when in reality the opposite is the case. And maybe that's the surgeon you actually want for a difficult procedure. This would not only represent a personal and professional injustice with respect to our hypothetical surgeon, it would represent a danger to patients as patients unaware of the deeper issues at play could base decisions off simplistic, aggregate and only partially informed data. I do not know whether it's possible to collect and include all the relevant data that would be needed to guard against such unintended consequences in the context of this bill. That is an open question that Labor would like to hear the views of experts on. And even if it is the case that all data could be collected without breaching patient privacy protections, there is no assurance that the Minister would require its collection and publication on transparent patient outcomes registers. This bill represents a good faith effort to improve patient choice and patient outcomes. It also represents, uh, I think, a key strain in, in a democratic system and that is to inform people and to give people the right to make good decisions for themselves. These are goals that Labor supports, as should anyone who is interested in the welfare of all Australians. I thank again Senator Griff, and we welcome this debate. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Thank you. I believe Senator Stilljohn is next and will be participating remotely. Senator Stilljohn, we can't see you. We'll pause for just one moment. What we might do then is go to Senator McLaughlin while uh, maybe some of the Greens could uh, advise Senator Stilljohn. Okay. Uh, Senator McLaughlin, to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President, for the early call. Uh, honourable Senators, I rise to speak on the Health Insurance Legislation Amendment Transparent Patient Outcomes Bill 2021. Uh, the bill, if it finds favour with the Senate, will allow the Minister for Health to establish public databases of surgical procedures and patient outcomes to allow consumers who are considering a particular procedure to make an informed choice about their practitioner. The move of the bill, uh, my South Australian colleague, uh, Senator Griff, uh, debate argues in debate that such information in the public domain will allow Australian patients to objectively assess skills and outcomes of individual practitioners, and the bill will uh, repair a lack of transparency that currently exists in the, I, should, I suppose I could describe it as, consumer market for medical services. The bill technically seeks to amend the Health Insurance Act 1973 to enable the minister to make rules to establish and maintain a transparent patient outcomes register or registers, as the case may be, that contain data such as the number and type of surgical procedures performed at a facility and the number and type of procedures performed by a practitioner, surgical revision rates and patient mortality rates for each facility and practitioner, any prosthesis device used, patient demographic, de demographics or any other information set out in the rules by the minister. 
The bill, in effect, gives the minister wide discretion to effectively construct or structure the nature of the register or registers, and registers can be for particular surgical interventions or, and also relate to particular medical professions. So there is a degree of flexibility and empowerment of the minister to do so. And as we've heard from Senator Askew, uh, the government's intention through its minister uh, for health is to consult widely in relation to this bill and share those findings with the mover of the bill to see the best way forward or whether this bill may require further refinement. So this bill raises two interesting issues. One around the around privacy, which it does take great pains in the terms of the bill to protect. And also, I wish to touch upon by Senator Kitching, the nature of the interpretation or the presentation of that uh, data, which will empower the consumer, which we hope will empower the consumer and not confuse the consumer. And I'm inter also interested in, in relation to this bill, how that will impact the performance of the medical profession as a profession. The last two, um, the interplay between the delivery of the information and how the profession, both as individuals in the profession and the profession as a whole, will respond. We hope positively if this bill is passed. Now, on the issue of privacy, um, Hippocrates, the physician, pledged to keep information about patients private and confidential. So this is not a new concept. And in fact, the Hippocratic Oath states that where I may see or hear in the course of treatment or even outside the treatment in regard to the life of men, old language, which on no account one must spread abroad, I will keep to myself. So it's not a new concept and it is one which we've uh, grappled with in the past. This bill aims to keep the balance, that is, to collect the data for the societal benefit whilst protecting the individual. But to, but to gather the data, it has to be protected, otherwise it will be used for a variety of other purposes uh, and therefore will uh, prevent the ultimate collection or the validity or our ability to rely on that data and undermine its validity. This is an old trade-off which has occurred in health and the trade-off is being extended to allow the creation of these registers. Uh, to quote a paragraph from uh, Senator Griff, the bill endeavours to strike a balance between providing useful information to guide patients, providing ongoing protections to those who in good faith provide, collect and manage performance and outcome data, and also endeavours to ensure registry information is not appropriated in unattended ways, such as for court proceedings. As I've said, this is not a new concept. Personal privacy is often used to protect individuals. Protecting personal privacy is used, the protections to protect personal privacy are always used to protect the interests of individuals. The primary justification for collecting personal identifiable health information for health research is for the benefit of society. And as I said, it's an old balance and one which I think is maintained in the bill. In preparing for uh, the debate today, uh, I'd like to thank Sterling Griff for preparing a statement of compatibility with human rights, which I found informative and also um, alleviated potential concerns that I may have or others in relation to privacy. I quote the conclusion, this bill aims to insist, assist individuals to access information about a health care provider and exercise informed choice before proceeding with surgery. And so it's compatible with human rights as it promotes the right to a high standard of health, the right to control one's health and the right to information accessibility. And from my own perspective, I do not find fault with those assertions and have considered the uh, arguments of the mover carefully. What has particularly interested me about the issues raised with this bill is how it interplays 
with the profession. Historically, we have relied on the prof profession, the medical profession, to self-regulate. In effect, we have placed our trust in the medical profession and the, doc and the doctors and surgeons within it. And we have not sought to question their counsel or their wisdom. Society has moved on a pace, and individuals in our community want to have a dialogue with their do doctors and specialists, and in that dialogue they want to be informed. And that is why the seed of this bill uh, has great attraction, because it empowers the consumer to have a dialogue with their medical profession not necessarily on equal terms, because in a, a medical patient, a doctor patient relationship, there is a lack of power. One has great knowledge, one is ill and concerned for recovery. So the relationship has never been equal, which is why the profession was created to create some balance and self responsibility on those providing the care. When discussing professions, I always come back to an Australian Bar Gazette article, uh, which was a reprint of a part of a presidential address delivered by Mr Hilton to the English Law Society, titled The Nature of a Profession. And one of the really um, uh, attractive arguments about professions—and he's referring to both the medical and the legal profession, the latter of which I'm a member—is that before something can be called a body, a, a group of individuals can be called a, pro a profession, they must follow their trade or craft in the spirit of public service. It doesn't rule out the need for fair reward. The point is that first care to, the first care is to apply all the person's knowledge and energy and abilities in doing the job, and earning reward is incidental to that. But as uh, the mover of the bill has indicated, that is not always the case in any profession, and there have been considerable failings in the medical profession to to uh, clean up, might I say, its own dirty linen. Senator Kitching said, also indicated that there may be uh, different behaviours as a result of the data. For example, because it's aggregated, it may result in a debate with the patient that's not as necessarily as informed. I like the fact that, and I think if I don't really want to speak for the mover, but as I understand his um, contribution to him. He wants a conversation, an empowerment conversation. It does not necessarily mean that this data will inform the patient to the nth degree, because they are not data experts, but it will allow them to come to the surgeon's table—desk, I should say, rather than table—or uh, the doctor's surgery and say, well, this is the public data. Please explain to me why you think this surgeon is the best. And I think that's the attractiveness of this legislation because no legislation like this can generate perfection. One of the uh, interesting things, and I, uh, I don't profess to um, uh, have a crystal ball in relation to this, is how the profession will respond. Now, it could be that the uh, lesser noble members of the profession, uh, those who do not put societal benefit uh, as one of their primary drivers in the profession and, say, and remuneration is higher to them, might reduce their scope of practice and only operate on those that they think is going to have a greater recovery. One would like not to think so. So my point of um, raising the interplay with the profession is that the profession will have to do more work with this to ensure that their professional and their members do not respond in a base way to this sort of data being, being held by the patient. It will also, I think, have positive knock-on effects for the procurement process, particularly with prosthetics, because uh, we know that there are very, very hard sales techniques around prosthetics, and, we ne and the patient needs to know, are they getting the one that is used in majority or specialist, and, and then raise the question. It may also drive in the profession increased specialisation and more attention to those being apprenticed, and their apprenticeships take longer. I don't raise those issues uh, to 
negate the positive intentions of this bill but to raise them to promote the debate about how this register will be structured. As my uh, honourable friend uh, Senator Askew has indicated, the government finds favour with the intentions of this bill. It's seeking to consult to better understand how the registers will be constructed. Can I congratulate the mover of the bill for his dedication to advancing the interests of patients in Australia? Senator McGrotten, I believe you're seeking leave to continue your remarks. Yes, sorry, uh, Deputy President, I am seeking leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, I think I'm calling the clerk. Government business notice of motion number two, standing in the name of Senator Rustin, relating to the consideration of a disallowance motion. Minister. Move the motion. Uh, Senator McKim. Just draw your, uh, draw your attention to the state of the chamber. Is the quorum required? Just check. I believe it is. Ring the bells. Quorum has been reached. <coughs> Senator Waters, are you seeking the call? Uh, unless the minister is still in con uh, continuation. No, well, she's asked that the motion be put. So, yes, I um, seek to speak, Deputy President. Well, she has put a motion. You'll have to seek leave. Okay. Uh, so she hasn't quite put the motion. So I think what we're going to do, if you resume your seat, we'll get the minister to put her motion. Motion, and then you can stand. Motion. Thank you. Senator Waters. Yes, thanks very much, Deputy President. I rise to speak on this gag motion to uh, make sure that this government can give $50 million of taxpayers' money to a private gas company to frack the Beedaloo Basin in the Northern Territory against the wishes of First Nations owners. There is not a fossil fuel subsidy that this government isn't completely enamoured by. We've just had the Glasgow Climate Conference. No. We've just had First Nations people crying out to be heard and for their rights and wishes to be respected. And this government is now bringing on a gag to ram through the vote on the disallowance motion that the Greens have moved to say, no, don't give taxpayer money to a private gas company to frack the Beedaloo Basin. This is a climate bomb. It would emit four times the amount of emissions than the Adani coal mine would. This is exactly the wrong thing to be doing in a climate crisis. 
And it's unbelievable that this government, just three weeks after the Glasgow Climate Conference, is now having the audacity to try to give even more taxpayer dollars to private gas companies. I suspect the uh, Liberal-aligned uh, chair of the company, who's made some generous donations to this government, might have a bit of an in there with this government. What a cosy little relationship, giving taxpayer money to their donors to open up a climate bomb to frack the Beetaloo Basin. Now today we will have the vote because this government is bringing it to a vote. It's gagging debate. It's forcing us to have a vote on this, and I will be very interested to see how the opposition votes on this crucial question of whether to give taxpayer subsidies to open up a climate bomb against the wishes of First Nations Northern Territorians. This is a test for the Labor Party. Are they going to vote to give $50 million of taxpayer money to a private gas company to frack the Beetaloo, or are they going to find some sort of spine and some sort of principles and say, no, we don't want the climate to be completely destroyed and we don't want to trash the rights of First Nations Northern Territorians. This is a test. Will they allow public money to be wasted on propping up a private gas company to make the climate crisis worse? We just had the International Energy Agency and the G7 uh, just before Glasgow talk about phasing out fossil fuel subsidies. But this government is completely deaf to the science and it's completely deaf to the international shift away from fossil fuels and it's now wanting to give $50 million of taxpayer dollars uh, to private companies. I mean, this government has just completely missed the memo. It missed the memo on 2030 and increasing targets so that we can have a livable climate that safeguards nature, that protects our agriculture, that protects beautiful natural assets like the Great Barrier Reef, of which we've already lost 50 per cent of the coral cover through back-to-back -back, back -back bleaching episodes that are driven by the burning of coal and gas. We just had those international bodies say, not a great idea to open new coal and gas, not a great idea to continue fossil fuel subsidies to do so. And this government has got its fingers in its ears saying, no, of course we want to keep giving free money to our donors to wreck the climate, because not only do they want to pay back those donors, but they want cushy lobbying jobs once they leave parliament. And I hope they will be on the opposition benches very soon. And no doubt they'll be looking at those cushy gas company jobs and lining them up. We know several of the former politicians in both this chamber and the other have gone to represent big gas companies or even um, Appia, the, the gas representative body itself. What a cosy little relationship that sees First Nations rights trashed and that sees the climate crisis turbocharged. What an absolute crock. Why on earth would the opposition be supporting this? This is a test for them. Are they going to support the gag to bring this on for a vote? And are they going to support the giving of $50 million of taxpayer money to frack the Beetaloo Basin? We've got schools and hospitals that are desperate for additional funding. We've got frontline domestic violence services that are desperate for additional funding. We've got uh, people who can't afford to go to the dentist people that can't afford to get mental health care. They are the sorts of things that taxpayer dollars should be spent on. Dental and mental into Medicare, fully funded schools, fully funded hospitals, actually funding renewable energy projects. But no, this government won't have a bar of any of that. It wants to give taxpayer money to private gas companies with links to the Liberal Party to frack the Beetaloo Basin to open up a gas basin that would be four times as bad for the climate as Adani would be, that would represent 13 per cent of Australia's domestic emissions. You, you, you could not make this up. This could not make any less sense except the fact that this government is so cosy with its gas donors and its coal donors and cares so little about First Nations rights that it is willing to have this conversation three weeks after the Glasgow Climate Conference. For shame. Now, I might just add for the benefit of the chamber, we've got the crossbench on this, all of them. Labor will, de will decide whether $50 million of public money goes to these private companies. They are the swing vote here. We have every single crossbencher, and I thank all of the crossbenchers for their support, that say, no, we don't want to give taxpayer dollars to these companies, many of whom don't even pay corporate tax in Australia. 
because they have fancy accountants that can exploit loopholes that this government couldn't be bothered changing. They're not even paying tax, and yet they're getting massive subsidies from the taxpayer. That's why many of the crossbench will be voting to say don't give these tax dodgers more money in a climate crisis against the wishes of First Nations owners. This is a test for the Labor opposition. Will they gag this and ram it through? And will they then sit once again with the government on the side of coal and gas to trash the climate and to absolutely insult the wishes of First Nations people in the Beedaloo Basin? I really hope they do the right thing because the people of Australia actually would like a choice at the next election. They'd like to know that there's a, a bit of difference between the two big parties. They don't want it to be just the Greens standing for the climate and standing for First Nations rights. They actually want a bit of difference between the two big parties. It's not too much to ask in a democracy for the opposition to oppose. We don't expect anything better from this government to give yet more taxpayer dollars to the gas companies, but we had hoped that the Labor opposition would decide that schools and hospitals and renewable energy were a better spend than giving money to private gas companies with cosy links to the Liberal Party against the wishes of First Nations owners. So I'll conclude my remarks there because I know that many of our other Greens uh, senators wish to speak on this and they feel as passionately about this issue as I do. And we'll be speaking both to the substantive and to the procedural debate here. And, uh, our First Nations senators, Lydia Thorpe and Dorinda Cox, will make a powerful contribution because this is what, yet another example of the joke of the trashing of First Nations rights in this country. We should be talking about free, prior and informed consent. Instead, the government's talking about free public money to a private gas company and just thumbing their nose at First Nations communities. It's utterly unacceptable, and I look forward to the contribution from other senators. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Chair. As this is the last day for well, I suppose I should take my thing off. As this is the last day for uh, considering this motion for disallowance, Labor will be supporting the motion to ensure the debate is concluded to allow the Senate to express its opinion on this substantive motion, rather than allowing the regulation to be disallowed by reflection of time. This has been our consistent position that senators should be able to vote on disallowance motions. Uh, Minister. I put the question. So the question is: the motion is moved by. Uh, that the question. Yeah. So the motion is that the uh, the minister is moving for the question to be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against. Aye. I believe the ayes have it. Aye. Ring the bells for four minutes. Thank you.
stop the bells. I'll just give the whips a few moments to uh, go through the extensive pairing arrangements. The question is that the question be put. Those that are, uh, eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Davey, teller for the eyes, and Senator Choney, teller for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 24, noes 21. The question is resolved in the affirmative. <coughs> I'll just confirm with the clerk, but I believe now... Oh, minute. The motion... I move that the motion moved by Senator Rustin to bring on consideration of the disallowance be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. One minute. Stop the bells. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chairs and those to the left. I appoint Senator Davey as teller for the ayes and Senator McKim as teller for the nose.
Yeah. Order. There being 36 ayes and eight noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I'll just wait for senators who wish to leave the chamber to do so and for people to get back to their spots, and then we are calling the clerk. I call the clerk. Business of the Senate, order of the day number one. Industry Research and Development Beetaloo Cooperative Drilling Program Instrument 2021. Motion for disallowance. Resumption of debate. Senator Cox. Thank you, um, Deputy Madam President. I rise to speak to this disallowance motion to stop the Morrison government from providing $50 million to frack in the Beetaloo Basin in the Northern Territory. In this country, we have projects being approved left right and centre, without consent and without proper approvals that assess the damage being caused to our environment. This is unacceptable and it's something we have the opportunity to change here today. It's clear there are some gaping holes in our legislative frameworks that allow big corporations to get away with destroying our country. Last week I went out onto the lawns of Parliament House with my colleagues. Senator Thorpe and Senator Waters, and met with First Nations people and members of the community who are saying no to fracking in the Beedaloo Basin. What, about, what is it about the word no that this government do not understand? From a Western worldview, you can play with geography you can, and the environment on a topic, topographical map, and you can reprint a new version of that the next day. But the traditional owners of this land, if you disrupt the geography and the environment, the song lines of that country are lost forever. The ecosystem out in the outback is fragile and precious, and there is no doubt that drilling will have consequences to both flora, fauna and farmers. I'm worried about the impact it will have on endangered species and savanna ecosystems. Fracking poses serious risks to our precious water, groundwater, and groundwater especially is critical in the Northern Territory because 90 per cent of water for human purposes, including the drink, drinking water, comes from those aquifers. Origin Energy's own environmental report for 10,000 square kilometres of the Beedaloo Basin warned that drilling will pose a risk of causing the aquifers under some properties to leak into each other, deteriorating the quality of existing and future groundwater supplies. Even in the independent review of fracking in the Northern Territory, the Pepper inquiry noted significant environmental, social and economic risks from fracking in the Territory. These include risks to the water in terms of quality due to contamination, Due to quantity, due to the extraction and, and drawdown of these risks are absolutely unacceptable. From the Pepper Inquiry, there were 135 recommendations, and it said only the full implementation of all those recommendations could provide any assurances that these risks could be managed. One of the core recommendations from the Pepper Inquiry was for the Commonwealth to extend the water trigger to onshore shale gas developments. This key recommendation remains unimplemented. It is clear that the EPBC Act is failing to protect our water from serious risks of fracking, and we need stronger environmental protections, including the thorough, uh, through the additional of shale gas fracking into the Act's water trigger. We need approvals that actually assess what the impacts of fracking will be on our water resources. Despite these significant risks against the wishes of traditional owners, Empire Energy was granted approval from the Northern Territory government. Its environmental management plan back, just back in October. And this includes the, the approval to construct wells, drill wells and frack. In other words, the Northern Territory government have given the green light for the destruction of country. Shame. 
What's even more unbelievable is that the NT environmental minister suggests that the greenhouse gas emissions from the exploration phase were manageable. I mean, who would think? Has the, man has the minister even read the Pepper inquiry? That inquiry identified the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions from a new onshore gas field across a range of production scenarios would contribute 4.5 to 6.6 per cent of Australia's total greenhouse gas emissions. This risk was deemed unacceptable, so I don't know how the minister could actually say that. Granting public money to party donors for climate wrecking projects that no one wants is unethical, wasteful and a danger to our children's future. So here we go again. It's the Greens standing up, trying to protect our environment and our country, while Liberal and Labor parties hand out public money to oil and gas corporations to frack in the beetaloo. And I know which side of the chamber I would rather be on when this disallowance motion comes up for a vote. Uh, Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, uh, I rise to uh, uh, oppose this disallowance because our nation desperately needs uh, more secure oil and gas uh, supplies. Australia uh, is now far from being self-sufficient uh, in oil production, something that uh, we were uh, only 20 years ago. I think a lot of Australians wouldn't realise, wouldn't actually understand or know that just 20 years ago, at the, on the, uh, just when September 11 happened, we produced 96 per cent of our raw petroleum needs. So we're almost self-sufficient in petroleum production. If the worst happened and our supplies of oil were cut off from the Malacca Strait or elsewhere, we would be able uh, to produce enough petrol uh, to keep our economy going, uh, to defend our nation uh, and just make sure people can still be fed and we can transport goods around the country. These are pretty important things uh, for any nation that wants to provide for its own people. Now, it is, it is true that we didn't have the refinery capacity to turn that 96 per cent of raw petroleum into a usable product 20 years ago, but it's not very difficult to, uh, to build a refinery. It can be done very quickly if a crisis emerged. It is, it is very difficult to find a new source of oil or gas. Uh, something that I'll come to in a second. People, have, people, don't understand, people don't understand in this country why we were self-sufficient because we really don't teach the history of how this all came about, how we actually developed our nation. We were self-sufficient in oil and gas thanks, thanks to the discovery of the Bass Strait, which was one of the world's most productive oil and gas basins. So just off the coast of Melbourne, just off the coast of Victoria, uh, for 50 years, we have produced an enormous amount of oil and gas from that region. Uh, around 20 years ago, that production started to fall and fall rapidly. So that means today we barely get any oil out of the Bass Strait. Uh, we still get some oil, mainly from the northwest shelf, from offshore oil and gas rigs up there. Uh, but they are predominantly gas-producing regions, not oil. And that's why we don't have the security we had. How did we develop the Bass Strait? How did we get that going? Well, in the in the in the in the in the uh, 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 in the in the aftermath—that's the word I'm looking for—in the aftermath of World War II, it became clear that Australia did need uh, to become more secure in its own natural resource supplies, particularly of oil and gas. So, in the 1950s, the Menzies government established a subsidy. To, to attract investment in oil and gas into Australia. They established a 50 per cent drilling subsidy, so any company could come to Australia at that time and have half of their exploration drilling costs paid for to find oil and gas in this country. Uh, there was also a price support mechanism too for domestic oil. At the time, oil prices were very low in the 1950s, so there wasn't a lot of incentive for people to actually discover oil and gas in Australia. And they actually, the Menzies government paid extra for any oil, paid, a, paid an additional subsidy, any oil that was produced for, and consumed uh, from domestic sources. That eventually led to one of the most historic meetings in our nation's history, when BHP, an Australian company, the Broken Hill Proprietary Company, uh, decided that they would seek to access uh, this, this subsidy. And they brought a gentleman called Lewis Weeks 
a geologist out from the United States, well renowned to be the world's greatest geologist of his time. And he had a meeting, had a meeting in Melbourne with the CEO of BHP, and uh, the CEO asked him over lunch, asked Mr. Lewis Weeks, uh, where's the best place in Australia to drill for oil? And without hesitation, apparently, as the story goes, uh, Lewis responded, the Bass Strait. You've got to go to the Bass Strait. And the rest is history. The rest is history. Uh, BHP did do that. They weren't a company in petroleum at the time. Obviously, they uh, cut their teeth uh, in, in Broken Hill. Uh, they later developed most of the nation's steel works and steel industry, uh, something we should return to as well, a topic for another speech. But then in the 1950s and through the 1960s, BHP almost had its third, a third uh, uh, iteration as a, as a company, and it expanded into oil and gas and, and did very, very well in that, in that industry. Now, we, we benefited from that for 50 years. We benefited from that foresight of that government, because at the time, as I said, there was plentiful supplies of oil. Oil prices were very low in the 50s and 60s. But the decision was made to do that so that we could have security. It wasn't necessarily about the economy or jobs or any of these things. It was to provide Australians the most basic need that we should do as a government is to provide our country security, to be able to defend our country, to be able to continue to supply goods for people. That's why they did that. And it was very foresighted because by the 1970s, Middle Eastern countries formed a cartel that we still, we still live with called OPEC and cut off the world's oil supplies effectively, uh, or at least constrained them to boost the price. Uh, but we, we, Australia, were not as impacted by many other countries thanks to the foresight of the Menzies government. Because we were, we were sufficient in petroleum production, we didn't have the line-ups at petrol stations like you had at the United States. We didn't have uh, the, the, the lack of supplies like you had in Europe. We were self-sufficient and we could provide for our country. We can't do that now. We can't do that now. If there were a crisis to occur in the next five to ten years, we could not guarantee to the Australian people that oil supplies would be maintained. We may have to ration it. We may have lineups at petrol stations because we do not have the domestic production in this country. Now, it would be great to be able to, if a crisis happened, to be able to flick a switch and go and develop these oil and gas reserves in the Beedaloo Basin or the Canning Basin. I'll get to that if I have time. But it takes a long time to do these things. And we have here a political party proposing a motion to effectively try and shut down the, the nascent shale oil and gas industry in this country uh, with knowing almost nothing about the geology, the process, the industry that they're seeking to regulate. The Greens would have to be the most ignorant party in this place when it comes to oil and gas, the oil and gas industry. They have no idea about fracking. They have no idea about uh, uh, how the process works. They don't talk the oil and gas riggers who actually are out there doing this stuff with this wonderful technology in the United States. They don't know how it works. They don't know how it works. They hear the word fossil fuels, and that's all they need to hear for them. That's as far as their reading and in-depth analysis goes. It's fossil fuels, therefore it's bad. That's the approach being brought into this chamber. This naive and ignorant approach would, which would, could cost our country very, very dearly if they ever get close to the reins of government. Because back in the real world, back in the real world, our food supplies rely on petrol being to, to, to fuel the trucks to deliver us all around the country. Uh, our, our transport, our ability to get around, relies on adequate access to oil and gas, and our ability to, to defend ourselves, to run our tanks, our submarines, our aircraft, and our defence forces, all relies on adequate supplies of oil and gas. Now, as I say, we haven't, we've exhausted the Bass Strait. Even the oil and gas reserves of the North West Shelf are largely declining. It was great news last week to see the Scarborough investment go through, but that's not a particularly oil-rich basin. It's going to be probably more gas than liquid fuels and therefore not that beneficial for the transport and other needs required from liquid fuels. But there is, there is a great hope that we can get back to self-sufficiency in oil if we were, if we were to bring the wonderful technology that is shale gas development to Australia, to Australia. Now, part of that technology, part of that technology is this thing called fracking, and it shows the Greens' complete ignorance here. They really don't know that it wasn't fracking, in fact, that unlocked 
the shale basins of Texas and Pennsylvania and Oklahoma. That's not what happened. We, the oil and gas industry have been fracking. In fact, fracking goes back to the Civil War days. But hydraulic fracturing, which is a technique used today, hydraulic fracturing using water was developed after World War II and is used in conventional oil and gas basins here in Australia and all around the world. It is not a new thing. But it sounds a bit scary. Engineers aren't the best sometimes at coming up with words. They've come up with the word fracking to describe this process. It sounds a bit scary, so the Greens latch onto that. But it's been used for decades, used for absolute decades, completely safely. And the Greens use the oil and gas to get around, to get here and from the building. They are absolute hypocrites because they only have that oil and gas today thanks to fracking. The technology that has actually unlocked the shale reserves of the United States is horizontal drilling. That's the technology that's unlocked it. Now they don't talk about that because it doesn't sound particularly scary. All it means is this amazing technology, these amazing engineers, these amazing men and women who work in the industry have decided, have, or sorry, have discovered have discovered how, how to effectively take a drill that can go kilometres under the ground and turn it sideways. It's absolutely unbelievable. It doesn't completely go uh, 90 degrees flat, but the way they, they curve it around and are able to frack or to extract the oil and gas from a horizontal seam. We've always known there's lots of oil and gas in the shales, but with vertical drilling you have to drill a lot of wells into a shale to get any oil and gas out of it. It makes it uneconomic. That's why it hasn't happened. But this wonderful technology that was developed uh, uh, has been applied now in the United States for almost, we're getting on near 20 years uh, of this technology. Uh, and it's, it's helped restore, well, had helped restore, I should say, unfortunately, the energy independence of the United States. It has changed the geopolitics of the world because it has reduced the, the power and influence of the Middle East and theocratic regimes therein. It has reduced, or had reduced, the power of the authoritarian government in, uh, in, in Russia under Vladimir Putin. Because if we don't extract more oil and gas from Western and free and democratic nations, we, we get held to ransom by these other countries, as you can see now in Europe. In Europe, they effectively have to beg Mr Putin to supply them enough gas because they have closed down fracking everywhere. They've, they've closed it down in the UK, they've closed it down in Germany, they've closed it down in France. And now they, they have themselves become slaves to Moscow because of this nonsensical green-driven agenda. Green-driven agenda. So let's not repeat the mistakes of, of, of Europe. We've seen in the United States under the Biden administration, he has shut down fracking on federal lands. They have ex extensively increased the red tape on the industry. And now, now last week, the news came out, the US is no longer energy independent. They had a short period there, short period in the last five or six years where, where the US was producing enough oil to supply itself, and now they're back into the net importing stage. Uh, uh, a terrible consequence for the free world, because we do not want to be beholden to dictatorial authoritarian regimes, which is what happens when you don't develop your own energy resources. Now, we have this great opportunity. We have shales here in this country. We have, we have shales that could be unlocked. They do exist in the Beetaloo. It's the most uh, prom promising uh, basin today in front of us. And so if this motion passes, we will, we will be closing off that opportunity for our nation, that opportunity to return uh, to energy independence uh, as a country, to turn, return to self-sufficiency. We have even a bigger potential opportunity with the shale basins of the Canning Basin in Western Australia. There's, there's, according to our, exports, our experts, sorry, our geologists, Geoscience Australia, there are 800 billion barrels of oil in place in the Canning Basin. There's only 1.7 trillion barrels of oil uh, economically recoverable oil in the world identified. Now, we won't get all that 800 billion back. They, the G Geoscience Australia estimate about 40 billion barrels of that 800 billion will be economically recoverable. That is, that is, as, big, that is as big as the shale resources of the United States. Uh, oh, sorry, of Texas, I meant to say, of Texas. It's a huge basin that could unlock enormous opportunity for our country and, and restore our ability to defend ourselves. We would be mad mad to say no to this right now. It would, be, it, would be, it would be a shocking, a shocking misstep for the future generations of Australians that may face greater risks and crises than we do. Than we do. Now, our shales are very different from the United States. Our ge ge geological pressures are different from those of the US. We won't just be able to translate uh, what happened in, in Texas and Louisiana and other places and bring them to the Northern Territory and apply them off the shelf. That, that won't work. Uh, uh, we, we, will have to, we will have to develop different techniques 
because when you frack here in this country, our fracks, I think, they go vertically, and in the US they go horizontally, I think, given the different pressures. I might be getting that around the wrong way. But that's, that, that, will take, that will take time. It will take money, it will take investment, and it's very, very high risk, very high risk for any investor. And this is where we come in as the government. It is, it's always been the case that governments around the world have helped at the exploration stage of oil, gas and, and mineral resources too, of copper, of, of, of iron ore. All of these resources that we've developed in, the in this nation have, have benefited from governments helping with early stage drilling to identify the resource, de-risk it and then attract the capital later to produce it on a private basis. And that's what we're doing here. That's what we're doing here to fund this exploration, to find out more information, to do the science about what is actually under our, our feet. Because it is. Under our feet, we have very little knowledge still. We're still developing these amazing technologies like horizontal drilling. And it's through this science that we can, we can protect our free country, we can develop, deliver security for Australians, and we can deliver jobs for ind the Indigenous people in the Northern Territory and in Darwin. There's a massive opportunity here in the Northern Territory. Let's not say no to that because it's the right thing to develop our resources for future Australians. Thank you, Senator Canavan. and Senator Thorpe. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Black lives don't matter in the Beetaloo. It's as simple as that. Black lives don't matter in the Beetaloo. Black Lives Matter is not just a slogan. It's not just a hashtag. It's action. All we are saying is that black lives matter. Not that they matter more or that yours matters less. We are only stating a very simple, clear and completely not ambiguous fact. Black lives matter. That it is, that's all it is. Our lives matter, right? Our lives have always mattered. But they don't matter to the people in this place. We could be working together and making clear, a clear statement that the lives and the well-being of our people matter. And the actions that we take in this place matter. Just last week, I read out into this place the voices and views of the many traditional owners of what we now call the Beedaloo Basin. I remind you of their words, and I quote, For years, we have to been told lies by the gas and oil corporations that there would be no damage to the country or poison in our waters. These companies won't even answer the most basic of questions, where they plan to drill or how many wells they want to build. Hear us when we say, we won't allow fracking gas fields on our country. Not now, not ever. We are united. This is our land and we're ready to do whatever it takes to protect country." End quote. That should be enough. That should be enough for every single one of us here in this place to do the right thing, especially those that say black lives matter like Labor and I love my dot painting, says the libs. Like, seriously, if you really, really care, You'll listen to the traditional owners of the Northern Territory who don't want their country fracked. We can work together to stop the destruction of country, to stop the desecration of sacred sites, and to end the war that we are waging on our environment, on our lands, our waters and our skies and our animals, our totems and our song lines. Those stories are in your paintings. And I remind every single one of you that your vote in this place will be recorded for all time. Vote to end this public money going to destroy our environment and our climate. Vote like black lives depend on it. 
because they do. And our, our lives depend on how you vote today. Our lives are in your hands. And I'm reminded by the words of the leader of the opposition in the Senate in August this year. She said, and I quote, you know, ally solidarity, First Nations people were the first traders on this land. They were the first exporters and they were the first diplomats, engaging with people from other lands. Should I have the honour of serving as foreign minister in an Albanese Labor government, this will be recognised at the heart of Australian democracy. I say to the opposition, don't wait until then. Act now. Right now, in this moment, is your chance, Labor. What's the point of an opposition that doesn't oppose? That's why you need Greens in balance of power in this place, because we have a weak opposition. Only the Greens will kick the Liberals out and make Labor do the right thing. The traditional owners, who are made up of family clan groups, they're from the Beetaloo. And they're speaking as one. They are the custodians. They are the diplomats who have the legal, moral and cultural authority to make decisions about country. Why won't you listen to them? They are fighting for it. And everything they have, they're using to stop this. Both Labor and the Liberals need to stop listening to the oil and gas companies that purchased you and your vote. Listen to the people. You are being given, given an opportunity to do the right thing, and so do it now. Don't wait. Black lives don't matter in the Beetaloo unless you do the right thing. You are being given an opportunity to do the right thing. Do it now without delay. Black lives matter, but to this lot, black lives don't matter in the Beetaloo. It's shameful shame. Black lives don't matter in the um, Beetaloo, do Senator they? Thorpe, black Senator lives Thorpe, don't matter in the Beetaloo, Senator do Thorpe, they? Resume your seat and remove yourself from the chamber. You have, uh, you're wearing a slogan. Thank you. Senator Faruqi. Madam Deputy President. Oh, sorry, sorry, Senator Faruqi. It is the custom to um, share it round, so I'm going to go to Senator Davey. Sorry, I thought you were seeking a point I, of order. I was seeking a point of order, Thank but you. I then Thanks. remained on my feet. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. I also rise to speak on this disallowance motion um, because what is clear here, uh, listening to the Greens is that jobs don't matter. Irrespective of everything else, jobs do not matter, especially jobs in the Northern Territory. I'd like to start by acknowledging uh, the remarks from my colleague, Senator Sam McMahon, uh, who spoke on this issue recently. As a senator for the Northern Territory, Senator McMahon has been on the ground. She has been working with her constituents. She has been working with the traditional owners up there to understand the issue and to find out what it actually means for the people of the Northern Territory. And what she has heard is that they don't want to be told what to do from a Green senator from a capital city. Mm -hmm. So I commend Senator McMahon for being a great voice for her constituents on this issue. And I speak in support of her position, which is based on the conversations he's ha she's had with those people on the ground. The jobs. Developing the Beetaloo sub-basin has the potential to create 6,000 extra jobs in the Northern Territory by 2040. As a nation coming out of COVID, we know that we need to rebuild our economy. But to do so, we can't just be boosting public services and bureaucracies, we need private enterprise. 
We need industry, and that is what developing the Beetaloo Basin will create. And the Northern Territory should not have to thumb its nose at 6,000 potential new jobs. They should welcome 6,000 potential new jobs. The, the development of this basin also will see an extra $173.6 million towards Roads of Strategic Importance Corridor, which is expected to create 400 new jobs. But importantly, it's also going to improve transport and safety across the Territory, because lives matter. The development will also support a whole range of new industries in the Northern Territory, including refining and petrochemicals, methanol production and hydrogen production. Hydrogen, what everyone is clamouring about, because hydrogen is a potential new source of stored energy, which is fantastic. But as we transition towards green hydrogen, the first obvious step is blue hydrogen, and blue hydrogen needs gas. On top of that, and, and this is very important, on top of all of this new industry, new jobs, new production, $2.2 million is going to the Northern Land Council to support effective engagement with traditional owners to ensure that they continue to be consulted. Thank you, Senator Davey. The time Thank for you. this debate has now expired. So the question is that the disallowance a motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. I'm going to put the vote again, and I would suggest the senators need to listen. So the question is that the disallowance motion uh, is put and be allowed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is that the disallowance motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion will move to the right of the chair and those to the noes will move to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Yes. The result of the division is ayes 9 and noes 24. The question is resolved in the negative. I'll give senators a moment to leave the chamber and I will call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, social security legislation amendment remote engagement program bill 2021. Resumption of debate on the second reading and the amendment moved by Senator McAllister. Minister. Mm. Um, I'd like to uh, thank the honourable members for their contribution to the debate on the Social Security uh, Legislation Amendment Bill Remote Engagement Program 2021. The bill is a representation of the important strides being made by this government's reforms to employment services to support the economic recovery from COVID-19. This program, since its introduction in 1977, has gone through many iterations, including CDEP, the uh, RJCP in 2013, CDP from 2015, and now the Remote Engagement Program. For the first time, this program will be co-designed and developed with Indigenous Australians. The Senate Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee undertook a comprehensive inquiry into the provisions of the bill, which contained three recommendations. In response to recommendation two, the government will establish the following co-design and consultation mechanism for the remote engagement program. A national co-design working group to co-design the remote engagement program that will be rolled out nationally in 2023. Local co-design working group in each pilot site to co-design the pilot program to be trialled in each pilot site. And a national consultation process to provide an opportunity for stakeholders not directly involved in the pilots or the national co-design working group to have a say about the future of employment services in remote Australia. In response to recommendation three, the bill has been specifically designed to facilitate co-design in the pilot sites by setting high-level parameters with further details to be set out in legislative instruments that will be informed by the outcomes of the co-design process in the pilot regions. The government will publish the outcomes of the co-design process for full transparency. The legislative instruments are an important feature of the co-design process in the pilot sites. They will set the amount of the remote engagement program supplementary payment and the hours of engagement in the pilot sites. In response to recommendation four, the aim is for the new remote engagement program supplementary payment plus an eligible job seekers income support payment to be approximately equivalent to the minimum wage for the AS participating in the remote engagement placement. The placements will not be a job, but will aim to give job seekers experience that will enable transition to paid employment. The new supplementary payment will not be at a level that people avoid taking up paid employment opportunities. Eligible job seekers will continue to receive the supplementary payment for the whole time they are eligible to be a part of the remote engagement placement. 
In response to recommendation one, the government is monitoring the work states and territories are doing on treaties. It's important that state and territory jurisdictions take the lead on this work in their jurisdictions. The legislation is just one building block and sunsets in 2023. This bill is not the new program. The new payment that the bill enables will be one aspect that communities can trial alongside other approaches to training, skills development and non-vocational support as part of the co-design of the remote employment program. It will provide a framework for piloting new approaches to delivering employment services in remote communities ahead of implementing the Morrison government's budget announcement that the community development program will be replaced in 2023. I'm pleased to sum up the debate in relation to this bill debate today. This bill is an important step towards closing the gap and significantly improving the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians, especially those living in remote Australia. I commend the bill to the chamber. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the amendment as moved by Senator McAllister be agreed. Those at opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. The noes, I believe the noes have it. The ayes have, have, have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
the bells. However, I will give the whips a moment to ensure they are ready. All right, the question before the chair is that the second reading amendment is moved by Senator McAllister be agreed to. Ayes will pass to the right of the chair, noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart, teller for the ayes. Senator Dean Smith, teller for the noes. There being 22 ayes, 24 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. Now I understand a further second reading amendment has been foreshadowed. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, President. I'd like to move uh, my second reading amendment. The question is that second reading amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Thorpe be agreed to. Ayes will pass to the right of the chair, noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart, teller for the ayes, and Senator Dean Smith, teller for the noes. There being 21 ayes, 24 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. I now will move the second reading. Those of that opinion say aye, against say no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for One minute. I'll stop the bells. The question is that the bill now be read a second time. Those that opinion say, oh, sorry. Um, uh, those uh, eyes will move to the right of the chair and the nose to the left. And I call Senator McKim, tell her for the nose, and S Senator Smith, tell her for the eyes.
The result of the division is ayes 31, noes 7. The question is resolved in the affirmative. The clerk. For an act to amend the law relating to social security and for related purposes. Let's give a moment for Minister. Uh, as there no members have been circulated, uh, I therefore move that. Oh, sorry, I call them. I mean, uh, no members have been circulated. Therefore, if any, no one requires a uh, committee stage, I'll call the senator. Minister. It will now be read a third time. The question is that the bill now be read a third time. Those that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security and for related purposes. Government Business Order for Day Number Two: Agricultural and Veterinary Chemicals Legislation Amendment, Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority Board, and Other Improvements Bill 2019. Resumption of second reading debate. Senator um, McAllister. Uh, it It is close to 1.30. With the concurrence of the Senate, we may just move straight to two-minute statements. And I'm speaking slowly to even maybe get us to 1.30. Uh, but uh, Senator, Senator Grogan, I'll be calling you. Thank you. Senator Grogan. Thank you. Uh, this morning, I joined early childhood educators and the United Workers' Union out on the front lawns of Parliament. To, uh, to watch them launch the report, Spitting Off Cash, Where Does All the Money Go in Australia's Early Learning Sector? And I think anyone would have been shocked by the contents of that report and the treatment of workers in this essential sector. Private not-for-profit companies now account for half of all early childhood education and care services in the country, and that share is growing. It's clear that too many of these corporate operators just don't care about the passionate, skilled educators that they have working in their centres. Just one example, the G8 education, to give this chamber a bit of a sense of what seems to be happening and how big an issue this really is. G8 education is Australia's largest for-profit provider of long day care, and they enrol 53,000 children across this country. And they are raking in the cash. In 2019, they made $79 million in profit. And last year, with the onset of um, COVID and G8, still earned $60 million in profit. And that was in no small part assisted by gaining $102 million in JobKeeper payments. So just to be clear, that's $102 million in taxpayer funding resulting in a 60 million profit to that company, that private company, who paid no tax. This is just one company. There are so many more. Um, and the big profits and the executive salaries are really giving staff a raw deal. I am so very proud to stand with United Workers Union members in this sector. They deserve so much better than this. Senator Grogan, your time has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. A few months ago, I spoke about the enormous generosity of Gina Reinhardt around our Olympians and our Paralympians in the swimming, rowing, volleyball and artistic swimming teams. The fantastic results we saw from Emma McKay and our most successful Olympian ever, as well as our female and male awesome foursomes in the rowing, amongst many, many other stellar performances that did our country so proud. Outside of her direct financial support, Mrs Reinhardt has wanted our Olympians to have with them, especially when travelling overseas, a part of Australia's very best, Paspali pearls. The Paspali gifts started after the Rio Olympics in 2016 for the female Olympian teams of which Mrs Reinhardt is patron, 
which custom pass Paley necklaces with their names and year inscribed, which were designed by Mrs Reinhardt and oh, Nick yeah. Paley. The men received crocodile skin pens, which were also inscribed Rio 16, and iPads. In 2018, after the most successful Commonwealth Games ever for the Australian team, when it was held in Queensland, a Pass Paley ring, again designed by Mrs Reinhardt and Nick Pass Paley, with the individual's name and the year inscribed. After the Tokyo 2020 Olympics held this year, the female Olympians are being gifted Pass Paley earrings, again designed by Mrs Reinhardt. Gold and silver winners will also receive an Apple Mac. The men will receive an Apple Mac and a gold or silver medal or multiple medals and iPad as well. Both female and male Paralympians will also be receiving these gifts. And of course, coaches will not miss out this year either. The ongoing generosity of Mrs. Reinhardt in support of these Olympic and Paralympic teams is incredible. So many athletes are able to reach their dreams because of her support. Senator Cox. Thank you. A few weeks ago, I met with the uh, Gas Free Hunter Alliance, a community group who are opposing the Curry Curry gas fired power station. The Morrison Joyce government is using $600 million in public funding to build a gas fire power station in the Hunter that no one in the community wants. What a sham. Curry Curry will only create 10 ongoing jobs. The skilled workers that will be needed to build the infrastructure will be FIFO workers who will contribute very little to the local economy. This is despite the community asking for clean, ongoing jobs in non-polluting industries for hundreds of people now and into the future. Curry Curry will take at least 30 minutes to reach full capacity, so it won't be able to respond quickly to demand peaks. Contrary to what the government will have you believe, New South Wales does not need another peaking gas power plant. It already has three. A report by Victoria University also found the project has no prospect for generating enough revenue to justify its huge $600 million price tag. <clears throat> curry curry reeks of incompetence, dodgy donations and links to the Liberal Party. Gas is not a transition uh, fuel. Gas is as dirty as coal and our communities don't want anything to do with it. The Gas Free Hunter Alliance are calling for a cl clear transition to renewables and they don't want our public money being spent on propping up the last days of the fossil fuel industry. Today I am calling on the government to listen to the community and to abandon Curry Curry today. Thank you, Senator Cox. Uh, Senator Billick on remote. Thank you. On the 9th of July this year, I wrote to the Minister for Government Services, Senator Reynolds, on behalf of Tasmanian constituents who were concerned that their vaccinations had not appeared on the Australian Immunisation Register. One of these constituents was a fire safety and training consultant who does a lot of work with residential aged care. A COVID vaccine mandate was about to come into effect for residential aged care in Tasmania and he needed to prove his vaccination status quickly. It took until the 14th of September for the minister to reply to my letter. Minister Reynolds revealed that a software constraint meant immunisation data failed to transfer for the, from the Tasmanian Department of Health to the register. Instead of alerting the public, the minister quietly deployed Services Australia staff to help Tas Health catch up and manually input 3,000 788 vaccinations. I wrote to Minister Reynolds again with a series of questions about the vaccine certificate bungle. In fact, I've written to the minister three times on this issue, but she refused to answer any more of my questions. This is outrageous and it stinks of a cover-up. Australians have the right to know what happened. Without answers, how can they know that the issue has been fully resolved? and that their vaccination status will appear on the register in a timely manner. Vaccinations are a ticket to freedom, but only if Australians can demonstrate they've been vaccinated. The latest bungle comes from the government that gave us RoboDebt, the botched COVID Safer app and the most shambolic census in history. How can Australians trust any ICT project this government gets its hands on, including the immunisation register? It's time for the minister to come clean Tell us what happened, tell us why it happened, and make sure that all those 
uh, people have their name properly on the register. Senator Roberts. Thank you. Last weekend, more than half a million Australians came together to protest anti-human and possibly criminal governments. The media were there not to report on proceedings accurately and with integrity, but to lie and cover up for our medical dictatorships. What we all saw around Australia was not right-wing extremists. What One Nation saw was everyday Australians united in a desire to get government and health bureaucrats out of their lives, to be left alone to make the best decisions for their bodies and for the bodies of their children. It was no surprise that a common sign being held high was, my body, my choice. On one occasion, written on the back of a Greens election poster, apparently, my body, my choice, is a value the Greens abandoned and their hypocrisy now is widely noticed. The Liberal Party should be scared at the number of signs from small businesses that capricious, callous government mandates shut down. The closures destroyed lives and weakened local communities. The Labor Party should be concerned at the handwritten T-shirts from former unionists in healthcare, education, police and emergency services and aged care facilities, fired for the crime of respecting their bodies. Labor voters no more. Another sign simply read, pray, reflect, vote. Religious leaders advocating action contrary to religious teachings are not going to come out of this unscathed. The rallies were peaceful and the mood was positive, energised. Many Australians have realised that fear is the virus and the cure is to embrace family and community with love and inclusion. The only fear was from some, from some small groups of spectators infected with the media mutation. The weekend stands as a warning to all power-crazed health bureaucrats, state premiers and federal politicians. We have one flag, we are one community, we are one people, we are one nation, and we will not be scared and bullied into surrendering our bodies and our freedoms. Uh, Senator Macdonald, what's on remark? Mr Deputy President, I rise to highlight work being done in regional Queensland to transform agriculture and manufacturing as we know it. In Camel Wheel, just north of Mount Isa, near the Northern Territory border, a dedicated group is helping overcome a prickly issue and their success will have worldwide implications. It's a hardy plant and from painful experience, I can tell you that it's spiky. But for millennia, Indigenous people have extracted resin from spinifex to use as a powerful adhesive to affix axe heads and as a waterproofing agent. Today, Colin Saltmere and the Doug Dugalungjul Aboriginal Corporation have combined ancient knowledge with cutting edge modern technology to harness the true genius of this humble and plentiful Aussie native plant. By perfecting harvesting techniques, streamlining the resin extraction process and using some of the University of Queensland's top scientists, they have isolated the qualities of spin effects to create the toughest nanocellulose reinforcing agent ever reported. This product can be used as a strengthening additives for gels, cement, paper uh, and cardboard. Other Spinifex compounds can be used in beauty products, sun-resistant wood tre treatments and sunscreen. Using Spinifex gel for wound care and as an injectable dermal filler are also progressing well through trial phases. There is also an exciting agricultural application which will be an international game changer once final testing is complete. At the same time, in Mackay, family business Townset Industries have developed a method to separate different elements of sugarcane plants, which can be used to create biodegradable food containers and give farmers another income stream. These are just two examples of the ingenuity that abounds in regional Queensland, which is wholeheartedly supported by the Morrison government. I commend these small operations for their big ideas. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Over the last two years, Australia's engagement with our public service has changed enormously. Even though those with no interest in politics found themselves watching long daily press conferences, discussing and debating policy issues and constantly interacting with government apps and websites. The scale of engagement has completely reshaped our opinion of our leaders, our governments and our public institutions. Unfortunately, those experiences were often disappointing or frustrating. There are many lessons that need to be learned and improvements realised, but public figures and agencies very much need to rebuild trust and credibility. 
But there is one institution which has deeply impressed throughout the pandemic and earned even more trust and respect amongst Australians, and that is SBS. They have done an absolutely stellar job of keeping us informed and ensuring every Australian, no matter their background or language, has access to reliable and accurate information throughout the pandemic. This builds on the world-class SBS has been delivering the world-class service SBS has been delivering to Australia for almost half a century. They are the quiet achievers of the public sector, an agency which keeps, which keeps very much a low profile but constantly goes above and beyond in their work. And they do it all on very much a shoestring budget. They are a remarkable organisation, one which sets the standard for their industry. We are very fortunate to have a public broadcaster of their calibre in Australia. To everyone at SBS, I say thank you for what you do and what you have done over the past two years. You are a real asset to our country. Senator McCarthy. Mr Acting Deputy President, there's a few important things to know about today's COVID update in the Northern Territory. We've just confirmed our first case of the Omicron COVID-19 variant, and while this is concerning, it is reassuring to know the man has been in quarantine at the Howard Springs facility since arriving in the Northern Territory last week. Our world-class Howard Springs facility is separated by different zones, so our international repatriations do not interact with any of our local community members who are also quarantining. Two teenagers from the remote bush community of Binjari have also tested positive to COVID-19, but one of them was already in quarantine and the other is now going to Howard Springs. I certainly wish all of those who are in Howard Springs a speedy recovery. This is uh, not an easy task in the Territory to ensure that our health workers are out there around the clock assisting all Territorians in terms of the vaccination uh, program. With soaring temperatures and some of the most remote communities where English is not uh, the first language, healthcare workers will be out in remote communities every day this week. and This includes in the centre region uh, Yundamu, Docker River, Papanya and Canteen Creek. Uh, the community outbreak in the Territory stands at 58, and I know this number would be much higher if it weren't for the work of our healthcare workers, but also our elders in each of our communities who are encouraging people to vaccinate. And I cannot say enough, please get vaccinated. Uh, COVID is well and truly in the Northern Territory, and to each of those residents in our communities right across the Territory, uh, please get vaccinated. It is absolutely important. Uh, we do have enough supply there, and I just urge you not to listen to any misinformation or even lies out there. Please get vaccinated. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. All Tasmanians, all Tasmanians know that sinking feeling. Your kids come off a bike screaming blue murder. Your elderly father has woken up in the middle of the night with chest pains he can't explain, or your partner has a high fever. You know they need urgent medical help, but in our state, you don't know how long it will be before they get it. The federal government's promise to all Australians is that we'll get free, high-quality health care whenever we need it. But that's not how things work in Tasmania. Here, elderly people die before they can see a doctor in the emergency ward. In Tasmania, we travel for hours, pay through the nose and wait for weeks before we can see our closest GP. Something's got to give. We have to take the pressure off the nurses and doctors who work in our emergency departments and get Tasmanians the medical help every day Australians deserve. This is what I'm proposing. Launceston and the North West Coast in Hobart need urgent care centres that provide free medical care and fast. You'd visit the centres for everything from cuts to burns to broken bones, wound dressings and a fever. They'd be run by professional registered nurses and would provide immediately, immediate high quality care seven days a week, including, including after hours. You wouldn't pay a cent for any of it either. And while you get looked after, people who need emergency help will get it instead of waiting for hours in an ambulance on the hospital driveway. In the ramping, they can see the hospital staff who otherwise would have been treating you. 
Nearly 9,000 people who showed up at the Launceston General Hospital with an urgent medical problem weren't seen on time last year. That's 9,000 too many. It's countless numbers of Tasmanians waiting, waiting to see if their kids, their parents and their partners are going to be all right. It's time to do something different and urgent action needs to, be ta needs to be taken and therefore I'm calling for urgent care centres that will finally give Tasmanians the health care we deserve. Senator Henderson. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Online trolling is a scourge. It is a blight upon the lives of so many innocent Australians who have had to suffer abuse, vilification and bullying online. I want to congratulate the Prime Minister and the Attorney-General for leading the charge in uh, saying that they will introduce the Social Media Anti-Trolling Bill 2021 to strengthen our online safety laws. The bill protects ordinary Australians who are or become the targets of anonymous online trolling and abuse by empowering social media users to expose the identities of their abusers. This can happen either through an efficient complaints mechanism which enables a person to raise a complaint with the social media company and, with the company's consent, obtain the contact details of the anonymous abuser or by enabling the person to obtain an end-user information disclosure order from a court. The bill will incentivise, and I say will because I very much trust that it will be supported by Labor, Greens and the crossbench. It incentivises social media companies to adopt mechanisms which facilitate the identification of online anonymous trolls. And if they don't adopt these mechanisms, social media companies may be liable as publishers of the def uh, defamatory or abusive material. The government's bill makes it very clear that page owners are not publishers of defamatory material. Uh, which, of course, is a very significant improvement in the current law. These reforms are essential in the rapidly changing and evolving online world. Uh, this is a wonderful development for women in particular who suffer so much abuse online. Uh, they are a particular concern of our government, and I celebrate this very significant announcement. Thank you. Senator Patrick. Delay is the enemy of freedom of information. Information has uh, currency uh, if it is new and uh, can, can be very stale in a very short period of time. I currently have 22 matters before the Information Commissioner appealing access refusals from government departments. Some of my uh, matters with the Information Commissioner have been on foot for two years. I've got uh, tw uh, 12 of them that have been on foot for over a year. In order to remedy this, I've uh, made an application in the federal court to make a determination across a broad range of my FOI reviews to find out what is a reasonable time frame for the Information Commission to make a decision. In making that application, I am supported by affidavits from uh, EDO, from the Australia Institute, from businesses, from Mr Mark Dreyfus, QC, all appreciating that this is a matter that needs to be sorted out. Uh, last week, I was in uh, court seeking a protective cost order, recognising that my, my matter is a public interest matter. There's no, there's no benefit that flows from me. I get a ruling that will help everyone. What does the Commonwealth do at the last moment? They throw a $150,000 legal threat at me. A legal thugs. That's what uh, we've got with the Commonwealth, throwing uh, at the very last minute a, a, a threat of legal costs against me. I won't be deterred. This is going to be David and Goliath, but this is a really important matter, and I am going to seek help from others. Uh, and, and I will not back down Thank on this. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Ayres. Acting Deputy President, well, in House Question Time last week, it was revealed that the Deputy Prime Minister has appointed his mate, the retiring Mayor of Tamworth, as the head of Infrastructure Australia. Mr Murray's appointment is an insult to the very concept of a merit-driven process. The Northern Daily Leader, the Journal of Record in New England, 
reported last week that Mr Murray was appointed to the role after what they described as an informal chat with Mr Joyce. It quotes Mr Murray, C Councillor Murray. He said, we were sort of having a chat. This wasn't a formal chat. It was an informal chat about what I was going to do when I finished in the council. I said, well, it looks like I've got a position at the University of New England on their board. I said, I wouldn't mind one other thing to give me something to do, something to keep my mind active and keep myself engaged. He went on to say, I said, if there was a vacancy on something like Infrastructure Australia, that'd be really good for me. I like that sort of thing. Well, Mr Joyce's mate's wish is Mr Joyce's command. But Infrastructure Australia is a very important organisation. Advice and research for all levels of Australian government about tens of billions of dollars worth of critical infrastructure. It just shows what's happened at the rotten heart of this government that's so corrupted that it can't see the public interest, only its private interest, questions of merit become irrelevant. See, the National Party has become a jobs board for National Party mates. This government no longer deals with questions in terms of the public interest. It's become a men's shed for mates, a jobs board for mates, uh, and it's totally Thank lost you, its Senator way. Rez, your time has expired. Senator Bragg. I'd like to make some remarks about the 20th anniversary of the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust, uh, which was uh, passed uh, by the Howard government in order to protect and preserve the, the lands uh, which were used primarily by the defence forces um, over the past uh, 100 years or so. Uh, and what this uh, trust has enabled uh, is the preservation of military history the preservation of environment and the preservation of significant uh, Indigenous and other uh, cultural heritage uh, on Sydney Harbour. Uh, you'd have to argue that Sydney Harbour, being the most beautiful uh, natural harbour in the world, uh, is well served by having a trust like this. Now, it is unusual for the national government to be running something like this, but I think it's enjoyed bipartisan support uh, and it is doing a, a good job. The government has put some uh, additional money into this trust in the past budget or so uh, to ensure that remediation on the buildings can be completed so that there can be broadened public access. And that's really the key point here. These lands are for the public, for the public's enjoyment, uh, and they're not to be uh, sold off or closed up in any way. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, uh, I wanted to pay tribute and give my thanks to the more than 200 volunteers of the Headland Preservation Group uh, who have given their time to ensure that the sites uh, look good and that when you go to one of the sites you can be given a decent tour uh, and some advice about what's happened here from the military perspective, the Indigenous perspective, so on and so forth. So 20 years of that trust, uh, here's to the next 20. Thank you, Senator, Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. In Australia, there is a significant divide in the quality and quantity of health and hospital services between our regions and between our cities. This inequity exists when it comes to maternal health, to mental health, to trauma care and specialist services. It exists for allied health services. It exists for GP access. It exists for after-hours care and support services. This is grossly unfair, and it is especially unfair on those who are vulnerable, those who live in our remotest areas. It's unfair for women, it's unfair for our First Nations Australians. So when we know Australians in our regions are living with such inequity in the quality of their health services, it is absolutely galling to find a situation like we currently have in Sejuna with Yadu Health. Because, as I've raised in this place previously, this clinic, this Aboriginal Community Health Clinic, which serves First Nations South Australians not only in Sejuna but in the surrounding areas, is in a catastrophic state of disrepair, which the government knows about, which both levels of government knows about, and which has not been fixed. There's black mould. 
there is asbestos contamination, water damage which led to sections of the roof caving in on this vital service. These issues, when combined, have led to a catastrophic situation. They are amplified by the other inequities which already exist when it comes to the quality and quantity of health services for Australians in our regions and particularly for First Nations Australians. In the closing of the GAP statement, the Prime Minister announced $254 million worth of capital works to fund these precise sorts of projects. So I am again calling on the Prime Minister, calling on the Minister for Health to fix Yadu, to fix this vital health service. Senator Abetz. Today, crates full of live rock lobster and abalone will be loaded to an airbus at Hobart Airport, signalling the resumption of a cargo service that takes fresh produce from Tasmania to vital Asian markets. The resumption of this service by Cathay Pacific is indicative of how vibrant Tasmania's primary industry sector is, from live abalone, live uh, rock lobster cherries and other fresh produce is being delivered to Asian markets to command the premium prices that Tasmanian produce is deserving of. More importantly, this service, which over this period has lasted for only eight weeks, will now be, for a period of 12 weeks, a 50 per cent increase. And of course, that is because of the demand to get fresh Tasmanian produce to the Asian markets, be they Hong Kong, China, Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, Vietnam, Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia and the Philippines. All this, uh, Mr President, is indicative of a healthy, vibrant Tasmanian primary industry sector. What it's also indicative of is that the promise made by the then Abbott opposition to extend the Hobart runway to cater for planes like this because it would deliver job security and export potential has uh, delivered that which was promised. Uh, in fact, the extension on the runway was delivered under budget and on time, and the people of Tasmania, and in particular the workers of Tasmania, are the beneficiaries, as of course are Senator those Betts. who are fortunate enough to consume our product. Senator Abetz, thank you. It being 2 p.m., we do need to move to questions without notice. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Last week, Senator Payne attended a meeting with Mr. Morrison, Ms. Archer, and Mr. Frydenberg. Who made the request for this minister to attend this meeting, and when was that request made? Uh, the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and I thank Senator McAllister for the question. I was already in the Prime Minister's office for a meeting on another matter, and I was asked to remain in the office. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Was the minister aware that Ms Archer had asked that the meeting be postponed? Minister. Uh, no. Um, thank you, Mr President, and uh, in response to Senator McAllister's question. Uh, no, I was not specifically aware that uh, there had been a request for the meeting to be postponed. Uh, I was simply asked to remain in the Prime Minister's office where I had been for another meeting. Senator McAllister, a second supplementary question. Can the minister confirm Ms Archer, in her own words, spent the first half of the conversation crying and apologising? Minister. Thank you, Mr President. I'm not going to comment on uh, a private meeting between uh, Prime Minister and colleagues. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. How is the Liberal Nationals government responding to international developments in relation to the new COVID-19 variant of concern? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and uh, thank you, Senator Smith, for your question. As we've seen in the media over the last, over the last few days, Mr President, a new strain of COVID-19 first detected in Southern Africa, known as the Omicron strain, has been declared a variant of concern by the World Health Organisation. 
the Om Omicron strain has a high number, a high number of mutations within its spike protein. Three cases of the variant have been detected in Australia in passengers arriving to Sydney and to Darwin, Mr. President. 14 passengers from a Sydney flight from Southern Africa, including two infected, are in quarantine and the remaining passengers are isolating. One person at the Howard Springs quarantine facility has tested positive to the new Omicron COVID variant. Yesterday, the Minister for Health signed a biosecurity determination valid until 12 December, preventing people who have been in an Omicron high-risk country within 14 days from entering Australia, unless they are an Australian citizen, permanent Order. resident, immediate family member or of a citizen or are otherwise exempt, including crew, diplomats and members of the Australian Defence Force. High-risk countries for this purpose are Botswana, Eswatini, Lesotho, Malawi, Mozambique, Namibia, Seychelles, South Africa and Zimbabwe. Mr. President, during this period, flights from these countries will not be permitted. Australian citizens, permanent residents and immediate family members who have been in high-risk countries in the 14 days prior to their travel uh, will be permitted to return but be required to undertake quarantine of 14 days in a managed facility. Uh, Mr. President, the government has increased the smart traveller advice level for these high-risk countries in Minister, Southern Africa Minister, to do not travel. Your time has expired. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. How does Australia's vaccination rate compare to other countries? Minister. Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Smith, for your supplementary question. Mr. President, on both the health and economic fronts, Australia has fared better than most countries in dealing with COVID-19. More than 92 per cent of the eligible population over 16 are now protected against COVID-19 with a first dose and more than 86 per cent with a second dose. Of the 38 developed OECD countries, Australia has the second lowest number of COVID cases per capita. The UK and the US have more than 40 times the number of COVID deaths compared to Australia. For example, over 12 per cent of people in the United States and 11 per cent of people in the United Kingdom have had COVID. By contrast, 0.4 per cent of Australians have had COVID. It's estimated that our program of support for Australians has saved more than 30,000 lives, Mr President, an important Minister, number. your time has expired. Senator Smith, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How can Australia's con how can Australians continue to prepare as new strains of COVID-19 enter the country? Minister. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Smith. Very simple action that Australians can take. Get vaccinated. Vaccination continues to be our best defence against the virus. To provide even greater protection against COVID-19, Australians aged 18 and over who have received two doses of a vaccine at least six months ago are now eligible for a booster shot. This follows advice from Australia's vaccine experts, the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation, and approval from Australia's medicines regulator, the Therapeutic Goods Administration. The booster program, Mr President, will roll out directly to people living in residential aged care and disability homes uh, through inreach programs. Uh, and uh, as of uh, today, there's over 500 aged care facilities and quite a few disability sites that have already received those inreach programs. This makes Australia one of the first countries in the world to commence a whole of population booster program. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Liberal MP Bridget Archer said she spent the first half of her meeting with Mr. Morrison, Senator Payne, and Mr. Frydenberg crying and apologising, and that she requested that the meeting with Mr Morrison be delayed. Was the Treasurer aware of Ms Archer's request? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, look, I'm not aware uh, of the, uh, the details of conversations between the Treasurer uh, and Ms Archer in relation to that matter. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Ms Archer has said that she went to Treasurer Frydenberg's office expecting a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him 
but that instead he took her to the Prime Minister's office. Did Mr. Morrison ask Mr. Frydenberg to bring Ms. Archer to his office, or was it Mr. Frydenberg's idea to ambush Ms. Archer with a meeting she was not ready for? Uh, Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, again, I'm not aware of uh, conversations between the Prime Minister uh, and the Treasurer in relation to, uh, to such matters. Uh, I would note it would not be unusual Order. for the Leader of the Liberal Party to, uh, to want to engage with uh, parliamentary members of the Liberal Party. Senator Keneally, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Former Liberal MP Julia Banks has said that when she crossed the floor, Order. Mr. Frydenberg and I quote, played good cop, trying to lure me and ambush me, showering praise on me, declaring we were very good friends while saying I had to meet with the PM. Was this good cop tactic conceived by Mr. Frydenberg, or was he directed by Mr. Morrison? Minister. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, Mr. President, um, uh, look, uh, I'm uh, aware Ms. Banks makes a number of media comments. Uh, I haven't seen uh, that particular detail of media comment. But in relation to uh, the consequences of crossing the floor, Mr. President, uh, I'm well aware of the difference uh, between the consequences of crossing the floor on this side, the Liberal and National Parties. Minister, Minister, resume your seat. Senator Keneally, on a point, point of order. Point of order is direct relevance. The question was not about crossing the floor. It was about the meeting that occurred. There is no way this could be directly relevant to the question that was asked. Minister, I will bring you back to the question that was asked, um, but you have the call. I cannot direct a minister how to answer a question. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, uh, Senator Keneally's uh, uh, question uh, indeed uh, did, it, did contain references uh, to quotes about uh, the consequences of crossing the floor. Uh, and, Mr. President, the point I was making in relation to the consequences of crossing the floor uh, is that on our side of the chamber, the Liberal and National parties, members and senators have a right to cross the floor. Yes, you would expect and anticipate uh, that party leaders would wish to discuss that uh, with uh, Liberal or National MPs. Uh, but for those opposite, there is no such right. The only consequence there is that their party tosses them out if they cross the floor. That is a fundamental difference, and it's a difference of which we are all very proud Minister, on this side. Minister, order, order, Senator McGrath. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the minister update the Senate on the current situation in the Solomon Islands? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator McGrath uh, for his question. Australia is deeply concerned by the recent civil unrest in, uh, in Honiara. I can advise the Senate that following several days of protests uh, with some violence, there were no significant incidents overnight or this morning. Uh, we do continue to monitor the situation very closely, however, and to respond accordingly. We understand there have, regrettably, been four deaths during the unrest. A curfew remains in place in Honiara between 7 p.m. and 6 a.m. daily. Australia continues to call for calm, an end to violence and for tensions to be resolved peacefully. Our focus is to support stability. We do not take sides in these differences, nor do we take a position on other countries' choices about their diplomatic relationships. Australia has responded as a close friend, neighbour and partner, following a request from the Solomon Islands government under our bilateral security treaty. This is our responsibility under the treaty and the right thing to do in support of our Pacific family. Australian personnel are there primarily to support the Royal Solomon Islands Police Force. Australian Federal Police are working with the RSIPF along with Papua New Guinean personnel to conduct community patrols to maintain security. The Australian Defence Force are supporting the RSIPF and the AFP. We acknowledge the professional work of the Royal Solomon Islands Police Force to bring the situation under control. Mr President, the Australian mission in Honiara is operational and all staff and families are safe. I've spoken to uh, the acting head of mission uh, again today. We again advise Australians to avoid protests, to monitor local media, to avoid areas affected by protests and roadblocks and to follow the advice of local authorities. Senator McGrath, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister provide further detail on Australia's support to our friend and neighbour? 
Minister. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank uh, Senator McGrath, and also thank Senator McGrath for his interest in, uh, in these matters in the Solomon Islands. Um, within 24 hours of the request for assistance from the Solomon Islands government, Australia had responded. The Royal Australian Air Force began flights in support of our response on the 25th of November. As of this morning, we had deployed 45 AFP, 76 ADF, and eight DFAT personnel. In addition to the Australian personnel already, of course, based in the Solomon Islands. HMAS Armadale is scheduled to arrive tomorrow. We are taking every precaution against the risk of COVID-19 transmission. One of the Royal Australian Air Force flights that landed in Honiara yesterday carried 1,280 rapid antigen test kits to ensure no risk is posed by our personnel or those of partners. Australia's support is to contribute to maintaining stability, enabling tensions to be resolved by the Solomon Islands people within their own system. Senator McGrath, a second supplementary. Thank you. Can the minister advise the Senate on Australia's engagement with Pacific partners and others in our shared response? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. And in addition to Australia's own deployment, we are working closely with regional partners who are similarly committed to a stable Pacific. We welcome the participation of 37 members of the Royal Papua New Guinea Constabulary who have deployed alongside Australian personnel. We are working with Fiji to mobilise a number of uh, RFMF personnel who are expected to arrive tomorrow. These efforts are also in response to requests from the Solomon Islands government. Australia is also in discussion with New Zealand about further cooperation. I have engaged with my counterparts across the Pacific, and Prime Minister Morrison and Minister Seselja have done the same. Australia continues to engage and work with our Pacific family and like-minded partners as the situation develops. We are strongly committed to peace, security and stability across our region. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. My question without notice is to Senator Payne, the minister representing the Minister for Trade. Minister, countries in Southern Africa are grappling with the new Omicron COVID variant while also suffering low vaccination rates. Meanwhile, Australia is set to join World Trade Organization's ministerial meetings soon with the proposed intellectual property waiver on COVID-19 vaccines on the agenda, which would allow for mass vaccine production across the Global South. The government has stated that rather than support the waiver proposed by India and South Africa, it would try to find a convergence with the opposing countries. Your government is making no effort to galvanise support for a strong waiver. Amnesty International has labelled Australia a passive bystander in light of this. Why is the government taking the coward's way out and refusing to join more than 60 countries to co-sponsor the vaccine waiver as proposed by India and South Africa? The minister representing the Minister for Trade, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank uh, Senator Faruqi for her question. We have been uh, consistent in our approach uh, on the TRIPS waiver, but let me begin by saying, uh, Mr President, that we are also very disappointed that the WTO's 12th Ministerial Conference, the MC12, uh, has been postponed owing to uh, the occurrence of the Omicron COVID-19 variant. We have consistently said, Mr President, that Australia will support a TRIPS waiver, and our position has not changed. A waiver can only be passed with the support of all 164 WTO members, and there is no proposal on the table right now that has the required level of support. Uh, we are, as I said, disappointed that the conference has been postponed, but we remain committed to delivering an ambitious and meaningful outcome on the waiver. We are working with other countries to find common ground on a solution that will ensure all countries can overcome any intellectual property barriers as they respond to COVID-19 or future pandemics. We are, I would note, Mr. President, committed to supplying up to 60 million vaccine doses to our region by the end of 2022, including a number of developing nations, a significant number, including 20 million vaccine doses that Australia has already committed to share with the Pacific and Southeast Asia by mid-2022, an additional 20 million doses from Australia's own supply to be shared by the end of 2022, and up to a further 20 million doses to be procured through a partnership with UNICEF also to be shared by the end of 2022. And, Mr President, we have already shared more than 9.2 million of these doses across our region as at the end of this month. 
including 4.6 million doses to Indonesia, 1.5 million to Vietnam, 1 million to Fiji, 700,000 to the Philippines delivered last week, almost 678,000 678, to Timor-Leste, over 200,000 to the Solomon Islands, over 200,000 to Papua New Guinea. We have committed $130 million to the COVAX Minister, Advanced Market Commitment as well. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question? Minister, Australia's donor funding to the global COVAX facility is low, very low by global standards. Australia is contributing only $4 per person, compared to nearly triple that by the United States, and many times less than countries such as Sweden and Norway. Why is Australia shunning the COVAX facility with such miserly contributions and failing to do its fair Order. share, helping the Global South countries get vaccinated? Do you Order. even care about global vaccine equity? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Caring about global vaccine equity, Mr. President, includes delivering. Delivering on the sorts of commitments that I made explicitly clear in response to Senator Faruqi's previous question. But in the absence of that having been heard at the other end of the chamber, Mr. President, let me reiterate it in very clear terms. We are committed to supplying up to 60 million vaccine doses to our region by the end of 2022. 20 million vaccine doses that we've already committed to share with the Pacific and Southeast Asia by mid next year. An additional 20 million doses from Australia's own supply to be shared by the end of next year, and up to a further 20 million doses to be procured through our funded partnership with UNICEF, also to be shared by the end of 2022. We have already shared over 9 million doses, Mr. President, across our region. 4.6 million to Indonesia, 1.5 million to Vietnam, 1 million to Fiji, 700,000 to the Philippines, 677,850 to Timor Leste, 213,000 to Solomon Islands. Your time has expired. Senator Faruqi, a second supplementary question. Minister, last month the World Health Organization reported that just five African countries, less than 10 per cent of Africa's 54 nations, are projected to hit their 2021 target of fully vaccinating 40 per cent of their people. Not 2022, 2021 unless they said efforts to accelerate the pace take off. How many more people have to unnecessarily get sick and die from COVID in the Global South before Australia backs the strong TRIPS waiver and properly funds COVAX? Senator Faroki, your time has it. Minister. I will not have Australia misrepresented as not backing the TRIPS waiver because that is not true and you are spreading misinformation in doing that. I will not have Australia misrepresented in relation to our contribution to the international vaccine effort and most particularly in our region, Mr President, the Pacific and Southeast Asia, which is our backyard. And the contributions that we are making in those countries are changing lives and saving lives. Senator Gallagher. I thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. How many funds in the Morrison Joyce government's budget are allocated at the discretion of the minister, and what is their total value? Uh, the Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I don't have those details uh, immediately to hand, as, uh, as I'm sure would not be of a surprise to Senator Gallagher. I'm happy to, uh, to take. Uh, those details uh, on notice, so far as uh, so far as we can uh, extract that information, as, uh, uh, as Senator Gallagher well knows, uh, the uh, the administration uh, directly of funds uh, occurs across a range of portfolios. Uh, the Department of Finance uh, operates the Commonwealth Grant Guidelines and uh, and has a role in relation to the approval of those grant guidelines, which are then administered across the relevant portfolio departments and by uh, different ministers, providing support uh, for a range of different services uh, right around the country. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Commonwealth grants have been used as vehicles, for example, during COVID-19 uh, to provide additional support uh, to early childhood education and care services, to provide uh, one particular uh, example, Mr. President, that comes to mind. Indeed, they've also been used as a vehicle uh, by Senator Colbeck uh, in this chamber to help provide additional targeted support to aged care facilities uh, around Australia. And so the grant guidelines are used for a range of different uh, functions and purposes in terms of supporting the delivery of Commonwealth assistance. Uh, yes, Mr. President, they often support, and I suspect and this will be where Senator Gallagher goes, a range of different local or community uh, related projects. Uh, and those projects uh, are done in accordance with those grant guidelines too. 
uh, but uh, the types of uh, discretion that are provided, uh, the types of non-competitive processes that exist in place, uh, those types of processes are often there, Mr. President, to enable swift response by ministers in circumstances such as those uh, that I outlined before uh, in supporting uh, direct targeted assistance uh, to sectors that need it most at Order. different junctures, for example, those in aged care or early childhood during the COVID-19 pandemic. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you. Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister confirm that over the eight long years of the Morrison-Joyce government, ministers have allocated 71 per cent of $3.9 billion worth of taxpayers' funds in these discretionary grant funds to coalition seats? Minister. Well, Mr. Mr. President, uh, I, I can confirm that Senator Gallagher uh, is quoting from uh, what I understand to be an Australia Institute uh, study uh, that has selectively chosen, selectively Order, chosen right. uh, a number, a very small number of Commonwealth grant programs uh, upon which to base its analysis. Mr. President, uh, that's the figure that uh, that's where Senator Gallagher is drawing her figures from. Uh, Mr. President, uh, an Australia Institute survey. Uh, I imagine she's quoting probably from the report published in The Guardian of the Australia Institute survey. It's, it's quite a, a virtuous little cycle we've got going here that uh, the Australia Institute does the report, The Guardian publishes it, the Labor Party asks about it. But of course, it's all just selective reporting uh, when it comes to, uh, comes to these matters, Mr. President. Uh, the fact is that in selecting these targeted areas, there's a disproportionate capturing of regional grants, for example, where the coalition holds the vast majority of electorates, uh, Mr. President. So Minister, it would be a little surprise Minister, uh, that these Minister, regional programs support. Minister, Minister, time has expired. Senator Gallagher, Thank you, a Mr. second President. supplementary. Can the minister explain why seats held by independents and that the coalition wanted to win back? have received an average of $206 per person. Coalition-held seats have received $184 per person, and safe Labor seats have received just $39 per person. Why are some Australians worth more than others to Mr Morrison? Minister. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. Well, I, I, I think I can give it a crack in terms of explaining in relation to regional grants programs why it is that coalition seats uh, have benefited overall when you take all electorates across the country more than Labor held seats, or even why independents Order. might have benefited more. And that, Mr. President, would be the maths of the fact that the coalition holds more regional seats than does the Labor Party. And indeed, in terms of proportionality, the independents uh, have, uh, have greater representation in some of the regions than they do in some of the urban areas, Mr. President. Uh, so, in terms of distorted statistics and figures, Mr. President, which is what are being bowled up here, the simple reality uh, of these programs is: yes, they will support Liberal and National Party-held seats at a, to a greater degree because those communities have elected Liberal and National Party MPs across regional Australia, across regional Australia, or in some cases they've elected independent MPs. That is simply a function of our Minister, parties holding those Minister. electorates. Senate order. Senator Hughes. Senator Roberts. Uh, a question. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. In recent months, more than one million Australians have participated in freedom protests around our country, with many not wearing a mask, not socially distancing, and mostly being uninjected. Opportunities for person-to-person -person transmission of COVID runs into the tens of millions, which we're told is inviting mass outbreaks. Yet the only case I know of COVID transmission at a Freedom Rally was a cluster that occurred in the Melbourne Rally, and that cluster was amongst Antifa anti-freedom protesters. Minister, in the last three months, how many COVID clusters, that's two or more infections, have occurred at Freedom Rallies? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, thanks, Senator Roberts, for the question. Um, Mr President, I don't think that there's been any attempts to attribute specific COVID infections to uh, any such public event of that nature. So uh, I don't have, uh, and we don't hold, the government doesn't hold data in relation to that. 
or, although it may be that some of that information is held at a state level where the contact tracing processes uh, for COVID-19 are conducted, Mr. President. Uh, but can I go back to something that I've put to the chamber on a number of occasions? Uh, the whole point of where the government is going in relation to the vaccination program is to get as many Australians as possible to be vaccinated. We know the vaccine works. We know that it's safe, and we know that it supports ourselves in protecting us from COVID-19. We know that it protects our families, and we know that it protects our communities. Uh, and one of the really fortunate things that we've seen in this country is the willingness of Australians to go out and get vaccinated. In excess of 92% of Australians have now had a first dose. In excess of 86% of Australians have now had a second dose. It's one of the reasons that. Um, we are able to start to reopen our economy, uh, to reopen our communities, which is what I think the people who are uh, participating in these protests are looking for. They want to see uh, us be able to get around uh, more freely. Uh, and the discipline, the decision to take up a vaccine, which we know is safe, we know that works, is really important, Mr. President. And we continue to monitor circumstances globally, as I said in my uh, answer to the question uh, earlier in question time to Senator Smith so that we can understand what's happening with new variants. We can take appropriate actions to protect Australians from those new variants while we learn more about them, get to understand the impact that uh, the vaccines might have on those new variants uh, so that we can keep Australians safe. And we will continue to take all of the actions that we need to do Minister, to do just that. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Roberts, supplementary question. Thank you. A European study found the death rate per 100,000 of double vaccinated subjects averaged 2.5 per month, with the uninjected un un rate lower at 1.1. The government has authorised the third booster shot, so must have modelled death rates against overseas experience and have an anticipated outcome from your booster program. Minister, what is the anticipated death rate for triple vaccinated Australians as compared to unvaccinated Australians? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. One of the things that we've seen here in Australia uh, and around the world, and one of the things that we've been concerned about as the pandemic has continued to progress, is the impact on, un on the unvaccinated of the virus. Uh, that I, I, I know that when I was in Japan earlier in the year, the reporting out of the US uh, that I saw on a daily basis was that in the United States it was becoming very much a, a, a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Somewhere between 90 and 95 per cent of those in hospital uh, suffering severe symptoms of COVID-19 were actually unvaccinated. Some figures out of New South Wales earlier this year indicated that uh, similar proportions—90 to 95 per cent of those in hospital with severe illness, uh, severe symptoms of the virus were actually unvaccinated, Mr President. The data is very clear. The data is very clear. Uh, and it shows up in the circumstances of the most vulnerable in this country, that the vaccine works. Minister, Minister, your time has expired. Senator Roberts, a second supplementary. The South African Health Minister said on Sky News that the scientist who isolated Omicron never said it would be vaccine resistant. Angelique Coetzee, the South African Medical Association Chair, stated on Fox, symptoms are so mild we don't know why so much hype is being driven. Yet Australian media have dialed fear to the maximum. Freedoms are again being removed, and big pharma are raking in billions from boosters. Minister, will the death of the Liberal Party be counted as a COVID death or as self-inflicted? Minister. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, I suspect a party as proud as the Liberal Party will probably be around for a fair while longer than Pauline Hanson's One Nation Party. So, Mr. President, and, and, I, and I look forward to that, Mr. President. But can I say, um, I do agree with Senator Roberts with respect to uh, we, we need to take the time, take the moment to understand the circumstances of this new variant. Um, that's why the government has taken the proportionate measures that it has done to ensure that we have the time to understand uh, what the impact of this variant might be with respect to vaccination. Uh, with respect to transmission, with respect to the seriousness of its impact on the communities uh, before we continue the processes that we'd undertaken with respect to opening up. That's why we took the appropriate precautionary response at the weekend to say seven nations, uh, sorry, nine nations will, will cease 
uh, access to Australia. Uh, so Minister, we need to Minister, your time has expired. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Attorney General, Senator Cash. Can the Attorney General please outline to the Senate how the Liberal and National government is unmasking and tackling online trolls to protect everyday Australians from harassment and abuse online? The Attorney General, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Henderson for the question, and I do acknowledge her keen interest uh, in this particular area. And Mr President, as the Prime Minister said yesterday, we know that social media has for far too long allowed trolls, bots and bigots to weaponise anonymity to strike out at ordinary Australians. Uh, that is just unacceptable behaviour. And that is why the Morrison-Joyce government will introduce new laws which are capable of forcing global social media giants to unmask anonymous online trolls and at the same time better protect Australians when they are online. This is a world first legislation, Mr President, and we will address these pressing issues of online abuse and defamation liability. The legislation which will go to exposure draft this week will do the following. In the first instance, provide certainty flowing from the High Court's decision in Fairfax Media and Voller, and we will clarify who is a publisher of defamatory comments on social media, and that will be the social media company themselves. We will also protect Australian social media users from potential liability for comments made by online trolls. We will support Australians who are the subject of defamatory comments on social media to unmask anonymous online trolls, and we will assist Australians to institute defamation proceedings in state and territory courts. We will deem, as I said, the social media providers to be a publisher of defamatory comments on their platform in circumstances where the online troll cannot be identified. Again, Mr President, this is all about protecting ordinary Australians from liability for comments made by third-party users on social media. It is also about ensuring that anyone who operates in the online space is operating in a safe space. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Uh, thanks, Mr President. Why is it important for the government to take strong action against online trolls and ensure social media companies are helping to ensure online safety? Minister Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And we know social media use it is increasing, and it's increasing in Australia. But what that increase in the utilisation of social media has done is bring greater exposure to online harms, and that includes exposure to defamation. We know that social media can amplify the harmful defamatory impact of material posted by online trolls. This includes the use of algorithms, which can push harmful material to users far more quickly than was possible through traditional media. At this point in time, victims have limited to no recourse against the anonymous originators of defamatory comments made on social media. What we will do is we will provide new pathways for victims to quickly and easily identify originators of defamatory material posted on social media. Again, this is world leading in terms of what Australia is doing to ensure that when you are online, you're in a safe environment. Senator Henderson, a second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, with more Australians than ever using and benefiting from social media today, can you please outline what the government is doing about online harms more broadly? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. And the Morrison Joyce government has been leading the way in protecting Australians online. When eSafety was established in 2015, it was the first agency in the world dedicated to protecting citizens from online dangers such as cyberbullying targeted at children. Through the work of Minister Fletcher with the Online Safety Act and the eSafety Commissioner, we are bringing the rules of the real world to the online world. And this, of course, includes the introduction of a complaints-based removal notice scheme for cyber abuse for adults based on the model that is in place for children. Our government has also recently released our online privacy code, working to protect our personal data and, in particular, our children's data 
and ensure that it is used appropriately. The government also acted quickly to protect Australians from the live streaming of terrorist content through the abhorrent violent material legislation. Senator McCarthy. Mr President, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister confirm that nearly two years after COVID-19 reached Australian shores and with the emergence of a new variant of concern, not one new federal quarantine facility has yet opened its doors? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank, uh, I thank the senator uh, for her question. Uh, Mr President, uh, Australia's uh, decisions uh, taken and led by the Prime Minister from, uh, from the 1st of February last year to uh, close our international borders have been a key feature in terms of yeah. Australia's success uh, in protecting Australians from COVID-19 and in ensuring that, uh, that we have uh, saved lives, uh, some estimated 30,000-plus lives, compared with uh, the OECD averages in terms of deaths around the world. Uh, alongside that, we've been fortunate to be able, uh, thanks to economic responses, to be able to save businesses, to be able to save jobs, and to be able to ensure that Australia weathers this global storm caused by this global pandemic. Minister, Minister, oh, yeah. on the on a point of order, Senator McCarthy. Our relevance, uh, I've asked specifically about the building of new quarantine facilities. Uh, I'm, I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer. Um, uh, the, I, I'll allow you to bring the minister back to the question. Minister, uh, you have the call. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. Those, uh, those border closures uh, have served Australia well. The quarantine arrangements that, uh, that have been associated with uh, those border closures have also overwhelmingly worked effectively and served Australians well as well. In the vast majority of, Austra of cases, uh, hundreds of thousands of Australians have been able to, uh, to move uh, back into our country safely and securely. Uh, part of that, Mr President, has been uh, the crucial role that the Howard Springs facility uh, has played in the Northern Territory, uh, which received significant expansion to the 2,000 capacity uh, during this time frame. Mr President, in addition to uh, the work of the Howard Springs facility, uh, work is underway on additional quarantine facilities uh, in Melbourne, Brisbane and Perth, uh, following uh, the encouragement uh, and Order. partnership agreements struck uh, by Order. state governments in each of those jurisdictions. Uh, the first of those is scheduled to uh, see beds handed over uh, to the Victorian government uh, by the end of this year. Uh, that remains on track and remains the case in terms of providing longer-term capabilities to respond to uh, COVID or other emergencies into the future. Senator McCarthy, a supplementary question. Would Australia's defences against the Omicron variant be stronger if Mr Morrison had listened to the experts and built fit-for-purpose national health Order. quarantine? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. Well, Australia's defences uh, throughout COVID-19 as I said at the outset, have been incredibly strong. We've shown amazing resilience as a nation uh, and we've shown great capacity to be able uh, to minimise uh, the loss of life and, whilst minimising the loss of life, to work ourselves into a position as a nation where we are now one of the most heavily vaccinated and most protected populations and nations across the planet. Uh, and that, Mr President, is our key protection in relation to COVID-19. Uh, we are working on building these additional centres for national resilience. Uh, these centres will serve the purpose uh, in, re in continued response uh, to COVID-19, but also Mr. President, they will serve Keneally. a purpose in response to other future uh, pandemics, natural disasters or emergency situations uh, around the world. It is important in relation to the Omicron variant that we do keep a sense of perspective as many infectious disease and public health experts have urged, and the government is working Minister. through the evidence in relation to that. Senator McCarthy, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. How many more variants of concern will appear on Australian shores before Mr. Morrison finally delivers fit for purpose national quarantine capacity? Minister. Oh. Mr. President, um, uh, I think it is uh, very important 
for uh, all leaders in this place to keep a sense of perspective Senator in relation Kennedy. to the Omicron variant uh, or indeed other variants that may emerge in the future. Uh, as Professor Peter Collignon, infectious diseases physician at the ANU, uh, said, uh, fear is out of proportion to the data at the moment with this new variant. Uh, and indeed, as Professor Greg Dore, epidemiologist at the Kirby Institute, said, the ideal response to uncertainty is to accelerate evidence gathering. It's not to pull Order the panic levers. Mr. President, I would urge those opposite and all to keep that sense of perspective at present. Uh, the government has acted in a precautionary way to further tighten border restrictions in relation to a number of nations across uh, the southern part of the African continent. Uh, we are continuing Senator to receive Gallagher. regular briefings in relation to this, but it is notable that a number of health experts have highlighted uh, the seemingly mild implications of this variant, uh, and so we ought to all keep Minister. it in perspective. Senator Molan. Uh, Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Emergency Management and National, and, uh, uh, National Recovery and Resilience, Senator McKenzie. Can the minister update the Senate on what arrangements the Liberal and National Government has in place to ensure we are well prepared for bushfires, floods and other natural disasters this high-risk weather season? The Minister for Emergency Manage Management, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Molan for his question and his long interest in emergency management matters. The Australian Government is well prepared to respond to disasters that may occur during the upcoming high-risk weather season. We've been working closely with states and territories to ensure that all levels of government are ready to respond quickly and effectively. Since September this year, our government, through Emergency Management Australia, has led a national preparedness program with states and territories, industry and non-for-profit organisations so that we've practised our responses to crises. On 5 September, we announced additional funding to support preparedness for the upcoming season, including $2 million for the National Community Education and Engagement program for the Australian Warning System due to commence this week, $4 million to the Australian Aerial Firefighting Centre to fund the lease of a large air tanker, uh, over $20 million to implement the Australian Fire Danger Rating System to give clear and consistent fire danger information across Australia, and $23 million to enhance EMA's National Situation Room to have the most up-to-date information to hand in a crisis. But we know that these severe weather events are inevitable, and that's why we're even better prepared to respond to disasters once they've happened. We've put in place a new streamlined process for activating the disaster recovery funding arrangements, and that's the primary way we fund recovery following disasters here in Australia. These arrangements are co-funded in partnerships with jurisdictions and delivered by state and territory who have actually requested that assistance. They provide much needed assistance for immediately after a natural disaster, but we're not just focused on immediate response and recovery, we're also focused on developing resilience because we know the money spent on building community resilience before a disaster will provide more long-term value than money spent on recovery. Our government's invested heavily in disaster risk reduction with the $600 million Preparing Australia program. And on the 8th of November, I no announced the release of the grant opportunity guidelines for round Minister, one. Minister, Minister, and I look forward to applications. Has expired. Senator Molan, a supplementary question. Um, Mr. President, thank you. With COVID restrictions still in place in some states and territories, and a new variant of concern, what has the Commonwealth government done to prepare for the movement of essential personnel during COVID-related border closures? Minister. Well, this year, the Australian government, through Emergency Management Australia, has worked with states and territories and industry to agree the COVID-19 interstate deployment protocol. The protocol will facilitate cross-border movement for emergency support specialists and technicians, not only for that immediate response uh, in the middle of a crisis, but for the all-important work associated with cleaning up and rebuilding after the disaster occurs. The updated protocol came into effect on 8 November. Uh, with endorsement from state territory emergency chiefs as well as the Australian Health Principal Protection Committee. It will mean we can ensure essential workers required to repair critical infrastructure assets like telecommunication, power, energy and health can go where they're needed to restore these essential services to Australians. It will also apply to tradespeople where rebuilding is required and insurers to make it easier for people to access the support they need to repair their homes and get their businesses back up and running after a disaster. Senator Molan, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Uh, with the high risk weather season in full force during the last few weeks, particularly in my state of New South Wales, can the minister please update the Senate on what support the government has provided to the communities recently affected by flooding across the country? Minister. Well, severe weather events like we've seen over New South Wales over the past week are always distressing for those uh, who experience them. And that's why our government is committed to supporting communities impacted by natural disasters. The recent severe weather event in New South Wales caused damage to critical infrastructure and residential properties, while the very heavy rain has caused flooding to occur and damaging crops right across New South Wales. The Australian and New South Wales government-funded disaster assistance will provide a range of practical assistance measures to help councils, individuals, primary producers, small businesses and charities to recover and get back on their feet. The assistance will help cover the costs associated with the operational response and repairing damaged essential public assets. And additionally, individuals will receive support to get back on their feet, including grants to replace essential household contents or respect, repair structural damage to homes, because our government is ready to stand side by side by these communities as, and ensure that they recover. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In December 2018, Mr Morrison stood next to Mr Porter and announced he would deliver a National Integrity Commission. But more than a thousand days later, Mr Morrison has not introduced his own legislation and last week defied the House of Representatives, which demanded an anti-corruption commission. Why did Mr Morrison say he would create a National Integrity Commission when that just wasn't true? The minister, repre the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank, uh, thank the senator for her question. Well, Mr. President, uh, uh, indeed, she is correct. The government uh, did commit uh, to, uh, to uh, build and establish a Commonwealth Integrity Commission. Uh, we not only uh, committed to it, Mr. President, uh, but uh, we funded some $150 million in, uh, in budget proceedings for it. Uh, Mr. President, uh, we have consulted on it. Correct, Senator Cash. We've consulted quite widely in relation to it. Consulted quite widely. Uh, release draft legislation uh, as part of Order that consultation, Mr. President. Uh, indeed, Senator we have uh, 349 Senator pages of legislation uh, to uh, to support the implementation of the Commonwealth Integrity Commission, Mr. Order President. We released left. our bill, Mr. President, uh, with the full intentions that we would like to implement our bill, Mr. President. The problem, Mr. President, lies in the fact that those opposite won't and don't support our bill. That's the problem. They won't agree to pass the Commonwealth Integrity Commission that the government has worked to develop, has released legislation for, Order. has provided funding for. Those opposite aren't interested in a model that ensures integrity, Order. Mr. President. They aren't interested in a model that focuses on weeding out corrupt conduct, Mr. President. What those opposite want is, of course, to make sure it's as politicised as possible. That seems to be the desire of those opposite, because their whole campaign tactics are about smear and sledging at present. We see that time and time again in the questions they bring into this place, in the nature Minister, of their interviews, Minister, in the sensitivity with Minister, resume your seat. Senator Wong. Uh, I just flag by leave that the that leader of the government can. We would give you leave to table your legislation here Senator and now, Wong, should you wish. There a point we would order. give you leave. Senator Wong, Minister, you have the call. Thanks, um, uh, thanks, thanks, Mr. President. So, so those opposite not happy with our model, but what's the alternative they've offered? Well, of course, they haven't actually provided a detailed alternative. All we can take is that they want. All we can take is that they want a vehicle for smear, uh, a vehicle for politicisation. But themselves, they only have a two-page glossy, two-page glossy, two pages compared Senator with Wong. the 349 pages Time. of legislation. Sorry. I, could you please sit down, Senator O'Neill? Those on my left calling time whilst interjecting to the point where I was dealing with the chamber is not helping. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Yesterday, New South Wales Liberal Premier Dominic Perrottet said, and I quote, ICAC does a very important job. It gets rid of corruption from public life. Why does Mr Morrison disagree with Premier Perrottet? Uh, Minister. Thanks, Mr President. Well, Mr President, we are very happy uh, to support a model for a Commonwealth Integrity Commission that is focused uh, on eliminating corrupt conduct. That is precisely what the legislation we have developed actually does, Mr President. What it does not do, though, is establish kangaroo court-type proceedings that operate in ways to destroy reputations, even Mr. President, even Mr. President, when there is no finding, let alone ultimate prosecution in relation to corrupt conduct. Mr. President, that's where the line of distinction exists. Now, in Senator Wong and my home state, Mr. President, I know that there's been a different approach taken in relation uh, to the role uh, of ICAX. It's a model that works more closely analogous uh, to the one uh, that our government has released legislation for, uh, that operates in a way that doesn't seek to destroy reputations in advance. Order. So there are different models that exist. We have presented one. We invite those opposite to publicly indicate they would support the passage of our legislation. Minister. Your time has expired. Senator O'Neill, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. President. Order. If only they were in government, yeah. Order. So, Senator O'Neill, you have the call. Last week, senators crossed the floor in defiance of Mr. Morrison, and on Thursday, a member of Mr. Morrison's own government crossed the floor in the House because of his ongoing refusal to act. Hasn't Mr. Morrison? completely lost control of the House, lost control of his senators and lost control of his government. Minister. Mr President, the answer is no. The answer very clearly is no. Uh, but those opposite are entirely focused, entirely focused on internal political machinations because that's all they know. It's certainly all that their leader, Mr Albanese, knows. It's all Mr Albanese knows are the politics of smear and the politics inside this parliament. What you don't hear them asking questions about, what you don't hear them pursuing policies on, are the things that matter to Australians. Our government is clearly focused on the 700,000 jobs that we've recreated since COVID-19 struck at its deepest point. Our government is focused on the 133,000 apprenticeships that we have created as a result of our policies. Our government is focused on the delivery of tax cuts that are putting $1.5 billion a month back into the pockets of hardworking right. Australians, Mr President. We're focused on a $110 billion infrastructure program, on national security through the AUKUS partnership. They're the things we're focused on, Mr President, Minister, not the politics of smear Minister, like those opposite. Your time has expired. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Minister Rustin. How is the Liberal and Nationals government supporting older Australians in their retirement? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Abetz uh, for his question. Well, this government is absolutely committed to finding new and innovative ways uh, to support aged pensioners and self-funded retirees in their retirement. And that's why we're in introducing legislation this week to ensure older Australians are supported to use their own resources to maximise their retirement outcomes. We're delivering on our 2021-22 budget measure, enhancing the pension loan scheme with a $21 million reform package. Um, it's important to point out that the pension loan scheme is available to all Australians who have reached age pension age, and that includes people who are part pensioners and people who are self-funded retirees. The program can be used for them to top up their retirement income by using some of the equity that they have in their home or other assets. Um, and when the so the ha their house is sold, the loan is then repaid from those proceeds. The loan amount is paid out fortnightly at the rate of up to 150 per cent of the, pension, of the full age pension. Under the budget reform, we are expanding the scheme through the introduction of lump sum payments. From the middle of next year, people using the pension loan scheme will be able to access up to two annual lump sum advances yeah. in any 12-month yeah. period up to a total of 50 per cent of the maximum annual rate of the age pension. 
The popularity of the pension loan scheme has grown more than fivefold in less than two years, as our expansions to the scheme have allowed more retirees to tap into the equity tied up in their homes to pay for additional living expenses. The School of Risk and Actuarial Studies at the University of New South Wales believe, the access, believe access to lump sum payments will increase the attractiveness of the scheme. We know that home ownership has always been the bedrock of our society, and we want to make sure that we give older Australians the confidence to tap into a small proportion of their home equity to make sure that their yeah. retirement outcomes yeah. are maximised for their own benefits. Yeah. Senator Abetz, a supplementary question? Yes, there is, Mr President. I thank the Minister for the wealth of information contained in her extensive answer. And can I ask the Minister um, for further advice, and that is, how has the government supported older Australians throughout the COVID-19 pandemic? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, as we recover from the pandemic, some older Australians are facing new challenges and stresses, such as loneliness and increased social isolation. Be Connected, which is run, uh, runs um, the friend line, and it encourages older Australians who may be lonely and not having anyone to talk to to call and have a chat to a volunteer. We know that there's a real need for assistance to alleviate loneliness and social isolation, so programs like Friendline are here to help. And I would encourage all senators in this place to make sure yeah. that you let your yeah. constituents yeah. know, particularly your older constituents, that this service is available to them. Uh, to make sure that they have someone to reach out to if they don't have a friend or family member to do so. Throughout the pandemic, we also made economic support payments to more than 2.5 million Australian age pensioners, who are among the 5.5 million Social Security recipients to receive one-off payments in 2020-21. These were paid at $750 Minister, in both March Minister, and your, July. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Abetz, a Second supplementary question. Yes, there is, Mr. President, and uh, I thank the minister again for another extensive uh, answer for which I thank her. Can the minister further update the Senate on how our Liberal National Government is providing pensioners flexibility in their retirement and tackling misinformation? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, our government is focused on ways we can make a real difference in the lives of aged pensioners. We want them to have flexibility to boost their income so that they can choose how they spend their money in retirement. We're doing this through changes to the pension loan scheme as well as the work bonus, which increases the amount a pensioner can earn from work before it affects their pension rate. This is in stark contrast to those opposite who are focused on frightening senior Australians with a false campaign. For the record, can I please repeat again in this place, the government has been very, very clear. The Morrison government has no plan and never will have a plan to force aged pensioners onto the cashless debit card. Senior Australians know that we are the party that can be trusted to protect their interest in retirement, which is exactly what we will do and continue to focus on. We will not scare aged pensioners for political gain. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Mm -hmm. we'll just give a few moments for senators to leave the chamber. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator McAllister. Thank you, Deputy President. And I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Payne and Senator Birmingham to the questions asked by Senator Keneally and myself. Well, last week, two members of the House of Representatives crossed the floor to vote against the government. One, the member for Dawson, voted against a government bill. And he delivered a speech that likened vaccine mandates and COVID restrictions to the Nazi regime, and then um, thank you. he called for civil uh, disobedience. Senator yes, Senator Scum. Deputy President, there was absolutely no reference at all in either the question put by Senator McAllister or the question put uh, by the other senator from the other side to either George Christensen or his contribution last week, and there was no reference at all in the answers from Senator either Scarf, minister with respect uh, to that question. Point. Thank you. Please resume your seat. Please continue, Senator McAllister. 
Order. Senator McAllister, please continue. Thank you, Deputy President. So one member crosses the floor under one set of circumstances, and the other member, the member for Braddon, voted to bring on a debate on an integrity commission after three years of inaction by the government. Only one of these members was hauled into the Prime Minister's office and reduced to tears. Sometimes the things that someone doesn't do can tell you as much about their character as the things that they do do. Last week in Senate Question Time, we learned that Mr Morrison didn't feel the need to speak to a member of the coalition whose comments in and out of the parliament have the capacity to incite violence. He simply wasn't interested. It wasn't important enough. Now the Prime Minister has some real questions to answer about why that's the case. But there is also a broader question. Why was Ms Archer treated so differently from Mr Christensen and forced to speak with the Prime Minister against her will? Well, Two-thirds of Australian women regularly tell surveys that they don't believe they are treated equally at work. And those women may have an idea why Mr Morrison singled out Ms Archer for special attention. They are seeing a pattern that they know all too well, because Ms Archer now has the dubious honour of joining the list of Liberal women who have publicly spoken about the way the Prime Minister, his staff or close allies have used their power against them. The Prime Minister has described the meeting as a very warm, friendly and supportive meeting. Ms Archer has said it wasn't a pastoral care meeting and, further, that she spent the first half of the conversation crying and apologising. It doesn't sound like the same meeting, does it? The Prime Minister finds himself in a position where, yet again, someone has called his version of events inaccurate and misleading. But perhaps it's not shocking that the Prime Minister has a different story from the woman who was in the room. This is the Prime Minister who has never really explained how he came to be so surprised when he learned uh, the following things. He, and I'll quote him, I have heard that women are overlooked, talked over by men, whether it is in boardrooms, in meeting rooms, in staff rooms, in media conferences, in cabinets or anywhere else. I have heard about being marginalised, women being intimidated, women being belittled, women being diminished and women being objectified. Well, the former Liberal backbencher, Ms Banks, is on the record as describing Mr Morrison as menacing. Perhaps the PM would have been less surprised if he took the time to examine how he and his office use power. The Prime Minister has made no secret of his love for the top job. He makes no secret of his love for red carpets or for power. But being powerful comes with obligations and responsibilities. You should be honest and you should exercise power in a way that enhances, not diminishes others. Now we've heard from those opposite that none of this is a big deal, that crossing the floor is a very important freedom for the Liberal Party and indeed when five senators voted for the One Nation private senators bill last Monday, Mr Morrison said that he doesn't run an autocracy. But if that's the case, where are the moderate Liberals crossing the floor for strong climate action? Where is the member for Wentworth or the member for North Sydney? Where is Senator Hume? Where are the others? Because it turns out that having the courage of your convictions requires both courage and conviction. So here we are entering the ninth year, the ninth year of this tired government. And in yet another occasion, the Prime Minister's inability to understand the way that women experience work and experience public life is on display. We have a leave pass for members who cross the floor and call for civil disobedience, and we have a dressing down for members who want an integrity commission. As I said, it's sometimes the things that someone doesn't do that tell you as much about their character as the things that they do do. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Scar. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. There were lots of debating points in that, uh, in that contribution to, uh, to be responded to. Um, can I draw particular reference to uh, Minister Birmingham and his response to the question? And I think it was an important point he made 
and it's something which all of us on this side of the chamber hold dear, and that is in the Liberal Party of Australia we have the right. We have the right, and indeed there's an expectation. There's an ex expectation from some of our members that we will exercise that right from time to time when we consider it necessary, when we consider it necessary to cross the floor on matters of great principle, of great conviction and of conscience. And the member for Bass, uh, Bridget Archer MP, exercised that right last week. And that is her right in the Liberal Party. And I want to quote from the article that appeared in The Guardian on 24 November 2021 in relation to Ms Archer MP, member for Bass, exercising that, this, that right. And I want to quote from her, and this is what she said, Deputy President. She said, quote, to be perfectly clear, I always reserve my right to cross the floor. That is one of the reasons I sit on this side in the Liberal Party, end quote. That is one of the reasons I sit on this side in the Liberal Party, end quote. So Bridget Archer, when she made her decision as the member for Bass, which party she would represent, one of the core, one of the core principles of the Liberal Party of Australia had direct relevance to her decision to join the Liberal Party of Australia. And that was her right, her right as every single member of the Liberal Party in the lower house and every Liberal senator in the upper house has, and, and members of the National Party similarly, to cross the floor, to cross the floor on matters of deep conviction and on matters of conscience, if, if they believe that is what they need to do in order to represent their constituencies and to act in accordance with their principles. And that's what Miss Archer did, the member for Bass, last week. And I deeply, deeply respect her for making that decision. And we also, we also heard from our Prime Minister in relation to that decision that our party is not a party of drones. It's not a party of drones. There are strong personalities, strong-minded individuals in our party, and we've seen that demonstrated in the two and a half years which I've been sitting in this place. And I'm sure we'll see it continue to be demonstrated in the future. And I think that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing for our democracy. I think that's a good thing for our democracy. In relation to the particular matter which Ms Archer, member for Bass, crossed the floor on in terms of the Commonwealth Integrity Commission, it is an important matter, and I certainly am 100 per cent behind the introduction of a Commonwealth Integrity Commission. Do I support the independent member's bill? No, because, because I am deeply concerned. I am deeply concerned with respect to the impact of the Commonwealth Integrity Commissioner. Any structure that might be adopted, the impact any structure could be adopted upon persons who are subjects to complaints. And I want to bring, and I've done this in the past, and I want to bring to the chamber uh, its attention to the matter of Mr Stephen Pearce, who went through, who went through the New South Wales ICAC process. Now, Mr Pearce was Deputy Commissioner of State Emergency Services. He went through an ordeal, an absolute ordeal, through New South Wales ICAC. And I quote from an article by Natalie O'Brien in the Sydney Morning Herald, dated 13 February 2016. And this is to quote Mr Stephen Pearce, who was subject to the ICAC procedures in New South Wales. I quote, my family and I suffered substantial public humiliation, emotional and financial trauma, he said. Never did the system, never did the system offer me uh, the support I needed and I was crucified publicly and professionally. I was crucified publicly and professionally. That's from Mr Stephen Pearce, who was subject to ICAC's procedures in relation to any corruption in the New South Wales jurisdiction. These are important issues. These are important issues. And Ms Archer, the member for Bass, was quite entitled to cross the floor and deeply respected for doing so. At the same time, I will say to this chamber that I will do all I can to make sure that any Commonwealth Integrity Commission gets the balance right, gets the balance right in terms of pursuing matters which ought to be pursued by a corruption commission, but also ensuring that op reputations are not unnecessarily trashed and that the legacy lasts forever, even though the political caravan Thank moves you, on. Senator Scar, your time has expired. Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. 
Well, Senator Scar's right. There's a lot of different debating points you can make about what happened in question time today in response to Senator McAllister's questions and others' questions. But I don't think the point here is about crossing the floor. I think the point here is about what happens when a woman, in particular, does something the Prime Minister doesn't want her to do, and what the impact is on that woman, and what that says about that Prime Minister's beliefs and values and the culture of this government. And I am deeply unenthusiastic about contributing to this debate, because in my two and a half years in the Senate, this issue has dominated so much of the public discourse. This government's complete ineptitude at listening to women, at understanding the issues that women are raising, at seeing this place as a workplace where not only people have rights, but we have responsibilities to one another and to each other. And for women in this workplace especially, that is abused. Now, I was in this chamber only two weeks when I first heard the phrase quota girls thrown out from those opposite me. A few weeks. What a, what, a, what a nice welcome to the chamber which has parity of gender. And in the years since, we've seen three different positions on quotas from the Prime Minister. We've had views expressed like, you know, we, we want more women in, but just not at the expense of men. We've seen all sorts of incidents when it comes to the treatment of female MPs in this government, whether it's Miss Archer, as was the, the topic in question time today, but also uh, for Julia Banks, Ms Banks, and her experience in this parliament. We've seen the, the kind of nonsense the Prime Minister's uttered to concerns of women giving birth in regional New South Wales, saying, well, the, the solution to your lack of access to maternity care isn't a hospital, it's a highway. We've seen this government sit on the Human Rights Commission's Respect at Work report for almost a year and then completely fudge their response to the recommendations, pretend they were going to do it all and renege on that commitment. But all of this pales in comparison to the way that female staff have been treated in this building. And it pales in comparison to the way women in general are treated by this government. When women join the lawns of Parliament House to march for justice and the Prime Minister says women in Australia should be grateful because not far from here such marches even now are being met with bullets. I am just so sick of having these debates. I am so appalled that this has to be a topic in question time. It has to be because it's still going on, right? It has to be because we're still seeing this kind of behaviour. But in my two and a half years here, given everything I've seen and everything this place has borne witness to, given the courage and bravery of women seeking to change the culture of this place, I'm just completely fed up that not enough seems to happen to recognise that this is a workplace, to recognise that the people within this workplace need to be treated with respect. And if women in this workplace feel like that, well, is it any wonder that women outside of this workplace looking in, first of all, don't want to put their hand up to be here, and that's especially true on the other side. Is it any wonder? But also, is it any wonder that those women don't feel like their concerns, that the issues facing them aren't being listened to or heeded to by this government? Because this is a cultural thing and it starts at the top. If this is the way Prime Minister perceives women, if this is the way the Prime Minister responds to concerns from women, is this, if this is the way that the Prime Minister runs his workplace, which is all of our workplace, then that culture is going to permeate down and it doesn't just stay in this building. It goes beyond its walls as well. And it sets a standard which then becomes the standard more broadly in the public. And it is no wonder that women in Australia are fed up. I am fed up too. So I just urge as we look at the debating points, as we continue this debate, we just give some consideration 
to how serious this is for the women outside of this building and those within Thank it. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, um, Madam Deputy President. Um, look, I'm fed up with, best, with being mischaracterised by Labor in relation to these matters. What we are seeing right now is a grubby campaign to denigrate the Prime Minister. We have an inherent right in the Liberal and National parties to cross the floor. You didn't happen to mention through you, Deputy President, senators have not men mentioned Senator Fevranti Wells or Senator McMahon, who crossed the floor. Don't they matter? So what we are seeing here is a continuing grubby attempt by the Labor Party to denigrate the campaign and to rewrite history. Because the fact of the matter is that our government has done more for Australian women than any other government before. And when I talk about what we are doing for Australian women, I talk about the in excess of $1 billion that we are providing for women's safety, matters such as emergency accommodation. Did, did members officers, did the former Labor federal government ever make a provision for women fleeing family violence? Did the former Labor government ever think that it might be a good idea to provide support in emergency situations when women are fleeing family violence through finance for emergency accommodation? We have provided an absolute record amount of funding to care for women and children in their hour of need. More flexible parental leave, accessible, affordable childcare, not childcare for millionaires, which is Labor's policy. That's what Labor's policy is. More money going to millionaires than ever before. Our government is providing childcare to those who need it the most, those who are in the lower and medium income brackets. And it is actually a disgrace, Labor's childcare policy. And look at our record on closing the gender pay gap. Uh, it is, was at a record low under us of 13.4 per cent, now sits at 14.2 per cent, down from 17.4 per cent under the previous Labor government. So when we talk about caring for women, this is one of the most caring workplaces I have ever worked in. I can tell you right now, and I've put that on the record before, but I will call out bad behaviour, and I have, as I did with a member for Higgins on Insiders earlier this year in relation to Dr Lamming. But where were Labor women when Emma Hussar was treated so disgracefully, when Labor had made a decision to get rid of her? Where were Labor women? She was subjected to the most horrific abuse, false allegations. It drove her almost to a nervous breakdown, to breaking point. Where were Labor women in standing up for Emma Hussar? Where were they in standing up for Gray, uh, Gay Brodman, the former member for, for Canberra? There is so much hypocrisy because when it comes to bad behaviour, from Labor, I have not seen Labor women stand up and hold those to account who treat Labor women so badly. And as for our Respect at Work report, let me put on the record that nearly all of the recommendations have been implemented by our government. There are some, of course, that can only be implemented by the states and territories, so I correct the record in that respect. We are really proud of the work that we are doing, and I say to the member for Bass, who has got courage, but what a wonderful party we are in where we celebrate the fact that we can exercise our conscience. And guess what happens to Labor senators and members if they cross the floor, if they exercise their conscience? They are expelled. They are the rules of Labor. There is no ability to stand up for what's right or exercise one's own conscience in the Labor Party. You cross the floor 
and you are gone. So let's stop the hypocrisy that we are hearing from Labor in this debate. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Senator Grogan. Thank you. Well, let's just be really clear. This issue is not about crossing the floor. It is about respect for women, about equal treatment for women, not just care, but respect. We can debate the policy in this place about various positions on either side of the chamber, but the core disrespect for women shown by the Prime Minister is the issue that we are discussing right now. This issue is about the appalling double standards applied by this Prime Minister when it comes to the way he treats the men of his government and the way he treats the women of his government. Tasmanian Liberal Bridget Archer, the member for Braddon, was singled out, not for having the audacity to stand with the opposition and the crossbenchers and the Australian people in calling for a National Integrity Commission, but for being a woman. Thank you. She was marched over to the PM's office against her wishes. The response to other members of the government, wayward South Australian Senator Alex Antic, crossed the floor to vote to undermine public health messages. Was he marched immediately over to the PM's office? No. Apparently, according to the PM, Senator Antic was just expressing his right to be an individual. It's the same with the two Queensland renegades, Senator Gerard Rennick and the member for Dawson, George Christensen, who both crossed the floor to vote with One Nation to undermine the hard work of health officials. Were they immediately marched directly to the PM's office? No. No, they were not. By our own admission, Bridget Archer had asked on numerous occasions to have the conversation postponed. Not cancelled, postponed until she was able to gather her thoughts. She knew she had to talk to him, but she clearly needed some time to collect herself. And this simple request was denied. Her wishes were ignored. Now, former Liberal MP Julia Banks has previously called out this exact type of behaviour, calling it menacing, bullying and calculating. And Grace Tame has labelled this treatment as textbook coercive control. So now we add Bridget Archer to the list of recent displays of blatant disrespect. Grace Tame, Brittany Higgins, Julia Banks, Christine Holgate, Sam Maiden, the women of the March for Justice. What we are seeing over and over again is, regardless of the situation, the PM has consistently refused to respect women's views, refused to respect women's voices and refused to respect women's request. This pattern of behaviour, this culture within our current government is appalling. And that is what we stand up against here today. That behaviour, disrespecting women, disrespecting the women across Australia. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Grogan. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McAllister to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the response given by Senator Payne to my questions on the TRIPS waiver and vaccine equity. History will look poorly on Australia and other wealthy countries for their complete and utter failure to support low-income countries in getting vaccinated. This is a complete abrogation of our responsibility to other countries, many of whom already suffer because of the colonial legacies that have left them in poverty. The global COVID crisis continues to evolve, but Australia is missing in action when it comes to strong support for global vaccine equity. Vaccine apartheid looms large amongst the landscape of global inequities. What we are seeing on an international level is rich, high-income nations making strides towards vaccinations while poorer nations are left behind. Omicron should put further pressure on wealthy countries like Australia to step up, fund and facilitate vaccination across the world. 
This is the time to show global sol solidarity, but we are not quite there. It has been over a year since India and South Africa first brought a proposal to the World Trade Organization to waive intellectual property provisions on COVID-19 vaccines and allow for mass vaccine production across the global south. This was a simple and incredibly reasonable request. And if it were agreed to at the time, would have already allowed for the delivery of millions of vaccines to people in countries that have really struggled to gain access to jabs in the quantities needed to keep their populations safe. Dozens of low-income countries were quick to join on and support the proposal from India and South Africa. The United States eventually followed. Then finally, in September of this year, Australia announced that it would support a waiver. But Australia has since clarified its position, with DFAT telling estimates last month that the government has decided that rather than attaching itself to a specific proposal, it's going to focus its efforts on encouraging the key players to find convergence and to encourage both sides to show flexibility with a view to ensuring that we have a consensus outcome. Well, that's not good enough. In fact, it's pretty shameful. This sort of hedging is simply terrible. It's the coward's way out. And now countries across the world are paying the price. The emergence of the Omicron variant has put further pressure on Australia to co-sponsor the intellectual property waiver. At its upcoming ministerial meetings, the World Trade Organization will consider the intellectual property waiver first proposed by India and South Africa more than one year ago. Australia is at the table and we should declare our hand unambiguously in support of the waiver proposal from India and South Africa. In fact, we should go further and do everything we can to galvanize support for this waiver. The depressing reality is that by refusing to co-sponsor the waiver, Australia has taken the side of big pharmaceutical companies over the health and well-being of millions of people. It's time for Australia to give its full-throated support to the waiver proposed by India and South Africa. In addition, Australia should substantially boost funding to the COVAX vaccine facility to ramp up vaccination in low-income countries. Our per capita contributions at this point have been miserly. Australia's donor funding to the global COVAX facility is low by global standards. Australia is contributing only about $4 per person compared to nearly triple that by the United States and many times less than countries mm. such as Sweden and Norway. Last month, WHO reported that just five African countries, less than 10% of Africa's 54 nations are projected to hit their 2021 target of fully vaccinating 40% of their populations unless efforts to accelerate the pace take off. The question we have to ask is how many more people have to unnecessarily get sick or die from COVID in the global south before Australia backs the TRIPS waiver and properly funds COVAX so that global vaccine equity can become a reality. Thank you, Senator Fruki. So the question is that the um, motion is moved by Senator Fruki to take note be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. So we now move to the um, notices of motion. So are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? There being none, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Smith, were you seeking the call? Seeking the call to move a motion in regards to leave of absence. Uh, is leave given? Uh, I believe leave is given. Thank you, Senator Smith. Well, I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Thank you for the granting of leave. I move that the leave of absence be granted to the following senators from the 29th of November to the 2nd of December 2021, Senator Macdonald for personal reasons and Senators Hanson and Roberts on account of COVID-19 travel restrictions. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Smith be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator McCarthy. Um, Madam Deputy President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator um, McCarthy. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Brown for 25th of November to 2nd of December for personal reasons. So the question is, the motion is moved by Thank Senator you. McCarthy. Do you agree? Do those of that opinion say aye? Against, I believe the ayes have it. 
Um, do we have any postponements or extensions of time? I'll call the clerk. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. General Business Notice of Motion 1261, standing in the name of Senator Rennick from today until the second sitting date in 2020. And committees have lodged extension notifications as shown at item 13 on today's order of business. Thank you. I shall now uh, remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senators. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Um, and we'll go to government business number one, standing in the name of Senator Birmingham. Dealt with you. One and two are done. I thought so. Okay, so that gives us three. Thank you, uh, Senator Dunning. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I ask that government business notice of motion number three, proposing the approval of works within the parliamentary zone, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Dunyam. I move the motion. So the question is, the motion is moved by the minister to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Now we'll just go to um, general business notice of motion one, number 1278, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson. Is that you, Senator Waters? Me. Thank you. Uh, 1278, yes. Jeffers. Yeah. On behalf of Senator Wish Wilson, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 1278, proposing the introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Waters. Thank you, Deputy President. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Act 2006 and for related purposes. So the question is, the motion is moved by the minister to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Uh, Senator Waters. Thank you, Deputy President. I present the bill and I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thank you. I move that the bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Right, and we'll just pop the clerk in there before that. <laughs> Thank you. I'll call the clerk. A uh, bill for an act to amend the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Act 2006 and for related purposes. And can, uh, is the Chamber comfortable that we'll take it that that's been moved and we're incorporating the explanatory memorandum? Yes, or do you want Senator Waters to do it again? No? So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thank you, Deputy President. I table the explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard and to continue my remarks on behalf of Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, we'll now move to um, general business uh, 1280, standing in the name of Senator Rice. Is that you, Senator Waters? I guess it is. <laughs> Senator Waters. Thank you, Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1280, standing in the name of Senator Rice, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Waters. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe no. the noes have it. The noes have it. Division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
David and Jim, just for this one, please. Yes, please. Stop the bell. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1280, standing in the name of Senator Rice, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator McGrath as teller for the noes. There being 23 ayes and 17 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I just advise senators there may be future divisions, further divisions. I now move to general business notice of motion number 1284, standing in the name of Senator Patrick and others. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. Uh, before um, asking this motion to be taken as formal, I'd like to add Senator Lambie's name to this motion, thank please. You. And then I ask that gen general business a notice of motion number 1284, standing the names of Senator Patrick McAllister, uh, Waters, Griff and Lambie, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objections to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Patrick. I move the motion. Minister. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. 
Minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The government does not support the motion. We're delivering on our commitment to establish a Commonwealth Integrity Commission, and the government has conducted a nationwide consultation process on draft legislation for the CIC. This is significant legislation that we must get right so that Australians can have confidence that the Commission will operate effectively. The CIC will be essential to ensuring the integrity of our public sector, our government and our elected officials. It's essential, it's essential rather, for the functioning of Australia's government that we are methodical, consultative and thorough in our approach to developing this legislation. Thank you, Minister. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Patrick in the name of Senator Patrick and others be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. <laughs>
stop the bell. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1284, standing in the name of Senator Patrick and others, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator McGrath as teller for the noes. There being 23 ayes and 23 noes, the matter is negated. Uh, the matter is negated. Being 23 ayes and 23 noes, the matter is negated. Uh, we'll now move to sorry. General business notice of motion number 1285, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young. Senator Thank Hanson you, Young. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1285 taken, uh, be taken as formal. Uh, is that agreed to? The matter be taken as formal. There being no objection, I call Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. I move the motion. Minister. I take leave to make a short statement. Is leave is given for one minute, one minute Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. The report of the second independent review of the Water for the Environment special account is due by late 2021 and will be tabled on completion and made publicly available. Work is well underway to finalise it. So the question is that general business notice of motion one, number 1285, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. We now move to general business notice. We'll start again. We'll now move to general business notice of motion number one two seven nine, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson. Senator McKim. Oh, okay. Well, that would explain it then. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. On behalf of Senator Wish Wilson, I seek leave to amend General Business Notice of Motion 1279 before asking that it be taken as formal. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted, Senator McKim. Thank you. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and ask that it be taken as formal. So the question is that General Business Notice of Motion number 1279 as amended. Uh, be agreed to. Those of that are oh, beg your pardon, be taken as formal. My bad. Uh, no objection to that. Being no objection, I call Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I move the motion. As a Minister. Seek leave to make a short statement. Our uh, leave is granted for one minute, Minister. Thank you. The government has already committed to publishing the report before the end of the year and will be doing so. 
Thank you. So the question is that general business notice of, emotion, notice of motion number 1279 as amended, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. So we'll now move to uh, business of the Senate number one, standing in the name of Senators Patrick and Waters. Just a moment, Senator Patrick. I don't believe your microphone's on. Just start again. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number one be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Patrick. I move the motion. Minister. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Yes, leave is granted for one minute, Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. The, gov uh, the government does not support this motion. However, it should be noted that pairs exist solely as a matter of convention and, as noted in Odge's Australian Senate practice, are entirely an informal arrangement between the parties and not part of the procedures of the Senate. Thank you, Minister. So the question is that general business notice, business of the Senate number one, standing in the name of Senators Patrick and Waters, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. We are now move to the condolence motion. The Senate will now proceed to the consideration of a condolence motion relating to the late Senator Alex Gallagher. I call the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate. Thank you, Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of the late Sir Senator Alex Gallagher. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Wong. I thank the Senate. I move that the Senate expresses its sadness at the death on 29 August 2021 of Senator Alexander McEachin Gallagher, Senator for South Australia, and places on record its gratitude for his service to the parliament and the nation and tenders its deep sympathy to his family in their bereavement. And I can, can I also acknowledge the courtesy extended by the government in having the opposition move this motion and for the adjournment after the conclusion of the condolence. Deputy President, I express the opposition's condolences and our grief following the passing of our colleague and friend, Senator Alex Gallagher. And my thoughts are with Paola and all of Alex's family, his staff and his comrades at the Transport Workers Union. As Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, I have spoken on the passing of a number of former senators and ministers over the last few years from all sides of politics. But it is an acutely sad duty to eulogise a colleague who just a few short months ago sat here amongst us in this chamber. And I know many of my colleagues here miss him dearly. We knew Alex had cancer. He once told us that in response to someone asking him how he was. He replied, how do you think I am? I'm dying of cancer. Yet despite his frankness, it is still hard to confront the reality that he is gone that his determination in the face of adversity was not enough to defeat the disease that ended his life on the 29th of August. And the fact that we knew of his fragile health did not make the news of his passing any easier. Despite his illness, Alex was determined to remain a senator. And even after his diagnosis was announced in January 2020, he continued to work as much as he was able to. Alex joined us and participated in the sittings of the Senate in Canberra as recently of June, as June of this year. And the determination he demonstrated in doing so was a hallmark of the way he conducted himself throughout his life. Alex Gallagher never forgot the workers he was elected to represent. In his first speech, he said, I will strive to be true to the Labor values of a fair go and a better chance for all. It is my belief that the Labor Party is the only party that provides all Australians a greater share of the prosperity of this great nation. And at every opportunity, he brought the Senate's attention to those people who are at the heart of what it means to represent the Australian Labor Party, especially in the transport industry. And Australian workers across this country are better off for his advocacy and his commitment. Born on New Year's Day in 1954, Senator Alex Gallagher's early life was peripatetic. As a child, he went from Scotland to England, back to Scotland, then Wales, and again to England. The youngest of five, his mother died when he was two. 
He was cared for by his grandmother before his father remarried, and these were not easy years. His stepmother and her two children later left his father, and Alex felt the impact of poverty, insecure work and inadequate housing. And he channelled those experiences into a life of fighting for those who needed an advocate, those who did not have the capacity to speak up for themselves. In 1966, at the age of 12, he made the long journey to Darwin and he called the Northern Territory home for the best part of the next 30 years before his final migration south to Adelaide in 2011. And it was in Darwin that Alex began another journey, from transport worker to union official and one that would eventually take him to the Senate. It was there that his two children, Caroline and Ian, were born. In time they were joined by Terry and Frank and he married Paola in 2011. Family was always very important to Alex and he to them. Later in life he was delighted as his family grew with the addition of grandchildren and he delighted in their company when they joined him on the golf course. It was very moving at the wake after the funeral to see his grandchildren speaking of him. Alex Gallagher worked in the transport and aviation industries before coming an official of the Transport Workers Union and serving as Secretary of the South Australian and Northern Territory branch as well as Vice President and President of the National Branch of that union. And he brought to the union the direct experience of being a truck driver and an aviation ramp operator. His influence and impact runs deep in the union and is illustrated by the tributes paid to his efforts over decades. He was described as straight-talking, no-nonsense and hard-working, a reliable advocate for workers in the transport industry who wanted the best for working people. He wanted to lift standards in the transport industry, understanding as he did that safety in the workplace and the recognition of dangers inherent in many, jobs, many of the jobs in that sector was critical to improving the lives and prospects of those workers. Whilst he was always happy to be clear about which side of the debate he was on, Alex was also a strategic thinker and he was someone who could build relationships and see the other, other's perspective too, even if it was one with which he disagreed. He helped to build the union, ensuring it was strong and on a secure financial base. A vital legacy through a time of considerable industrial change in the 1990s and 2000s. It is a fitting tribute that his name will live on through the Alex Gallagher Training Centre at the Union's offices in Adelaide. And it is a good thing that the facility was named before he passed, so he could appreciate being recognised in this way by his comrades. After some initial, reservation, ref, initial reservations, which probably reflected uh, his humility, it was a source of immense pride to him. After more than two decades of service to the Union, Alex was elected to represent our state of South Australia in the Senate in 2010, taking a seat on the 1st of July 2011, subsequently re-elected in 2016 and 2019. And whilst he may have left employment with the Union, he used this platform to amplify the issues on which he had been cam campaigning on throughout his life in the Labor movement. He campaigned on superannuation and road safety in particular. Alex was the founder of the Parliamentary Friends of Road Safety and he served also as the Deputy Chair of the Joint Select Committee on Road Safety. In this work, he and his colleague Glenn Still put the safety of the people he represented for so many decades at the forefront of their political campaigning. And there is no doubt that this work saved lives. He served on a number of other committees, including as chair of the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade and Economic References Committees. And in these roles, he demonstrated forensic skills that ensured ministers and bureaucrats couldn't slip anything past him. And always, Senator Alice Gallagher stood up for those who needed someone to be their voice in this place, from those affected by road trauma to people with disability to veterans. He stood up for his state he stood up for South Australian workers, including in the manufacturing and defence industries. Alex was also not afraid to, afraid to take policy stances, such as those in support of the nuclear industry and oil and gas exploration in the Great Australian Bight, that were at odds with others in his own party. In fact, Alex and I were often on different sides on an issue. 
But he was forthright, and he was also honest and upfront, and he was as, as tough in negotiating a policy issue as he was in his battle with cancer, and in both he was equally dignified. I remember a few personal conversations with Alex towards the end, and I remember the cracks of vulnerability appearing in his normally stoic presentation, and the rarity of them made them all the more moving. I hope he knew then that the contribution he would leave is lasting, and just as lasting is the affection of those who cared for him. Indeed, one of the most enduring friendships I've witnessed in my time here is that which Alex Sayre shared with Senator Glenn Stirl. It's a friendship between two mates that lasted a quarter of a century, from their days as union officials together. And it's a measure of the strength of this relationship that Senator Stirl was invited by the family to deliver a eulogy at Alex's funeral and was entrusted with the responsibility of speaking about Alex's early life as well as his union and parliamentary career. Alex and Glenn lived with each other here in Canberra for nearly a decade, where they enjoyed Fiona's Sunday night dinners, as Senator Stirl says, as family. They travelled together often for parliamentary work, both within Australia and on occasion overseas. In his tribute, Senator Stirl spoke of his friend who had a rough exterior, but was generous, welcoming, and had one of the sharpest minds in the parliament, a champion of common sense and fairness. So, Stirley, our thoughts continue to be with you and Fiona at this time. One thing amongst many that Alex and Glenn share is they never forgot where they came from. Alex channeled the values forged in a difficult upbringing into his relentless support for the underdog, where betide any boss he found undermining the rights of his workers. But beneath that formidable exterior beat a loyal heart. And while this guided his work, it also radiated in his life, in his friendships in this, this place, his comradeship with those in the labour movement, and most especially his love for his family. He brought <clears throat> a positive attitude even as he dealt with the challenge of cancer, maintaining his determination all the way. Senator Gallagher was a Labor champion and he deserves to be remembered as someone who never relented in his pursuit of a fair go for others. As Anthony Albanese said, we in Labor are very proud of Alex. So we mourn the loss of our colleague and I close by again extending my sympathies to his family, his beloved wife, Paola, his children and his grandchildren and his friends and my colleagues in their grief. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, today we pause uh, to reflect upon and remember the life of a colleague for each of us, a friend across this chamber, and a Labor man truly reflective of the great old style tradition of Labor Party advocates. Alex Gallagher, in August this year, the former Senator for South Australia tragically lost his hard-fought battle with cancer. Alex was a Senate colleague and fellow South Australian senator in this place for over 10 years. We remember Alex as a straight shooter, a man with whom you knew where you stood, what he believed and what he was here to do. He was here to advocate for and improve the lives of working people, and that is what he fought to do right to the very end. Senator, Alec Senator Gallagher delivered his first speech to this place in 2011. In his remarks, he committed to be true to the Labor values of a fair go and a better chance for all, to repay the faith put in him by the Labor voters of South Australia, by his party and his colleagues, to deliver a greater share of the prosperity of this great nation to all Australians, especially hardworking Australians. In the 10 years that followed, Alex remained loyal to his word and strived to be true to his Labor values. In his final speech to this place, Alex was still continuing exactly as he had started, advocating for the workers of this country to get a better share, as he saw it, of the national income. While we take this opportunity now to reflect on his life and the significant contributions he made to this nation, we lament the loss of a good man and a strong voice for Australian workers. 
Upon election to the Senate, Alex immediately got to work on championing three key policy interests the transport industry, road safety, and superannuation. The root for his passion for these causes came from his journey that led him all the way to serve in this our nation's parliament. The son of Scottish migrants, Alex Gallagher was born in the coal mining village of New Comic, Scotland in 1954. Whilst he may have been born a Scot and remained proud of his heritage, Alex made Australia home and, in every aspect, the key part and home for his life. As Senator Wong has said, at age 12, he made the move across Australia. Like so many migrants, his family sought a better chance for him and his family, and in their case they moved to the Northern Territory. It was here that Alex would undertake his schooling at Darwin High School. In 1971, he started work as a labourer and truck driver before commencing work as an airline ramp services operator from 1976 through to 1988. Alex, through his roll the sleeves up work, was truly proud of his old school labour mould, having been a traditional blue collar working class man. His background proudly added to the diversity of this place. It was in 1988 that he made what would be a defining step in his journey, ultimately leading to the Senate by joining the Northern Territory branch of the Australian Labor Party, and then, later in 1994, the South Australian branch. For 22 years, he worked in several roles for the Transport Workers Union in the Northern Territory and South Australia, taking on an initial role as Industrial Relations Officer. He would later move into various leadership roles within the TWU, culminating in his rise to President from 2007 until 2010 when he was first elected to the Senate. Alex also served as a commissioner for the National Road Transport Commission and as a director of the South Australian Motor Accident Commission. He took his love for the transport sector and brought it into this place, particularly his staunch advocacy for road safety and his pointed interest in the rights of workers in the aviation industry. As a fellow South Australian, I also fondly remember Alex for his genuine interest in rural and remote South Australia. He undertook important work with great passion and care on the Senate Standing Committee on Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport. As the member for Grey put it in the other place, wheels on the road is what keeps our remote communities going, and few understood that better than Alex Gallagher. He dedicated a significant amount of work to parliamentary committees, serving on 23 different committees during his time in the Australian Parliament. Despite his cancer diagnosis, in December 2019, Alex continued to represent the people of South Australia, the Labor Party, the trade, movement, trade union movement and his constituents with diligence and passion. Notwithstanding his battle with cancer, Alex focused his parliamentary service on those he served, not himself, earning great admiration and respect right across the political divide. He was, as Senator Wong has acknowledged at heart, a true family man a quality I and I'm sure all admired in him. It was his family from whom he sought advice and stability. More than that, Alex credited his wife Paola with ensuring the important things in life, family, children and grandchildren, were always front and centre. Paola was, as Alex endearingly described her, his tower of strength. In his own words, she made him a better person by holding up the values of humility, and respect for others that Alex rightly considered necessary for making an effective contribution to this place. To conclude some of my remarks on Alex's service, I want to borrow the same Theodore Roosevelt quotation that Alex concluded in his first address to this place. Far and away, the best prize life has to offer is the chance to work hard at work worth doing. Alex carried the spirit of this quotation throughout his life. He embodied it in his work ethic, especially his work in this place and his commitment and dedication to those he sought to serve. For that, we thank him for his service and acknowledge the significant contribution that he made 
and differences that he made. To those who believe that politics is a friendless profession, Alex proved the opposite. No doubt his SA party comrade, Don Farrell, and perhaps more so, more particularly in a special way, as Senator Wong has acknowledged, his fellow former TWU leader, Glenn Stirl, were always obviously great mates. Alex and Stirlow moved almost as one, it seemed at times, backing each other in to pack an even bigger punch in the views that they expressed and the issues they fought for. To Stirlow, those on this side of the chamber acknowledge the particular loss uh, that you feel of your great mate. But Alex made friends and earned respect across unions, across factions and across parties because of his roll the sleeves up and get the job done type of attitude. To Paola and to Alex's four children, Caroline, Ian, Terry and Frank, to his grandchildren, all of whom meant so much to him, I extend our sincerest condolences on behalf of the Australian government and no doubt on behalf of all senators. I thank the Senate. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, President. And I rise to associate the Australian Greens with the remarks that have been made by Senator Wong and Senator Birmingham. Um, former Senator Alex Gallagher came into the Senate at the same time as I did. Um, and I regret that in that time I did not get to know him better. But what did always strike me about Alex was that whilst he was a man of few words, he was a man of strong convictions, of determination and of quiet passion. In his first speech he said that all Australians want a better environment and a greater opportunity for those who come after them. And he worked towards that goal during his time in this place. He did that uh, in his work tirelessly on many committees of which voice has already been given. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, he was an employee of transport companies, both as a truck driver and a ramp operator for Trans Australia Airlines. And he, of course, joined the TWU and climbed through their ranks in the 1990s and uh, 2000s and became TWU secretary in 2007 until his appointment in the Senate in 2011. His passion for workers' rights and for workers' safety was clear and he continued to advocate for reforms that would tilt the balance away from freight owners and back towards workers. He wanted be better regulation for workers' safety. <coughs> With all the challenges that COVID has imposed on logistics and transport, his advocacy in this crucial time will be sorely missed. Along with the difficulties that COVID has presented, remote parliament has provided some welcome flexibility. It allowed Senator, Senator Gallagher to participate during his treatment and stay connected to the work that he so dearly loved. Remote Parliament also offered an insight into people's interests and passions through what they display in their office, and Senator Gallagher became internet famous when he participated from his home office in his garage. It was an insight into a full life, a home office busting at the seams with equipment, art pieces, photographs and cars. It showed a love of art, sport, travel and family. While his life was cut short, it was clear that it was a rich life, well lived. I'd like to pay my particular condolences to Senator Stirl for the loss of his dear friend, and we send our heartfelt condolences to all of his family, his friends, his staff, uh, and his Labor colleagues, and everyone in this chamber that knew him. Thank you. Senator McKenzie. Uh, you, On behalf of the National Party, I'd like to associate us um, with the comments around the chamber. Um, like Senator Waters, I started uh, with uh, Senate, former Senator Gallagher here um, back in 2011 and uh, served with him on the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Committee, of which he was a long-standing and strong contributor, along with the, obviously the deputy chair, as we colloquially like to call him, Sterlo. Um, but his presence here was very, very influential. He knew what he stood for and that was the old uh, school labour mould. He was determined to make a difference for the working class men and women here uh, in Australia. His grit and determination to make a positive change for transport workers and truck drivers across the nation was limitless. He fought for the rights of hard-working Australians 
um, after 22 years of advocating across different unions, his desire to make a difference ended um, him up here in the Senate. He pushed for improvement in road safety to protect the truck drivers that connected Australians right across this nation, and his experience in the industry allowed him to push for the voice of those who are often silenced. The life of a truck driver can be tough, long hours, isolated and separated from loved ones. It's a job that not many of us can truly understand, but Alex did, and he spoke to what mattered to them most. And he never lost that determination to improve their lives. Uh, he was deputy chair of the Joint Select Committee on Road Safety and also an outspoken member of the Public Works Committee, which saw him overseas a lot of infrastructure projects uh, that also uh, contributed to positive outcomes for um, those in the trucking industry. His passion and endorsement for a fair go and a better chance for all went beyond truck drivers. He fought for what he believed was the best interests of all South Australians, um, and so we often clashed on water. He was driven by the vision of all Australians of having access to fair and secure jobs, and this included um, equitable pay and working conditions. He did stand against the crowd, and I think Senator Wong mentioned that it didn't matter which crowd you were in. If you are in the Liberal Party, the <laughs> National Party, definitely wasn't a fan of the Greens. Uh, and sometimes not a great fan of uh, some of the Labor Party policies. But that is a man of conviction and integrity, and uh, rare, too often too rare um, in this line of work these days. He also understood the importance of connecting Australians to the regions. In his first speech, uh, he said, and uh, this quote has already been used today, but I, he firmly believes that all Australians want a better environment and a greater opportunity for those who come after them, and I'll endeavour to fulfil that obligation in my role here in the Senate. And I absolutely believe Alex did that. He'll always be admired by all as a hard-working straight shooter who had the best interests of all at heart. Um, my former colleague, uh, Senator John Wacker Williams, recalls him as a good bloke with a kind nature, always up for a laugh, particularly when he teamed up with his good friend. Glenn Stirl and caused a bit of havoc on some of those um, road trips that the RAC committee was wont to do. And just briefly um, on his relationship with Senator Stirl, it didn't matter whether sharing a wine or a walk, those two were absolutely inseparable, like the two um, on some of those late night debates in this chamber that we used to have um, when we made ourselves stay here till the wee hours. They'd be like those two old guys on the Muppets commentating particularly on Nick Xenophon at times. Um, Wacker also remembers his time working with Senator Gallagher and praised his dedication for improving safety within the trucking industry. A husband, brother, father, grandfather and advocate, Alex was respected and loved and admired by all those that knew him. We thank him for his 10 years uh, as service in this place and our sympathies are with his family and friends. Now we'll go to Senator Stirl remotely. Senator Stirl, you have the call. Well, President Brockman, thank you very much and congratulations on your ascension to the highest office in the land on our side of the chamber and I congratulate you. And I want to thank all the previous speakers, my Senate colleagues, for your kind words and never truer words spoken. And it is Senator Mackenzie, often we were referred to as Stadler and Waldorf, the Senate, to which we thought that was quite funny because even we thought we looked like Stadler and Waldorf. But I want to take the opportunity to thank over 80 individuals who contacted me on that terrible day on August the 29th when we lost Alex and the subsequent day after when the news broke who sent their best wishes to me and I thank you very much for that. Alex and I, as you know, go back many, many years. We first met in the early 90s. Alex was a rash, older official of the South Australian Northern Territory branch of the transport workers. I was the younger brash official of the West Australian branch of the Transport Workers Union and we were summoned to, I think it was a, an ACTU get together love in in Wagga Wagga. And I still don't remember to this day what it was actually about, it was that long ago. But on the way over, the West Australians had had a difference of opinion in the car on the way up and we thought we might have disgraced our branch if the news broke out to the disagreement. It was the old black eye and someone had a scratch on their cheek. And anyway, the rest is history. It was the 90s and it was the Transport Workers Union. But all was forgiven when we got to Wagga Wagga on the Friday night prior to the start of the conference, because we'd found out that some brash young South Australian Northern Territory organiser 
had knocked out the secretary of the branch and taken over the reins. So Alex, I always thanked him for that. He took the pressure off us and that was the sort of bloke that Alex was. He was a no-nonsense, no-muck-around, straight-to-the-point guy. I don't condone that behaviour nowadays, but it was nearly 30 years ago. Thankfully, things have changed. As you all know and you have heard, Alex lived with Fiona and I in Canberra for the last 10 years. And I'm always, to this day, and to this day I'm going to miss Alex's nightly lectures from what I should be doing because my health choices and my dietary choices were wrong. Even though after a few he'd be exactly the same as me, after a few quiet wines or a few quiet beers. And as Senator Wong had said, Sunday night was family night when we had some normality in our life. When Fiona and I would come across from Perth and we would go up the stairs to our unit, sure enough, as you know, Senator Wong, the South Australian flight gets in before the Perth flight. The light was on and I'd say to Fiona, oh well, Mr Happy's here, beauty, bottom dollar, open the door, middle of winter and he'll have all the windows open, sure enough. But we'd had so many good nights, so many good times. Alex and I shared many, many uh, common interests, apart from our love of the Transport Workers' Union, apart from our commitment to the Australian Labor Party but, and their values. But also Alex, like myself, has the strongest love of family. And to Alex, family was everything. Alex always spoke lovingly and endearing of Paola, who he used to refer to as the boss. And we knew who we met. But also, as much as Paolo had the same amount of energy and love was always centred around Caroline and Ian, and of course his extended family of Frank and Terry, and never ever did Alex miss an opportunity to talk about uh, Lockie and Connor up in Darwin and Mia down in Adelaide. And also Alex's other loves that him and I both shared together, because we were inseparable, was our love of golf, our love of a quiet beer or a cider or a wine together, and with anyone else who cared to join us, but also to have the odd 50 cents each way on the odd nag every Saturday at every opportunity. So Alex and I would sometimes combine that passion and we'd stay over in Canberra. Alex always kept his car over here. And after our sittings, Alex and I would pack up and bolt off to play golf. And many, many, many times, or every time we played Everything had to be Alex wanted a dollar on it or a hundred dollars on it. Or if I was lucky enough, I'd get away with 10 each way. And we'd bet on golf, we'd bet on anything. So one day I had the opportunity, Alex and I were having a weekend game of golf. And it sits proudly in my games room on my bar in Perth, at my home. There is a golf scorecard and there's a $10 note and there is a golf ball. And Alex wanted 100 on the front nine, 100 on the back nine, and 100 overall. And I said, Alex, knock it off. I said, I'll go you 10 on the front, 10 on the back, and 10 overall. Cut long story short, the only way I could win on the last hole was a par three. Was Alex had to wipe the hole we were playing Stapleford, and I had to get a hole in one. I'm happy to say, I got the hole in one and he wiped. And he never, ever forgave me. He wanted that $10 back. So Alex, I thank you for that, mate. But I also want to talk about Alex Gallagher, my mate. And Alex was an absolute, as we've heard before, and heard previously and we'll continue to hear, champion of the underdog, champion of working men and women, champion of those who didn't have a voice. Alex never saw black or white or, or left or right. Alex was there. If you needed a mate and you needed someone solid, and he was on your side. You knew you couldn't wish for a better mate in your corner. Nor not at your back, but at your shoulder. Many, many times Alex and I had locked in on conversations and positions that we may have argued them, we may have had disagreements, but with Alex, and this goes for everyone, you had the opportunity to work your way through it, put your case to him, and if your case proved to be the one that he could accept, he would back you in all the way. Nothing changed with Alex. It came to the point where in late 2019, and it's a well-known fact that I like to shoot off to Bali and play golf with my mates around the Christmas break. And I was planning a usual January trip to Bali and I, Alex had come across the year before with Paola and the family and he joined me for a couple of games of golf with my mates. And I'd said to Alex in nine, late 19, come and join us, mate, come and in Bali. At the time, Alex and Paola were building their beautiful new home 
And he said, oh, look, I've got to stay home. I've got to, you know, get the house built. And I said, oh, all right, mate, no worries. And unbeknownst to me, Fiona and the kids had surprised me with a special 60th birthday present when they were coming to Bali. And that's so that shock horror, it was fantastic. They came over and they stayed for five days. We had a great time, then they left. And my mates were coming, so we could spend 10, plays, 10, 10 days playing golf. Fiona and I and my son Daniel were sitting in a beachside bar in this beautiful sunny day in Bali one, one day in the first week, and the phone rang, and it was Alex. And I missed him. So I rang him straight back and, and missed him. This was uh, probably the first week of January. And um, I said to Fiona, oh, that's Alex. I'll give him a call back. And I missed him, and I, 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 I left a quick message saying, that buzzed me back. And I sort of thought, oh, you beauty, Alex has changed his mind. He's going to come up and play some golf with us. And then Alex rang me straight back. This all happened in about three or four minutes. And I'd said to him, hey, Alex, Barley, Bagus, get your backside up here, mate. And to which he said to me, Glenn, I've got cancer. Well, my world dropped. My heart dropped. Fiona and I were just absolutely stunned. And I said to him, mate, how, how is it? And Alex being Alex, oh, yeah, you know, just... Um, Oh, it's up to the doctors now. And I said, Alex, how is it, mate? He said, ah, she, no, she'll be right. And I stewed overnight and I didn't sleep. I hardly slept. I said to the the next day, I said, I've got to ring Alex back. I haven't got the answers. I've got to ring him back. I rang him back and said, Alex. He said, I'm at Bunnings. I said, oh, that's great. I said, but how is it? He said, it's not good. And to that day, I think now, every opportunity you get to spend time with loved ones or friends, grab it. Grab it with two hands because you don't realise how quick it can go. And I looked up to Alex. I looked up to him, even when he was lecturing me, even when he was telling me, I needed to go tell Albo, or I needed to go tell Penny that this is not right, and I needed to back him. You, you got to love the man. And by God, I miss him. I absolutely do miss him. We've been through thick and thin together. And as you say, his passion for the road safety, for road safety in this nation, his passion for industry superannuation, it is unquestionable. Nobody could hold a candle to Alex when you were arguing about or discussing road safety or superannuation or workers' rights. And you could try. Good luck. And I suppose that's why our friendship lasted so long, mainly because we agreed on everything. And I always think back to that brash young South Australian organiser and the brash young West Australian one and probably thought I didn't fancy a bop on the nose either if it got that bad. Not that he ever would. He was a great mate. But I want to share a couple of stories and a couple of quick ones, and I won't take all that long. And I do apologise to my colleagues on the Labor side, because Alex and I were the ones with the long, with former Senator Gavin Marshall. After Hoggy left the place, we had to do the barbecues, and uh, we used to, you know, put the apron on and our shorts and thongs, and off we go and barbie. And the libs could laugh as much as they like, because they were doing the same on the other side in their shorts and thongs. But Fiona was always very clear to pass on the word from the whips. Do not mix up the meat with the vegetarian or the vegan stuff. To which I won't use the same language, to which Senator Gallagher said to me, what is the difference? And I said, Alex, I don't know, but you can't mix them up. Alex said to me then, if I don't eat meat twice a day, I think I'm turning vegetarian. So to my colleagues, I did my best, trust me. But even I got them mixed up after a while because I don't know what Alex had got up to. Anyway, no one's, uh, no one's suffered any uh, injury or loss, so you got away with that one. <laughs> I want to share another one that I uh, quickly, before I want to read some words from some other people. And now Senator Wong had said Alex and I had the privilege of travelling together a lot in the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Committee, alongside with you, Senator Brockman, a long-time member of our great committee, and got to share a lot of fun times and, 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 and meet a lot of good people. But uh, Alex and I had the opportunity to be in Geneva together on a couple of occasions. And Geneva had said that he wanted to buy the kids something to take them back from Geneva. And he worked out something for Lockie and he worked out something for Connor. And I said, mate, uh, I said, what are you going to get for Mia? And he said, I've got no idea. I said, look around, mate. I said, well, what are we surrounded by? He said, mountains. I said, yeah, well, apart from mountains, what are we surrounded by? Clocks. I said, well, the little girl wouldn't love a cuckoo clock. He said, right, we're going to go get a cuckoo clock. We jumped on the tram. We went and got a cuckoo clock. I tagged along just to make the pair look even more brighter. And cut a long story short, he bought this cuckoo clock, he set it up, and Mia had her own room at Alex and Fowler's place. And I used to stay in the spare room every time we were in Adelaide doing hearings. And I've got to tell you, I wish to God, I wish to heck I had never opened my big mouth 
buzz on every hour on the hour, sleeping in the spare room, and choked that wooden chook, that wooden cuckoo, because it kept going off. On that, there are many, many stories about Alex, and I'll carry them to my, to my grave. I'm going to miss you, mate. I'm really going to miss you. But I want to take the opportunity with the Senate's indulgence just to read some words that other people wrote about Alex and wanted me to pass on. And I'm going to read the first one from Matthew Marozzi. And those of us on the Labor side all know who Matthew is. And Matthew said that when I first started working for Alex, I thought my journey with him would only be a short one. It was a shock to my system. It took around six months for Alex to warm to me. And I'm thankful for that first road trip into the Air Peninsula where he got to know me personally and the reason why I'm in the Labor Party. It was an understanding of shared values and knowing he could trust me. We then formed a strong working relationship due to many long parliamentary sitting nights, travel for committees, travel in regional South Australia and our passion for fighting for working Australians. The bond became more than just professional and we became friends. I was probably one of his most trusted confidants and he was mine too. I lost my father at the age of 18 to the same cancer that took Alex and in that time Alex truly became a father figure to me. Alex and Paola were like an additional family to me, something I will cherish forever. In fact, our office became family too. We were all long-term staffers loyal to Alex, and he was loyal to us, knowing that our office of Alex, Peter, Susie, Brendan, Pauline and myself will never be together again also deeply saddens me. I will forever remember and cherish the warm moments with Alex because you received these moments. I'm sorry, because with Alex, you received these moments. You truly knew that you were in his inner circle. I'm forever grateful for the 10 years we had, and I'll forever remember those days as the good old days, which I know will never be uh, uh, replicated. He always had my best interests at heart, and it wasn't just about work, but life as well. I will be forever indebted for his constant life advice, which well and truly showed he had my best interest at heart. I miss my boss dearly, but I also miss my friend, ally, mentor and father figure. The impact he had on me will live with me for the rest of my life and I'm proud to have been his loyal staffer and friend. I will miss him. Rest in peace, Alex, and we'll meet again. And President, just in closing, one more uh, set of words I'd like to re read from a very, very dear friend of Alex and, and, and a person I consider a friend too. And his name is Peter Garsky. And Peter writes, the passing of Alex Gallagher, South Australian ALP Senator, aged 67, has left both myself and my wife, Anne, with a deep sadness. Our friendship over 27 years was built on our understanding of his many qualities. Family was always a prior, priority from which all of life's activities flowed. Alex was a lifelong achiever, but always open to new learnings. He had a great vision and could see things anew or differently to others. When he was elected to the Senate in 2010, Nothing changed in Alex. This transition of, in his life was another opportunity to support and assist those in the community with the greatest need. He had an exceptional mind for quality, uh, quickly grasping new concepts. Those who knew him well knew he was the smartest man in the room. And may I add also, Alex thought he was the smartest man in the room too, and so did we at most of the times. He had an exceptionally strong social justice ethic, but always was a pragmatic, uh, with a pragmatic outlook. He was unafraid to call out his own colleagues, and believe me, colleagues, I've been on the receiving end more than you have. Alex never looked to impress anyone. He was his own man with a strong sense of loyalty. He was a great judge of character. Highlights of his life included his contribution to family, to the road freight trucking industry, to industrial relations, to industry superannuation funds, and to the Australian Senate. He had a passion for golf. Condolences to his wife, Paola, his four adult children, his wider Scottish and Italian families, and his many friends. He will be missed. And thank you very much, Peter. And to the Senate, rest in peace, mate. Thank you, you Senator Stirl. Thank you, Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, well, many go through this place and they are remembered for a myriad of reasons. They may well have risen to high office as ministers or, or leaders of parties. They may have courted controversy or they may well have got into trouble. They may well have bestowed their views on Sky After Dark or the ABC. But that wasn't Alex. Alex made his mark and will be remembered here for two reasons. One, because he was a damn good bloke, 
Uh, and the other one is that no matter how long he was here, he never stopped fighting for the people that sent him here and the people that he believed in, uh, that is, the working, hard-working um, Australians. Um, Alex also never really played politics. Um, he made sure that everything that he did in this place was about playing the issue. Uh, and my respect for Alex and the way he went about his, play, his, his job here, I, I can only say I have the utmost respect for him and the way he conducted himself. Um, you know, like Senator Mackenzie, I have very fond memories of my first committee that, uh, that I sat on, being the Rural and Regional um, uh, Affairs Committee, uh, where Alex and, and you, Sterlo, were, were both on that committee. And we worked closely together, and I think when we worked together on that committee, you could have been excused for thinking that there was no politics and sides of politics, because everybody on that committee just wanted to get the right outcome for rural and regional Australia. And I'll acknowledge the fact that, that both uh, Senator Stirl and Senator Gallagher were people who really understand rural and regional Australia. Um, yeah, it's funny that you should have raised the, the term um, Stadler and Waldorf. I've of, often thought of the pair of you as that. A couple of cantankerous old fellows that used to sit on the other side of the chamber, giving us great cause for mirth on this side of the chamber, because you were giving your own side as much grief as you were giving us um, great pleasure in, in watching that all go down. But, um, to you, Senator Stirl, um, you know, a couple of peas in the pod, um, you and, and Alex, old school mode, uh, old school mould, and you know the fact that you really you, know, you, you loved a game of golf, you loved a punt, you loved a glass of wine. I mean, hilariously though, um, for all the, the love of, of golf that uh, that Alex had, I, I still remember it to to the the last time I saw him on the golf course. He wasn't much of a golfer, but by God, he enjoyed giving it a, a red hot go. Um, at the last election, I, I can remember Alex uh, decided that he wanted to have a bet with me, and he said to me, Rusty, which is what he called me. I don't think I was ever called Senator Anne or anything like that. I was always Rusty. Uh, he said, mate, what about a bet on who gets elected first? And I said, OK, you're on. I'll be ple you'll be pleased to say that the bottle of red wine that he gave me after he lost that bet was uh, consumed with great pleasure, a great South Australian uh, red wine. And uh, you know, he, was, uh, he was somebody who supported his own community hugely, including making sure that he consumed as much South Australian great red wine as he was possibly able to, which is um, uh, something that I'm sure that all South Australians in this chamber would aspire to. Um, I sadly was not able to make Alex's funeral um, because of the quarantine arrangements that existed at the time. I would have loved to have been able to be there because, to me, Alex wasn't a member of the Labor Party. To me, Alex was a friend. Um, I didn't see him as a political rival. I saw him as a friend. Um, and so I'm delighted today to be able to put my condolences on the record um, to Paula and, and to um, Alex's children, Carol and Ian, Terry and Frank, and all of his grandchildren. Um, I wish to extend my condolences. Um, it's a great loss for this place. Um, it is a great loss for South Australia. Um, and obviously, it is a terrible, terrible loss to Alex and his family. But please remember that Alex was one of the great people that has gone through this place. He will be remembered because he made a difference. He will be remembered because he's a good bloke. Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I rise to speak uh, on this condolence motion of uh, former South Australian uh, Senator Alec uh, Gallagher. I'd like to begin by expressing my sympathy and condolences to Alex's family. In particular, I offer um, my sympathies to Alex's wife, Paola, his daughter, Caroline, <coughs> his son, Ian, and stepsons, Terry and uh, Frank. My condolences also go to his uh, daughter-in-law, uh, Sianed, um, grandsons, Connor, Lachlan, um, Jerry, and uh, his granddaughter, uh, Mia. Uh, Alex uh, sadly passed away earlier this year after a long battle uh, with uh, lung cancer, and I know he is greatly missed by his family and friends. Uh, and he'll certainly be missed uh, in this place for all of the reasons that the previous uh, speakers have uh, mentioned. Uh, Alex was born uh, on the 1st of January 1954 in uh, in uh, Scotland. He was a uh, New Year's Day baby. Uh, Alex's family moved to Australia in 1966. And after leaving school, he worked as a labourer and a truck driver. He ended up getting a job as uh, ramp service operators with uh, TAA, <coughs> as it was known then. And uh, Alex uh, joined the Transport Workers Union in 1975. 
It was the start of many years of passionate and dedicated service fighting for the rights and conditions of transport workers in Australia, which um, Senator Stirl uh, very humorously uh, uh, went through some of those uh, particular occasions uh, of his work uh, during that time. Alex held the positions of industrial officer, organiser and state secretary in the uh, <coughs> TW's uh, South Australian and Northern Territory branch. And later he served as the uh, federal vice president and, uh, and president. I joined the uh, Shop Distributive and Allied Employees Association in 1960, uh, 1976, uh, not that long ago. <coughs> uh, uh, the year after Alex joined the Transport Workers' Union. So we shared many years working uh, in and leading the two strongest unions in South Australia, and we developed strong ties and a close working relationship between our unions. Those close ties delivered better pay and conditions for retail and transport workers' union members in, uh, in South Australia. Uh, they also helped to deliver 31 years of stable, centrist, uh, Labor state governments in South Australia between 1975 and, and uh, 2018. And it was a great privilege working closely with Alex in the Labor movement in South Australia and the Labor Party uh, for many years. Uh, and I know our state will be better off for his efforts. In uh, 1988, Alex uh, joined the, uh, the Labor Party. Uh, and he joined the right faction of the Labor Party. That's right as in right and right as correct. Um, after we helped him win an election uh, for the position of state secretary, my very good friend David Feeney, a former senator in this place, uh, came over from Melbourne to run the campaign and it was one of those great, great uh, union election campaigns. Uh, he served as a delegate <coughs> at both state council and uh, ALP national conference and he won pre-selection for the Senate uh, spot uh, on Labor's uh, South Australian Senate ticket prior to the uh, 2010 federal election. He replaced uh, his very good friend, um, Annette uh, Hurley, uh, and her, um, <coughs> he was very close to her husband, uh, Bob, and uh, Bob used to do all the, um, all the technical work for the, um, all the computer work for the uh, Transport Workers Union in, uh, in South Australia. He was elected uh, to an initial term beginning on the 1st of July 2011 and re-elected in uh, 2016 and 2019 federal elections. Throughout his working life, Alex remained committed to advocating for a safer workplace with better conditions and fair pay for those working in the Australian transport industry. In his maiden speech, Alex listed transport, road safety and superannuation as his uh, three pro priority interests. And he pursued those uh, issues throughout his time in the parliament uh, which I'll talk about more later. In that first speech, Alex also raised his concerns over the impact of the carbon tax on road transport and called for uh, self-employed uh, drivers to be compensated for any negative impacts. He later warned against the AL becoming, ALP becoming a captive to the new green agenda. The need to find a balance between action on climate change and the jobs of Australian workers was something he understood from the start. Alex was tireless, hard-working contributor to the parliamentary uh, uh, work schedule. Uh, you often hear people lament the fact that question time gets all the attention while all the real work is done through the parliamentary committees. Alex contributed to much of that important work as anyone. I won't list all of his committee work because Alex really was one of the hardest workers throughout the committee system that this place has seen. Uh, we, would hear, uh, we, we would be here for a very long time if I was to list all of his service, but I'll mention a few to remind everyone just how hard he worked and the scope of his contributions. In 2015, Alex chaired the Senate Select Committee on the uh, recent allegations relating to conditions and circumstances of the Regional Processing Centre in Nauru. He also twice chaired the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee between uh, 2014 and 2019 and was chair of the Economics References Committee from June 20 to May 21. In addition, Alex served as deputy chair for several committees, including economics legislation committees. Alex uh, was very diligent in his uh, committee roles and was respected um, and even-handed uh, chair. I think it would be true to say that one of the committee roles he was most proud of was in his involvement uh, in the two joint select committees on road uh, safety. 
As I mentioned earlier, uh, Alex uh, remained committed to, del to del delivering uh, safe workplaces and better working conditions for transport workers. Union, uh, uh, transport workers. <coughs> Through his work on the Road Safety Committee, Alex continued to pursue improved road safety, not just for transport workers, but for all Australians. Alex uh, was Deputy Chair of the, se the second uh, Joint uh, Select Committee on Road Safety from June 2020 until November um, 2020. Uh, I want to highlight that uh, uh, because I think it perfectly illustrates uh, Alex's commitment to his responsibility as an elected uh, representative in the Australian Parliament. Despite the obvious challenges presented by his illness, Alex continued to contribute to our nation's parliament. He followed through on things he'd committed to, even when things got very tough. And he continued to contribute to debate via video link, even when his poor health and uh, the COVID-19 pandemic made it impossible for him to get here in person. Alex's work ethic stands as a reminder <coughs> that we're all privileged to be in this place and we have a responsibility to work tirelessly in the interests of the Australians uh, who elected us and whom we represent. Down to earth, hard working and dedicated to what he believed in, Alex Gallagher was a great fighter for the rights and conditions of transport workers. Alex passionately pursued his interest in South Australians <coughs> Uh, in the federal parliament and never forgot his working class roots nor his Carlton Football Club. I again offer my condolences to his family, friends and colleagues who will be sadly missed. Senator Keneally. Oh, Senator Fawcett. Oh, Senator Fawcett. Thank you, uh, Senator Keneally. Mr President, I'll be brief. Still, I'm glad you mentioned uh, golf. Um, the word golf comes to mind when I think of Alex, the number of times on a plane from South Australia the number of times during divisions, the number of times on committee trips he would talk about golf, his favourite clubs, the things he'd played at, uh, etc. But it's the other word golf that I want to mention in three uh, contexts, the G-U-L-F, golf. First is my first impressions of Alex, the gulf between my impression and who he was. Uh, we were both elected in South Australia at the 2010 election and we were in the office of the Electoral Commission when they read out the various scripts that uh, announced that we were going to be elected. And I couldn't help but wonder what a dreadful time I was going to have with this grumpy old bloke who uh, seemed so unimpressed by this uh, young Liberal that was uh, in the same room with him. Well, I couldn't have been further from the truth. Uh, he ended up being one of my closer colleagues uh, in this place. Gulf of, um, or the Gulf of St Vincent and Spencer Gulf, uh, speaks to me of his love for South Australia, the, the remote and western regions of South Australia where he spent a lot of time. And some of the most constructive work that I did with Alex was on the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee. And we had a significant breakthrough uh, at Port Augusta, at the top of the Gulf, uh, looking at how defence interacted with regional communities in terms of training areas and how they uh, actually invested. And uh, it was a fantastic committee. Uh, as I said before, Alex is not political. Alex was concerned about outcomes. And it was really useful to be able to work collaboratively uh, to actually extract from defence the fact that when they said local, they meant anything in Australia as opposed to what came overseas. Whereas we thought local was Port Augusta, Port Pirie, uh, the local towns, the people who actually drove past the training ground. And as a result of that report that Alex was the chair of and, and wrote, uh, we've seen some significant reforms uh, come about how defence engages with local communities through its procurement. And so there will be people around this nation, uh, architects, builders, fencers, sign writers, all kinds of people who will get work on defence projects because of that committee uh, which Alex chaired. And the final gulf, I guess, is the perception that the Australian people have. Uh, it's, it's a gap between their perception that Parliament is a place which is all about antagonistic interaction between people, just point scoring, uh, the perception that you only ever have colleagues here, you don't have friends. Alex is a great example of the fact that across the political divide, people often do work closely together, build good friendships uh, for good outcomes for Australia. Rest in peace, Alex Gallagher. Senator Keneally. Thank you very much, Mr President. I rise to contribute to the condolence motion for Senator Alex Gallagher. 
And in doing so, I express my condolences to his wife, Paolo, to his children, his grandchildren, and to his friends and colleagues here, particularly Senator Stirl and Senator Billick. You know, it is never easy to watch somebody die of cancer. And 67 is far too young. Of course, it made it very difficult for Alex and for those who loved him because of the COVID pandemic. It made it exceptionally difficult for those of us who would have liked to have spent time with him. And I think particularly it's hard today that Senator Stirl and Senator Billick and so many of our colleagues are remote and unable to participate in person in the chamber today. And I'm very grateful that we have the remote participation and the video links that allow that to happen. COVID has been really hard. And I think many of us have had experiences in last year of losing someone. It's very difficult to say goodbye to someone when you can't be with them in person. You know, I think back to the day after the May 2019 election that unexpected result we all had. As I was uh, driving back to my house, I got a phone call. The first phone call I got from a colleague the day after the election was from Alex Gallagher. And he called to offer me his analysis on what had happened, to offer me his frank assessment that we had too many policies, to uh, offer me his views on what we should do next as a party and a movement. And he was already charting within, well, less than 12 hours from the loss, he was already charting our path to victory to the next election. To me and to many of us, I think all of us, the great tragedy of Alex's death this year is that he will not be with us next year when we hopefully see a Labour government come to power. And when that happens, when that happens, the passion and the values and the policy sense and the commitment to working people that Alex Gallagher brought, not just to the job, but indeed to his every interaction with his colleagues on this side of the chamber and that side of the chamber, in his advocacy, in his committee work, those values, those commitments will sit at the heart of the next Labour government. And so the greatest testament that we, as Alex colleagues, can, play, can pay to him is to ensure that a government that governs for the people he fought for for the people he represented and for the values he espoused is the government of Australia. Alex was a fierce warrior for working Australians. He was a dedicated family man and he was a dear friend to so many in this chamber. And so many here today have already recounted his life and his journey. I think as the Shadow Minister for Immigration, one of the things that strikes me about Alex's family story is it's one that so many Australian families uh, can relate to, and that is a decision to pack up and leave the country that they have known and called home and to come to Australia seeking a better life, seeking more opportunity, seeking to build something new in this country. And I dare say Scotland's loss was Australia's gain when the Gallaghers chose to re relocate first to the Northern Territory where Alex began his career, where he spent much of his career in the 70s and 80s working as a labourer, a truck driver, finally as an airline ramp services operator with the Trans Australian Airlines. Now those early jobs, they won't surprise anyone who saw Alex in this place. He was always immensely proud of his background. It always had an indelible impact on his politics. And those experiences, particularly in trucking and av aviation, drew Alex to the Australian Labor Party and the trade union movement. He joined the Northern Territory branch of the Australian Labor Party and the Transport Workers Union in 1988. 
Through both the ALP and the TWU, Alex became a proud advocate for Australian workers, fighting endlessly for their rights and their pay and their conditions. He also served with distinction as the Commissioner for the National Road Transport Commission and as a director of the South Australian Motor Accident Commission. Now, a constant theme throughout his time, whether it be in the committee work, in parliamentary debates, in our caucus committees, uh, in our caucus, was he, he had a straight-talking approach and an affinity for ordinary Australians. He proudly fought for them because he was one of them, and rarely, if ever, did they have a better champion than they did in Alex. Now, in his work in this place was a testament to his humility. He always stayed true to those values of his early life and consistently advocated with great pride and passion the issues which impacted uh, ordinary Australians. Senator Farrell has done well in pointing to some of the key work that Alex did on committees. He served on 23 committees during his political career including that Road Safety and Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Committees. One of the great challenges I had over the past few years, along with Senator Farrell, was to constantly have to check in with Senator Gallagher to know if he was going to be able to make it into Parliament, if he was going to be able to make committee hearings, what arrangements we needed to make. And the thing that always struck me in those conversations is that he was generous he wasn't territorial, he was honest, and sometimes showed an extraordinary determination at times where I might have thought the illness might have gotten the better of him to come in, in here, to do estimates, to do committee hearings, but he also was straightforward if he felt he couldn't do it, and generous in making sure that his colleagues could step in, not without any, any propriety. One of the other challenges I sometimes faced with Senator Gallagher in our conversations was that he had a lot of views about motions. And sometimes he had a lot of views about the positions we were taking on certain motions. And Senator Stirl is nodding his head on the screen <laughs> and knows of what I speak. And the thing about that is that Alex was frank. He was direct. He sometimes kept me on my toes. He never took anything for granted, and he never took a backward step. What he was, though, at times willing to do was to recognize that there was a forest and see it for the trees. And I make that point because while we are right to laud his straight-talking, passionate conviction, which did never waver, he was part of a collectivist movement the Great Australian Labour Party. And before that, he was part of another collectivist movement, the Transport Workers' Union. And Alex, in his conviction and in his passion, never saw himself as greater than the whole. He never put himself outside of that of his colleagues. He understood that we were a collective. And so even, and I'm, he never compromised, but he also never made his view more important than someone else's. He always worked with me and with others to try and find ways to ensure that we were true to our collectivist commitment to one another. So Alex was a good friend to so many in this caucus, and I know that so many of my colleagues will contribute to this condolence motion. I will say at a personal level, he offered me support, friendship, and loyalty far more than I could have ever expected, perhaps because he and Senator Stirl almost very generously have, have, uh, have recognized my brief period as a member of the Teamsters Union, <laughs> as thank you, Senator Stirl, as appropriate enough to be a somewhat honorary member of the TWU. But Alex, in his advocacy for working people, in his principled, passionate commitment to in fight for the rights of working people, to ensure that they had the opportunity for a better life, to ensure that a working person could support their family, buy a home, have some time for recreation and a holiday on an ordinary working salary. They're humble, important, significant goals 
for the Australian people, and Alex was constantly motivated by them. As a humble man, I'm sure Alex would have shied away from some of this pomp and circumstance today, but I hope that it's the first of many accolades and honours that serve to remind us of what people can achieve when they live their lives with passion and dedication. So I conclude again by expressing my condolences to Paolo, to their children and grandchildren, and our thoughts, my thoughts in particular, with all of them today as we celebrate Alex's life. We will all miss Alex. The past few months of sittings have not been the same without him. And I hope that we see his likes in this chamber again. His passing is a great loss to this chamber, to the Australian Labor Party, to the Transport Workers Union, and indeed to the nation as a whole. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr. President. The death of a colleague while they still serve here in the Senate is a reminder to all of us that our time on earth is limited and we ought never waste a day or indeed a minute here. His passing is a reminder for all of us to stay focused on doing the most good we can in the limited time we're given. Like me, like all Labor senators, he was haunted by the fact that we have been out of office for all but six years of the last 25. Mr. President, I am sad to be eulogising Alex Gallagher, but I am also weary of reflecting on so many careers like his. Too much time spent in opposition, not enough time with the chance to make real change. All that time, all those missed opportunities, all the good that should have been done, that could have been done. It is a common sense statement of the obvious to say you can only do good when you are actually in, of in office. Senator Birmingham and Senator Mackenzie have both referred to the quote from Theodore Roosevelt that his, Alex's daughter Caroline um, gave to him for his first speech. But Alex and I discussed last year another Roosevelt quote. So I would be driving up to Canberra last year and I would speak to Alex, I would phone Alex, and Alex was either at the golf club or sometimes resting at home. And that quote was from, he said to me, you know, that man in the arena quote. And that is, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error or shortcoming. But who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself for a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who knew neither victory nor defeat. Alex was his usual dry self in discussing that quote, but there was also a poignancy because he said to me, you can never be in the arena forever. Alex would want this, for us to work tirelessly from now until the election, focusing on what matters to Australian families so that we can have the privilege of governing on their behalf. Alex would want that. Men like Alex Gallagher come from a labour tradition rooted in common sense. The wisdom and life experience that comes from hard work, driving trucks, making airports work, and two decades of representing hard workers at the mighty Transport Workers Union and representing all South Australians since 2010. Long before there were terms like virtue signalling, inner city elites and wokeness, Alex Gallagher despised them. He was interested in what Labor was doing for working people, not talking, not positioning, not excusing, but actually doing. I wonder if Alex Gallagher once ever read or paid much attention to the talking points usually sent out by various prime ministers or leaders' offices in the time he was here. I don't think anyone could write a script for Alex Gallagher. I doubt anyone dared. When he took some time off, fighting the fight of his life against an insidious cancer, I filled in for him briefly on the Economics Committee. After speaking with him and assessing the contributions he'd made, I had one look at the proposal before that committee, a half 
considered Treasury thought bubble about criminalising <coughs> cash transactions greater than $10,000, and I did my very best to channel Alex Gallagher by asking some tough, direct, pointed questions about the measure that would have caused great inconvenience and imposition on older people, among many others. He had already made it clear that he was deeply sceptical about the merits of the idea, no matter who supported it. And the committee approved it in principle, as it was government, government and opposition policy in principle, but with a list of long conditions precedent that gave the Treasury a great deal to think about. We haven't seen the measure in legislation, and I don't think we will for quite some time, until the committee's bipartisan concerns are seriously addressed by the bureaucracy. And Senator Fawcett has reminded me about the trip to Port Augusta. So we got out of the airport and into a minibus, and Alex sat up the back, and David sat down the front, and I looked at them both and said, we are not spending this entire trip in different parts of the minibus, are we? So in the end, we sat together, and David, Senator Fawcett is correct. It was a great trip, and I was very lucky because I was with two very thoughtful people, people who wanted to do good. So I can't thank Alex anymore, but I thank Senator Fawcett. That was a great trip, and I learnt a lot. Also, in the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee, no one could ever accuse Alex Gallagher of being unsound. He was from that tradition, also mine, of belief in our alliance with America, a great country, a belief that Israel must exist. And I can't help thinking when AUKUS was announced, Alex Gallagher would have loved AUKUS. While Alex didn't seek glory or boast about many achievements here, this is just a small example of Alex Gallagher's common sense and good judgment. It's an illustration of the impact that men like Alex Gallagher can have here and why we need more people like Alex Gallagher here. Just because a powerful bureaucracy wanted it, Senator Gallagher needed to be persuaded on the merits, assessed not through a prism of what Canberra's bureaucracy wanted, but what would actually benefit the lives of the people Labor senators are here to represent. We're not here to make good impressions on Radio National or among insiders. We're not here to trend on Twitter. We are here to do what Alex Gallagher did all his working life, to champion labour values, the right to work, the right to be safe at work, the right to be treated with dignity at work in a society that leaves no one behind. Alex was gruff, a straight shooter, honest and wise. Senator Stirl has referred to him as Mr Happy. But underneath that grouchiness, as I find so often the case with most grouchy people, was a heart of gold and a restlessness that we weren't doing enough for the people he was sent here to fight for. In the days ahead, when we're debating self-indulgent propositions in labour forums, when we're slogging through the detail of unwise bureaucratic proposals in Senate committees, when we're thinking about what kind of Labor Party we need to be, what kind of government we should aim to be, I will think about Alex Gallagher. Today, as they have been over the past few months, my thoughts have been, are with Paola, Alex's family, his staff and his friends. I'm sure many of us had, have had conversations with Alex about his family and many about his grandchildren. May his memory be an example to all of us. Vale. Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you, President. It is with great and deep sadness that I rise to speak on this motion as well, but it is also my honour. It was my honour to have known Senator Gallagher, to have served by his side in this place and to have called him and his beautiful wife, Paola, my friends. Like all of us in this place, we are each the product of our life experience, but more importantly, we are the product of those who we love and those who love us in return. And the things we do here, the things we hope to achieve, and in Alex's case, certainly did achieve, belong to the people we love and who love us too. And so I want to acknowledge his family and their contribution to everything that Alex was able to do as a senator. I want to make some personal reflections on my relationship with Alex soon, but first I do just want to pay special focus to his legacy and his achievements during his time in the Senate. 
And Alex, if you're listening, I have to say sorry. I'm going to refer to notes as I do this. And I know you really, really hate senators bringing notes into the chamber. I'm looking at Senator Stoker. I think uh, she fell victim to one of his uh, points of order referring to notes. It was one of the first points of order he referred me to as a young senator, that we are not meant to read from notes in this place. So I am sorry, Alex. Alex knew the importance of staying true to Labor values, the importance of providing Australians a fair go and a better chance for all, as he said. These values drove him throughout his entire career. And whether you sat on these benches or you sat opposite, everyone knew what Alex stood for, everyone knew his values. His first speech outlined what he would fight for as a parliamentarian, and it was clear and direct as Alex was the transport industry, road safety and superannuation, and his contribution in a policy sense to all of these areas was substantial and unwavering. He brought real-world perspective to this place, but he also brought an incredible intelligence. And his immediate impact on Parliament saw the Labor government bring in the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal into legislation. This was an objective that Alex alongside his colleagues and comrades at the TWU, had fought for for almost two decades. Now that fight had to continue after a change in government saw that tribunal dismantled. But Alex kept up that fight. In fact, there wasn't a day that he served in this chamber where transport workers, who he had once been, who he served alongside and represented and advocated for, his whole career went front of his mind. There was no better friend of transport workers than Alex Gallagher. And of super, too. This was one of his passions. He knew the benefits of super, the intrinsic benefits that it could bring to working Australians, its impact on dignity in retirement, its economic benefits to Australia. He was absolutely passionate. And in his last months in the Senate, I know he was also becoming increasingly passionate about the disparity for women in superannuation. And this is a fight I will continue on his behalf. But I think his biggest legacy in this place was his impact alongside his dear mate, Senator Still, on road safety. And this came from an almost five-year stint as a director with the Motor Accident Commission that he served on before entering politics. Alex was acutely aware of the devastation to victims and their families, as well as the economic devastation caused by the unnecessary loss of life and catastrophic injuries suffered on our roads. He was deeply disappointed in the progression of the National Road Safety Strategy targets never being met, and he fought incredibly hard to make sure that road safety was on the political map. That included through his work on the Parliamentary Friends of Road Safety. It was very evident in his work as estimates and his push for the government to form the Office of Road Safety within the department. On the 11th of November, the government announced that autonomous emergency braking technology would be mandated in the Australian design rule by 2023. This would save 580 lives, avoid tens of thousands of serious and minor injuries and have a net benefit of close to $1.9 billion. Alex first called for the mandating of this technology in September 2014. He saw the need for this, he fought for it relentlessly until it was achieved. He knew this policy area better than anyone. He believed in it deeply and he has had an incredible legacy in this space, which will never be forgotten. His committee worked too, where he pushed for common sense results. He was true to his principles and he would advance his views whether or not they aligned with the views of our party, often. The River Murray was a huge passion of Alex's, and one area that he was deeply passionate about policy-wise uh, was the NDIS. He served on the NDIS committee. And I know these, the issues relating to the NDIS, especially the times that we saw the NDIS not live up to its promise, we saw it fail, the people who needed it most. These issues weighed on Alex heavily, and he was incredibly dedicated and focused on how he could use his role on that committee to improve the lives of Australians with disability. He loved our state. He loved his duty electorate of Grey, 
He travelled there regularly. He never flew in and flew out. When he went to Gray, he wanted to stay. He wanted to be amongst it. And one of the proudest moments he had as a duty member of, for Gray was when the Elliston Reconciliation Monument was erected after much debate in the town of Elliston, which is almost halfway between Port Lincoln and Sejuna. Alex supported the monument, recognising the massacre of 1849, where the local First Nations people uh, were driven off the cliff, as it's described. Alex considered the official opening as one of his more memorable and important moments as a senator. Alex was a natural at the work he did. He was incredibly focused and incredibly hardworking. He did the reading. He did the work. He never turned up unprepared. He always turned up knowing what he wanted to get out of a hearing, out of his day in parliament, out of a speech he would give. He never did anything without purpose. And we saw this work ethic, this focus of his so intensely when he was sick, when he refused to slow down, when he refused to step back. He believed in his work. He believed in what he did. And he was determined to continue fighting the fight that he believed in, representing the people he stood for right until the end. I know we've all had different experience of Alex. We've all seen different sides of him, and I'm sure we can uh, all remember moments fondly where we found opportunities for agreement with him, where his gruff exterior faded away and you saw the warmth and the passion beneath. We can probably all also remember now fondly moments where we disagreed with Alex and you certainly weren't left wondering uh, about Alex's position or what his view was. But Alex gave people a fair hearing always. If you had a good idea, he would listen to you. If you were well reasoned in your argument, he would listen to you. And he fought for what he believed was right. And I know some of our colleagues may have liked him sometimes to fight a little less loudly, sometimes a little less publicly, but that was Alex. When he was on a mission, when he believed something, he took his role as a public figure seriously and he fought for that with every tool in his arsenal. Alex was an extremely hard worker and his career, I think, is best referenced by him himself in his maiden speech when he refers to Theodore Roosevelt saying, far and away the best prize that life has to offer is the chance to work hard at work worth doing. And Alex certainly got that opportunity. He certainly did that. Alex was an extremely private person who loved his family immensely. You never see a bigger smile on his face than when he was talking about Paola or his kids and especially his grandchildren. Possibly a smile which would rival it though was when he talked about golf, his passion for golf, and a, a round of golf a week was never enough for him. He also loved to have a punt and uh, Saturdays were often uh, Saturday morning at the North Adelaide Golf Club and in the afternoon horse racing. And his staff recalled to me a story, apparently this was before my time, but where there was one Melbourne Cup day and the coalition government scheduled a sitting week which overlapped with the Melbourne Cup. And I, uh, I hear uh, other senators would have to confirm that there has never been an angrier parliamentarian in this place than Alex Gallagher in that moment. Alex's staff formed a powerful bond with him. And thank you, Senator Stell, for reading the words of Matthew, who he had a very special bond. And I know Matthew misses him very, very deeply. But his other staff do too. Peter and Matthew both began in Alex's office when Alex began as a senator, and they stayed the course with him. Susie worked with him for nine years, and Brendan worked with him for seven. Pauline had been there for a few years too, and I, I do wonder if Pauline expected that. Those who know Pauline know she is a, uh, was a, a firm and passionate uh, member of the left and uh, was perhaps surprised that she found herself working in Alex's office, but they formed a very close friendship too and a, a commitment and a passion for, for the work Alex was doing on the NDIS. His office, his staff would say that their office was a family which is testament to Alex as a boss and as a person. He could be gruff, yes, but he was a good and warm man. And when you were in the fold, when you were in the family with Alex, you knew it, you knew it deeply. And I don't think I've ever, in my time in politics, not just as a senator, but for the many years I've been around politics before, I don't think I've ever seen an office as 
close and connected as Alex's were and as loyal to their senator. And I want to acknowledge them because this has been a really tough time. All of his staff stuck with him as he was sick and right up to the end. They believed in what Alex was doing too. They knew the man so well and they believed in what he was doing. Alex had another work family as well, and that's his family at his beloved union, the Transport Workers Union. And I know Ian Smith and Alex's friends at the TWU are watching these proceedings now live in Adelaide, indeed uh, under the sign of the Alex Gallagher Training Centre, fitting monument for a man who made an incredible contribution to that union and all of the people that that union represents, all of the values that that union represents. I know everyone at the TWU will feel this loss deeply because when Alex left the TWU to become a senator, he never walked away from those he served with. He was always there, always providing support, always there to those who needed him. And one of the amazing things about Alex was he really, he really believed in people. When he believed in people, he helped them. He gave them active support, active mentoring, active encouragement. If you had Alex in your corner, you knew it. And even when things were tough, even when you doubted yourself, Alex would be there backing you and pulling you up, sometimes really gruffly, quite aggressively. But if he believed in you, he would make sure you did your best. I will miss Alex deeply. This place will not ever be the same for me without him. I want to make a personal reflection here. Alex was a formidable figure, and in my childhood, his name loomed large. Alex was once my father's adversary, but he became a close and valued friend of me and my family. It's really easy in politics to make simple assessments of people, one-dimensional assessments of people. Alex never did that. He certainly never did it of me. He didn't do it of others in this chamber, even when people were often quick to make simple assessments of him, one-dimensional assessments of him. And I am so grateful that he is a man who judged people on their substance and judged me on my substance and gave me his firm support very early on in my career here in this place and indeed when I was seeking to enter this place. And when I entered the Senate, his support continued. He has guided me throughout my journey here. He has uh, always been generous with his feedback to me. I was scrolling through some messages uh, earlier. Alex used to text me often after my speeches to make sure I had the benefit of his experience and wisdom in this place. Um, some of those uh, critiques were always sharp. He, of course, hated speeches being read. He hated speeches being too polished, but he liked speeches which didn't miss anything or anyone, and they're Alex's words. Alex. When I, was, when I was going through my messages from Alex in preparation for today, there were a few which stood out for me, messages he sent me of encouragement and support. He, he sent me a text defining our role. He said to me, your job is to be different, Marielle. It's to be authentic and to be credible. It's to let people see you, to believe every word that you say. Alex was authentic. You knew it. You knew it. It was very good advice. He also gave me the advice, keep your eye on the main game and most importantly in this place, be yourself. Alex was his self. Alex never had to support me, but he did. He mentored me in the ways of this place. Some of those lessons I will keep with me. Some of those um, I might disregard because our styles are pretty different, but I will always value the things he taught me and the lessons he tried to impart. But Senator Stoker, I promise I won't be on my feet if uh, there's, there's notes used in this place. Alex loved Paola deeply. On more than one occasion, I would hear him recount when he was summing up his view on one individual or another. Paola has good judgment. If she thinks someone is decent, then they're OK with me. Paola was the boss. One of the, the last social moments I had with Alex was uh, not long after my daughter Zara was born and Alex and Paola came to visit Clint and I at our home 
uh, to, deliver, to deliver my son Benjamin another truck, which Alex was uh, always prone to do. He wanted my son to be a truck man and not a bus man. Um, <laughs> very important, Senator Wong. Um, but they also brought uh, a teddy bear for my daughter, and there was a bit of a discussion and debate between Alex and Paola because Paola wanted the bear to go on a shelf and to be preserved and kept pristine so that when Zara is older she could look at the bear and, and you know, have that memory and have that special thing from her childhood. And Alex was vehemently opposed to this. The bear was for cuddling, the bear was for playing, the bear was for using, um, and it just summed up to me uh, Alex's, uh, anyway, a part of Alex's personality. So I'm sorry, Paola, but the bear's coming off the mantelpiece and it will be used and cuddled and loved. Um, it it's, feels quite indulgent in a way to talk about how much we will all miss Alex and how much we loved him. Because, of course, those who miss him will be those who, who missed him the most and will miss him the most are his family, those that he loved the most and who love him the most. His wife, Paola, his children, Ian, Caroline, Terry and Frank, his children-in-law, Sinead, Ian's wife and Tammy, Terry's partner, his grandchildren, Connor, Lachlan and Mia. I want to thank you for sharing the man that you loved with this place for so long. It's never without sacrifice. And his achievements, his legacy belong to you and your family as well. I hope you are so proud of what your husband, what your father, what your grandfather achieved here. I hope you're so proud of the words that are being spoken about him. We should never be one dimensional or simplistic in our assessment of people who choose to do this role. Alex was a complicated and complex character, but he was a great man. He was a fiercely intelligent man. He worked tirelessly in this place for the values that he held dear. You really, I hope you, you are so proud of his achievement. We are all so proud of his achievements. I know you will all continue to carry Alex's memory in your hearts and I want you to know that his colleagues here in the Senate from all sides of politics will continue to carry that memory too. And we will also continue on with the work which meant so much to Alex. Rest in peace, Alex, friend, Senator. You will be so missed. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you very much, President. Um, I just want to, I, I get, one of the things that um, struck me when I was thinking about what to say about Alex is the first comments. I've known Alex for 25 years, and not long after I arrived here, the number of people that came up and said, He's tough and he's gruff and he's pretty damn hard to get on with sometimes. I said, well, he's my mate. I find him exactly the same way, so don't feel special. It's just the way he is. A guy who's passionate and strongly believes in what he believes. And also, you know, just so many other speakers said about he did listen, but he also turned around and mentored people. And I appreciate a great deal of assistance that Alex was always available to have a chat with. Um, no matter what the time of day or, or what, he, what he had on. But also I, I think that I, I went to many, many years ago to a, to a, a funeral. It was quite a, quite a revelation for me. It was uh, a Maori funeral. And a lot of people got up and spoke about, from their heart about what they felt about the fellow who just died. And they also got up and said things that were nasty about him which I thought that was quite surprising. <laughs> but they had a, I, was, I was chatting to uh, a number of those that spoke and, and uh, family members. They said, no, it's really important. You have to really you know, let the spirit um, be released. Um, and if, you don't, if you're not honest and you're not frank, then you're not going to get um, the spirit released. And Alex, um, we're all going to be very frank. And I think one of the things that, um, when I think of that again, is that we had a just a... It wasn't an exclusive group, it was just a group of TWU people that got together and, and uh, some the TWU senators. And uh, we had a, had a wake for Alex and a number of people explained some of their experiences with Alex. Um, how, he worked, how they worked with him in the, entire, in the transport industry and how um, you know, the sorts of differences that he made. And I'll get to those in a moment, but I just want to say that 
you know, if you look at some of the statements that Alex said when he first came into this place, uh, his first speech, you know, he said, there is no smoke and mirrors, just plain talking, hard working employees and employers alike when talking about the transport industry. They all share common attributes, that is, capacity for hard work and a selfless dedication to the task at hand. Now, that can also be a very fine description of Alex, because that's who the man was. Now, of course, as we've talked about, you know, Alex did come with those three very important priorities, road safety, transport industry and superannuation. And there are a few people in Australia who can make a match Alex's experience and expertise in road safety. I want to put on the record as well the importance of his role that he played at the National Transport Commissioner. I still remember when he got appointed and how proud he was to stand up there and make a difference. To have those conversations and those hard conversations in an industry that has way too many deaths. And Alex you know, spoke with passion and every time he came back and gave reports about what was happening at the, um, at the Commission. And of course, being a director of the Motor Accident Commission for South Australia was again another important role that Alex took a great deal of, felt a great deal of responsibility, but also passion to make sure that he could, that people were properly looked after, that opportunities for turning around and making our roads safer were pursued, but also questions of proper uh, compensation for those that have, uh, were killed in, in, in accidents and incidents. And of course, as, as we all know, he was the chair of the Road Safety Advisory Council of South Australia. Alex was a firm believer in the Swedish model for a vision zero. The model recognises that drivers are human and humans make mistakes. I think a bit like um, Alex, I think. Um, he's certainly human and he may have made a few mistakes, but there's no doubting about the passion which he brought to this place and to what he believed in. His freedom and mobility achieved by owning a vehicle he talked about and is tempered by the sickening human and economic cost of vehicle accidents. Alex passionately made sure he pursued all those issues to its fullest. Alex played an important role, of course, and has been mentioned in the Gillard government establishing the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal in 2012. I had a lot of dealings with Alex over 25 years and many dealings during that period um, in the role that I, I held at the time. And of course he was scathing when it was abolished and replaced with nothing in 2016. And as someone with decades of experience in the industry, he understood the consequences of that decision better than most. To quote from his speech on the abolition of the bill, a speech that the Australian Road Transport Industry Organisation, Paul Ryan said, described as the best speech I've ever heard given in the Senate. And he said, Alex said, people need to get proper remuneration for fixed and variable and labour costs. Lots of these owner drivers will work themselves to death. I know the things that they go through on a daily basis. I know all about visiting families who have had people in their families not come home from work. This was for me a once in a lifetime opportunity to see some sanity, some fairness and some real reward for that effort. And Alex was spot on and straight to the point. And that's how he always operated. And you know, in, again on that, um, it, at the uh, wake, um, uh, Zoom, wake Zoom, um, Michael Caine, the National Secretary of the TWU, I think summed up a really incredibly important point about Alex. He said he would take the problem in front of him, distill it into a bite-sized grab, and then figure out how to use the bite-sized grab to fight for the rights of working people. That's what he would do, and he would do it really, really effectively. Michael also tells a story about his trip to South Australia after joining the national office. And if those that don't know, the TW had a tradition of having seven warring factions. It makes any of the political parties here look um, tame. Um, but Alex was a person who always fired you know, directly to everybody about what he believed in. Michael said, I landed um, to talk about um, the threat of work choices. And he said, I landed at the Adelaide airport fully expecting to hop in a cab. I walked down the stairs and at the bottom there is Alex. 
I said, geez, I didn't expect you to see you here, Alex. And Alex said, do you think I'm going to let the Assistant National Secretary just come to Adelaide and walk around by himself unchaperoned? And of course, Alex put Michael in front of the officials as a, of a, um, a baptism of fire for Michael as well, and key delegates who also could see that the angst regarding work choices and clearly see what the TW needed to do. And Alex was outspoken again and very supportive of incredibly important steps that were decided by that group of um, workplace leaders and union officials. Uh, he was drawing the crowd out. He was getting people to actually say things that were not, um, um, were, that, that were always in com could be in conflict with what he was saying because he wanted to draw people out to make sure the best decisions were being made. And it's not um, just union officials and workers uh, had tremendous respect for Alex. He drew respect from the employing side for his toughness, his perseverance, his plain talking and his commitment to working people. During the, um, during the Zoom wake, Steve Schofield, who used to be the head of the industrial relations at Qantas, and butted heads with Alex on a number of occasions. Steve said that he had a lot of mentors over the years on both sides of the table, but you wouldn't guess that Alex was one of them, he said. Steve tells a story about September the 11th, 2001, a horrible, uncertain day for us all, but particularly for those in the aviation industry. And Steve said, and I quote, I got two phone calls in the morning of September the 11th, and one was from Alex. And he said words to the effect of, listen, young fella, it's going to be a tough couple of days. But if there's anything we can do as a union, just let us know. That was a side of Alex that many didn't see. Then there was a side that many did, a side that was tough as nails. Matt Bernal, an official down at Alex's South Australian branch of the TWU, tells a story about the 2017 South Australian branch elections night. Matt was watching the count together with Alex's chief of staff, Matt Morosi. Both Ian Smith and Alex are asking how Ian is going in, in the count. The two Matts look at each other and wonder why they, what the, who they, how they're going to tell Ian that he's lost. And worse still, he says, how I'm going to deal with Alex, he's going to kill us both. Now, fortunately, Ian got over the line in the end, so they have to find out Alex's wrath. But Alex's other passion, of course, was superannuation, which has been mentioned. He strongly believed that working people deserve a retirement with dignity. In his first speech, he said, members will always demand value for money, and it is my belief that this is the best achieved by the industry fund not-for-profit model, with all profits back to member accounts. Trustee directors representing employers and employees and only acting in the best interests of members are a world-class model. Various studies have shown that many funds have achieved brand status, with loyalty driven by industry participation and trust in the Board of Representatives. Alex was the first chairman of the TW Superannuation Investment Committee. And Frank Sandy, the current CEO of the TW Super Fund, summed up on the, the night of the Zoom wake. I have a wonderful memories of a person who was strong, direct, really clear and always with a purpose. While we're doing this, we're doing this for members. Are we doing this for, to make things better? That's the questions that Alex would ask. And that's my mem memories of Alex. Paul Ryan, who's one of the employer side directors at the TW Super added, we and every transport worker owes Alex a debt of gratitude that could probably be measured in dollar terms. If you want to go back to when he started, it is worth somewhere around $100,000 over the last 15 years. That's for per member. That's the additional uh, legacy that Alex leaves. And it's a lasting legacy. And Lou Coy, who was on the TW Super executive team, told me, Alex was a, wo a wonderful person. He seemed to always have time for me. He would always ask me and was interested in my life. He was a wonderful person and a gentleman. That is the Alex, of Alex and his legacy at TW Super. Then, of course, there's the legacy of Alex the TW itself. Uh, Barry Norton, who's a TW organiser in Alex's South Australian Northern Territory branch, said, 
There are a few times over the last two and a half years where people walk in, they've been union members for the longer, longest time and they've remembered Alex for what he did. I'm very well aware of the boots that I'm trying to fill and I'll do my best to do that because Alex being the previous Northern Territory organiser. Now, Nick McIntosh, the National Assistant Secretary of the TWU, again one of the Zoom participants for Alex's wake, described him as a mentor. He always spoke words of wisdom. He was always welcoming to me. There were good times. We had conversations in his Parliament House office where he would never say too much, but just enough that I could tell exactly what he was getting at. You could tell just from the interactions how smart he was, how switched on he was, but most importantly, how much he would always stand for working people. Now, as someone who stood Alex for working people all his life, that's how the best way to remember him in this place. That's how we remember him at the TWU and all of, our, all of his uh, work colleagues and the people he represented and, and protected and defended and supported. But of course, Alex's most important legacy, of course, is his family. And his family, as we mentioned just you know, previous to me, you know, his family, both of his staff, but also his children and grandchildren, and of course, his very loved uh, Paolo. You know, wonderful. Um, you know, I think we can all recite on so many occasions where Alex would talk to us about the love of his family um, and what they were getting up to. He was a, you know, such a great uh, family man. and saw that as part of his real worth and real value. And I know this has been used bef uh, a bit earlier today, and I thought I might still use it because um, I think it does describe something very accurate about Alex. He said, you know, his daughter Caroline, when Alex's first speech, um, and it was a quotation from Theodore Roosevelt, and far and away the best prize life has to offer is a chance to do work, hard, do work, hard at work and worth doing. And of course, Alex's record, both here and at the Transport Workers' Union, was an indictment of that. And of course, his good friend Ian Smith um, you know, recites to me recited to me and uh, the secretary down there, a very close friend of Alex and somebody um, who was a close mate. And he said, he told me, for the, it was the first one to tell me that when Alex was getting treatment, literally the following day he would go on the golf course. Now I haven't heard anyone else that gets treatment who can do that, but Alex did it because he was determined to make sure that it didn't hold him back, that he was gonna do the things that he had passion for and that's why he came back to the Senate that's why I came back here to speak and came back to be involved, of course, you know, with the dangers of COVID, uh, particularly people in his circumstance. That's a man with passion, it's a man with dedication, and it's a person worth emanating. Thank you, Alex. I'll miss you, mate. Senator Walsh? I'm happy to say to Senator okay, Patrick. I'll, I'll, yeah. We'll go to Senator Patrick next, just to share the call around a little. And then uh, um, to you, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I will be relatively brief. Um, I don't know how I became a friend of Alex's, and actually I don't even know how he became a friend of mine. It kind of just happened. Uh, I don't know whether it started in meetings that we had in cafes when I was an advisor to Nick Xenophon heading back to, to uh, Adelaide. Uh, I don't know whether it was through my working with him on the economics committee. And I know people did talk to, uh, uh, have been talking about his passion for road safety, but uh, there were also other things he had passions for, passion for, including naval shipbuilding. He was very concerned about uh, workers down in Adelaide, uh, and um, I'm just sad he didn't get to see uh, that particular committee through. But, uh, but uh, what I I also used to chat with him in the chamber and also around the building, often uh, with Glenn um, uh, in, in tow, so I think uh, in, in common we all know that uh, the two of them operated together um, mischievously in, so, in some instances. What I'll just say about, about uh, Alex is he was simple and effective. Simple, I note uh, uh, Christina made a mention of uh, some, some frustration that, that there might have been. Uh, Alex always saw things in a different way 
to others. Where other people found complexity, he found simplicity. And I think that was the bane of his, of his frustration um, uh, with, with others in this place in, in terms of a professional frustration. The other thing, I'd, when I say effective, um, I used to watch him in committees and I, and I never thought he was excited about uh, too much. He, and even some of his questions were quite boring. But then I'd go back and read the Hansard and go, that was a really good question. He was really effective. So that's the other thing that, uh, that, that uh, uh, struck me about Alex. I will reveal now that, uh, as we all know around this place, we're trying to get advocacy for any particular issue. You kind of think, do I go to someone who's got carriage of a, of a particular topic or do I go to someone who's got passion about a particular topic? Well, what I could say to, to, the, to the Labor Party at least now is if Alex came to me and asked me for something, almost always I did it. Just because I knew that it, particularly if it was a topic I didn't know anything about, uh, that Alex uh, will, you know, would only come to me when he was passionate and he was just a, a, a genuine and honest guy. And for me, that was enough. And I'd always say yes to him. I can't think of a time where I said no when he asked me to support something. And I think that comes down to how I would summarise him, and that is genuine and honest and someone that I will miss. Senator Walsh. Thank you very much, uh, President, and thank you to Senator Stirl. Um, for your words earlier, and I know that all of our thoughts um, are definitely with you today. Uh, and I would like to join colleagues in recognising the contribution and the passing of Senator Alex Gallagher. Uh, and it was as a new senator in 2019 that I met Alex uh, as part of the Senate Economics References Committee, um, of which he was chair. Uh, and so my reflections. Uh, on Alex come from my experiences entering this place just two years before Alex's time here came to an end. Uh, so I have a few memories of Alex that I'd like to, to share with the chamber uh, and with Alex's loved ones who may be listening um, or reading the speeches later on that are given in his honour today. Uh, and they are memories of someone who combined complete dedication and commitment to the people he came here to represent. Um, with an absolute unique larrikinism and irreverence. Uh, and one of my first experiences of Alex's particular brand of irreverence was doing Senate hearings uh, together during um, lockdowns in 2020. Uh, and hearings were, of course, conducted remotely um, with senators and witnesses participating um, online. Uh, and at one such hearing, Alex appeared uh, in a peaked cap, um, headphones on, uh, with a very impressive bookshelf in the background uh, against the wall behind him. And so far, so good. Uh, impressive bookshelves were a feature of remote meetings and hearings in 2020. Um, but Alex, of course, went one better. Uh, and he had a large automobile in the background uh, as well. Uh, and I heard a voice um, online over the feed of either a witness or secretariat asking in the background, is that a senator? in a garage, uh, and it was indeed, uh, and car in full view, uh, and from his garage, Senator Alex Gallagher declared those hearings open. Uh, and on that day, and really every day, Alex approached his work here with a completely, like completely unpretentious disposition, um, sprinkled with a fair amount of an up-yours attitude. Um, he had an attitude of good humour alongside the hard work, commitment and dedication that he showed for the people he represented. Uh, and, uh, I have similar recollections to those of Senator Patrick's um, of being, uh, spending many a late night at Senate estimates um, in uh, economics committee hearings um, with Senator Gallagher. Uh, and as a new senator for me, the Labor question pack, of course, was something, was something of um, a lifeline. Uh, to, to keep your head above water and stay afloat. Um, for Alex, uh, it was more of a guide uh, at best. Um, and occasionally it was something to flick through whilst leaning back in his chair, um, getting ready for the next witness, much as one might casually flick through a magazine at the supermarket counter before proceeding to check out, leaving the magazine behind. 
Um, as has been noted, Alex relied instead um, on his own preparation, uh, and he was the same here in the chamber. Um, when Alex spoke in the Senate, he usually did so um, without notes, prosecuting his points admirably um, and always with um, passion. Passion for the workers that he proudly came here to represent uh, and who he never left behind. Uh, and I do think this is what Alex's colleagues will remember the most. He really never forgot where he came from. He never forgot who he went into parliament to fight for. He never stopped being that union organiser on the hustings, representing people working hard in an essential industry, doing the long hauls overnight um, while the rest of us sleep. Uh, and it was indeed in this chamber in my first few weeks here that Alex came uh, and sat down next to me with a clipboard. Uh, and as a former union organiser myself, I knew I was about to be signed up for something. Uh, and for some weeks, I had worn it as a badge of honour that I had not signed up to um, many of the various, to any of the various um, parliamentary friends groups on offer in the early weeks um, of a new parliament. I'd let them all um, fly by in my emails. Uh, but then Alex sat down next to me that day with a pen and a piece of paper. Uh, and looked me straight in the eye. Uh, and so to this day, I am a card-carrying member of his beloved parliamentary friends of road safety. Um, to the end, Alex was always on the side of working people, his people. Uh, and I was one of uh, many of Alex's colleagues who joined online to pay uh, my respects uh, at his funeral um, remotely. Uh, and as a proud life member of my own union, I was deeply moved to see that Alex was making his final journey under the protection of the flag of his union, the Transport Workers' Union. A life spent standing up for working people is indeed a life well lived. A life spent as part of the collective of the labour movement is a life of service to others. Uh, and for that life of service, um, I pay my respects to Alex today and extend my condolences to his family, his friends and his union and again to his best mate, Glenn Stirl. Thank you, President. Senator Colbeck. Mr President, uh, and I would like to associate myself with remarks from all colleagues across the chamber in relation to the tributes they're paying to the life of Senator Alice Gallagher. Uh, he was somebody who was without question true to his beliefs and his values, and they were true Labor values, they were true union beliefs. Um, and as Senator Sheldon said, that's what he was respected for, and he was respected for that across the chamber. Um, I won't share some of my stories about him in a personal sense because they were personal conversations. But they were conversations of fellowship of fellow senators um, and particular circumstances at the time. Uh, and it was they were very human interactions. And they were the things that I really valued about um, working with Alex. We shared again some late nights both on the same side of the table at estimates and uh, on the opposite sides of the table at estimates. And if Alex thought that you were serving up a load of BS, there was absolutely no question that you were going to be told that you were serving up a load of BS, or the officials for that matter, and he just wanted an answer to his question. Um, it, was, it was pretty simple. So with Alex, you knew what you were going to get. Uh, he was. He was just dead set straight. Uh, you knew where he was coming from. You knew why he was coming from there. And the comments that have been made by so many colleagues across the chamber about uh, the fact that he didn't forget where he came from and he didn't change. He was Alice Gallagher, who became a senator through his time as a member in the union movement. And he brought all of those practical elements and experience with him to this place and he applied those to policy. And he was a thinker. He really was. Uh, he, he assessed things and he applied those things and that practical knowledge of the work that he had done to this place. And it's, 
It's spoken about often that uh, one of the great things about Australia's parliament is that people who come from a really grassroots practical background can end up in this place. He's a great example of that as someone who came from a different country, uh, became an Australian citizen and then came here to represent his values, his beliefs and his community in this place, something that we, um, we should all celebrate. Um, the work that he did, that he did in, re in respect of a focus on road safety, and it's a really fitting tribute that was made to him by his union uh, in naming the training centre in South Australia after him. I think that's absolutely a, f a fantastic thing. Um, Sturlow, and apologies for not addressing you as, a, as Senator Stirl, but um, it was mentioned early by Senator Mackenzie, and uh, I'm pleased that you mentioned it as well in your contribution. Um, the, the Waldorf and Stadler thing. Um, Stirl and Gallagher went together like Waldorf and Stadler, in my view. I mean, it was, and some of those late night sittings where you'd seen them, see them both leaning forward with their chin on their elbows, looking across the chamber, obviously comparing something that was going on over there, but they had a synergy and a symbiosis together. They clearly thought uh, the same uh, and a real team. So, so, Glenn, I know that you would miss Alex uh, immensely. Uh, and so particularly my condolences to you as, and to all my other uh, Labor colleagues across the chamber. But Sturlow, I know how much he meant to you, the conversations and the journey that you travelled together over a long period of time. And I certainly did think about um, you a lot when we, when, we lost Gal Al when we lost Alex. 67 is way too soon. 67 is way too soon. Uh, and so to Alex's wife, Paula, Paula um, and his four children and, and extended family, uh, and to all of those in the Labor family, uh, sincere condolences for the loss. Uh, he's a great guy. Um, made a contribution over a decade here in this place. Um, Senator Sheldon talked about him coming here during COVID with all of the things that he was dealing with so that he could make a contribution. And certainly we recognise, I, I recognised uh, the importance and the significance of him doing that at a time that was a significant risk to him through uh, what we were all facing with the national pandemic. Um, and I see him as a genuine loss. So Alex, rest in peace, mate. And uh, to the Labor family and his family, personally, uh, sincerest condolences. Senator O'Neill. much, Mr President. And I rise too to make a contribution to the condolence motion for the passing of the late Senator Alex Gallagher. I want to associate myself with the remarks of all of those who have preceded me. It has been a great telling of the breadth of a man who brought himself, everything of himself, to this chamber. And I think that's the words that I would describe Mr. Senator Gallagher with is absolutely the hardest, one of the hardest working senators that I ever saw in this place. And um, I'm reminded of the day when we actually heard about his passing, standing here in the chamber, as much as we knew that he was unwell, the shock of that coming washed over us. Because we don't expect in this place people that we work with not to show up one day. We know about life and death, but we encounter it in such a profound and intense way in this chamber dedicated to the work. As much as we know about one another and people have spoken about the man, Alex Gallagher, today, I think there was genuinely still this amazing shock amongst all of us that one of our colleagues had gone. And it's, it's in this period of time, this time warp that we're all living, the COVID reality. We're not sure if we're home or we're here. Can we see our friends? Can we see our family? How are we accessing health care? What sort of health care did Alex? All of that was swirling around. But I remind senators that it's only a few months ago that Alex Gallagher was standing up in this chamber on the 24th of February. At two minutes to question time, this is what he said. In the couple of minutes that are available to me, I want to put on the record, and it's a very sombre duty, 
that during the 12 months until the end of December 2020, 170 people died in crashes involving heavy trucks. This includes 104 deaths in crashes involving articulated trucks and 68 deaths involving heavy rigid trucks. I want to put to the Senate a simple proposition. There is probably no other industry in Australia, certainly none that I'm aware of, that incurs this level of death. And the injuries are not stated here today. And the level of death is through the roof. I don't know how, as a government, a state government, a territory government or a council, that we can put up with the fact that we're seeing 170 people die at work. That's where they're dying, at work, on the road, and we're not having an outpouring of a call for action. There have been 170 workplace deaths in the 12 months to the end of 2020. It's a disgrace. The federal parliament should move on it, as should every other parliament in Australia. And I think of all of us here. What we can say in two minutes, what are the snippets of our, con of, of our contributions that people are going to take and take to heart? In those two minutes, so much was said, so much of power, so much of a call for us to serve the nation. Alex Gallagher has been valorised today by members of the Labor Party, by friends and colleagues who have only known him in this place as a Labor senator, but by colleagues who have shared the journey literally on the road with him, with the TWU, unionists, brothers and sisters in arms, who have fought the good fight that still leads us to the point that he described on the 24th of February. Labor, Liberal, National, Green, Independent Senators, all in here with so many good words to speak about a man who gave his all to this job. I was really taken by the comments of my colleague, Senator Mario Smith, who I'm, I'm pleased to see is still in here, um, when she noted the contribution uh, in her mentoring from Alex. He gave her great advice, but one thing stuck. People should believe every word you say. And that's how I heard Alex Gallagher when he spoke in this place. There are people who make contributions and they'll be applauded. And we should accept that there are gifts differing amongst us. But there's something about the truth and its voice that is powerful. And it's a thing that changes us. And if you're very, very lucky, people give of themselves and they come to this place and they speak with truth. And Alex Gallagher did that with passion, with style, with vigour, with energy and with great talent every single time he stood up here and he opened his mouth. And I don't think there'd be a lot of people who would be able to say that about. Constantly speaking the truth. I got to know Alex very slowly. I always felt that he was sort of watching what was going on. And today, when uh, Senator Steele, you, you read the words of Matthew Marozzi, and um, Matthew said he warmed to me, I guess I'd, I'd have to say that's a kind of a similar experience that I had, that Alex watched and he waited. And we really didn't get to work together because we were on different inquiry paths so much of our time here until. Um, I did a few hearings on the, the, the famous RAT committee, which does have a particular flavour of camaraderie that I think brings out the best in so many of the senators who are in it. But um, it was on the multi-jurisdictional management Murray-Darling Basin Plan Committee that I know uh, we, we travelled on, um, Mr President, uh, when you were a, a lowly backbencher and the chair of that committee. And the work that we did on that committee, uh, I think as I just had a look at it today, was evidence of the kind of work that Alex did. He was absolutely always prepared. He absolutely made sure that he knew what was going on, that he'd done all of the reading. And uh, he, he got to a point in the, in the hearing uh, the day of the 11th of December 2019, and he was asking about transparency of water markets. This is a man who can be diminished and described just as a 
hard-working man just. A hard-working man is a great thing, but when you're blessed with the gift of intelligence that he had and he brought to this role, he was able to ask a question about the transparency of water markets, engage in an interchange with experts, allow and invite me into the, the questioning and recover and make a point at the end. And this is what he said. He's one sentence. After a bit of a discussion about it, there is always someone who benefits from information asymmetries. Now that is not the sort of language you're going to hear too much on the two-way radio. But people on the two-way radio know exactly what that feels like. And Alex not only knew what it felt like, he came in here and he told it how it would be received best in whatever context, and he found the words to do that. Not everybody can do that, and I just really, really watched and admired that greatly. I want to um, proclaim him in my experience as a man of insight, a strategic thinker of intelligence, a man who made sure that he had a mastery of the information that he needed to do the job, a preparedness to undertake the tasks that fell to his lap, and a generosity in his leadership as a chair, able to engage and move everyone along together. Towards the end of um, Alex's time here with me, he, uh, he reached out and said, you should come and have a bottle of uh, South Australian wine with me. And we had the most remarkable and memorable evening. I did feel like I was getting an incredible download of insight from a man who had a sense that his time was limited. And I made notes when I left that, that meeting, and I've kept them, because there was incredible sharp insight and truth in what he had to say. Alex Gallagher was a loving husband. Uh, Paola, he spoke of you of many, many times, and he talked about his trips to Italy with you. He also talked about all of his children and his grandchildren with smiles and joy and a genuine love that took him through the days while he was away from you. Well, now in the days that you're away from him, be assured that he never ever left you. His body might not have been with you, but his heart was always with you. And uh, of those trips to Italy, when I asked him if he'd been to many of the places where you go and you look at the sites, he said no. He'd gone to a village and he put his roots down there. That tells you something about the man. He made, he made home in places where it was appropriate to make home and he stuck to places where he could be authentic and genuine. So in, in closing, I want to remind us all, each one of us who valorised uh, Senator Alex Gallagher today, those who've stayed in the chamber for the whole time, uh, those who've made a contribution and those who might be listening and would like to do something. Alex Gallagher, on the 24th of February this year, really put a challenge out to us. The work of road safety is not finished. It affects all of us. We all drive on roads. He showed us a way. If we really are going to honour him, then we should definitely make a commitment in his honour to advance that cause and not lose focus. Can I say to Paola and the family that while I know your, your, your grief is great uh, at this moment, I hope the words that we've put on the record today give you some comfort. And may I say that to all people who loved Alex, his staff, the friends of a lifetime, all the unionists who worked with him and sound, by the sounds of things against him on occasion, uh, to his family, may they find comfort in these words today. And after all your years of hard work, Alex, may you rest in peace. Senator Grogan. Thank you. I rise to pay my respects and to offer my condolences for the sad passing of Senator Alex Gallagher. Alex and I did not know each other well. But I rise to pay my respects as I have taken uh, the sad honour of filling the vacancy that he leaves behind. 
In every sense of the phrase, Alex was a working class man. He'd been a labourer, a truckie, a proud unionist, and a committed member of the Australian Labor Party. And while Alex and I did not know each other well, we had many connections. His early career mirrored that of my own father, who was a labourer, a truckie, and an executive of the Transport and General Workers Union in the UK and in Ireland. And I believe that Alex and I would have had a lot to talk about, and I am poorer for not having the opportunity uh, of those robust discussions with him. When he came to this place, he clearly outlined exactly what he was here for, exactly what his priorities were. The transport industry, road safety and superannuation. And he then pursued those issues keenly and with dedication for the duration of his time here. We've heard a lot about his committee work, um, which is impressive, 23 different committees ranging across a whole all sorts of different areas. His advocacy for transport industry and road safety was unparalleled. He successfully campaigned for the establishment of the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal and then fought passionately against its abolition. He also had the foresight and understanding of the role of the transport industry in reducing emissions. And in his first speech, he noted the industry's contribution to carbon emissions is a significant challenge. Doing nothing is not an option, as passing on the increased costs imposed will have a significant impact on inflation, affecting every household and business in the community. On his death, Alex has been described as a champion for the blue-collar worker, a straight shooter, and someone who dedicated his life to the interests of working people. As Labor leader Anthony Albanese said recently, he was a no-nonsense man who knew what he stood for. He was a fighter, he was dedicated, and his role in this place has been borne out today with all of the comments from people and all of the eulogies. And I would just like to express my deep sympathies to Senator Stirl, to his comrades in the Transport and General, uh, the Transport Workers Union, and also to his wife, Paola, children Caroline, Ian, Terry and Frank, to his grandchildren and his broader family. I am so deeply sorry for the loss of your loved one. May he rest in peace. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I just rise to speak to the family of uh, Alex Gallagher, to Paola, um, on behalf of the people of the Northern Territory, uh, we have incredibly fond memories of his time with us in the Northern Territory, in particular the Transport Workers Union, who I know are listening here today to all of us. Uh, it was an important time when I came into the Senate in 2016 and met Alex for the first time. Uh, along with many other uh, senators here uh, today. But I wanted to share with you, Paolo, to you and your children and grandchildren, uh, some pretty personal moments, uh, in particular uh, with my role here in the Senate. And I've heard uh, my colleagues speak of uh, so many things of Alex, but one of the things that stays with me is his mentoring. And one of the uh, earlier experiences I had, not really a year into the Senate, was travelling to the United Kingdom and working with Alex on uh, one of our committees to inquire into modern slavery. And it was my first time to the United Kingdom, and I was, uh, I was a little bit nervous about going over to where Captain Cook came from. I wasn't quite sure what to think. And um, I don't think I could have travelled with a better, better colleague. Uh, we were able to talk, uh, not all the way on that flight over, but certainly uh, uh, in our time in London, and debate many things about the history of Australia and the history of uh, colonisation, uh, looking at landmarks around London, but also uh, working closely with him on the important role of uh, reducing and getting rid of uh, modern-day slavery 
not just in the UK or around the world, but here in Australia. So that was my first and very important uh, time with, with Alex, which obviously followed on with many other inquiries from there. But what I wanted to share in this moment was the memories of uh, Anzac Day in London and how that trip to London wasn't just about the modern slavery inquiry. I was able to talk with him about the many uh, Aboriginal men and women or the black diggers who fought for our country and were never recognised. And these were really um, important moments for me because with Alex's guidance, I was able to go and have a look at two cemeteries, uh, one in Bournemouth and one in Southampton, to look at, um, in particular, Bournemouth, where one of the private diggers was buried and was never really recognised. And we wanted to make sure he was recognised in the Anzac Day uh, commemorations, in particular there in London. And that was Private William Joseph Punch. He was enlisted to go to war in 1916 and did go to war and died in 1917. And he was buried in the civilian area of the Bournemouth Cemetery and it took a while to find his grave. The other private was Private Benjamin Combo, who enlisted in 1915 uh, to go over and fight for Australia, uh, but unfortunately died on the journey and he was uh, buried at sea. But he was on the honour roll uh, in Southampton in Hollybrook uh, Cemetery. Again, I don't know if I would have had um, a, the, uh, the courage to go and do that and have a look, but also to be able to write about that and to commemorate that on the Anzac Day that we had in London. That was my first opportunity to get to know Alex really well. And I had, uh, excuse me, many times with him and with Sterlo uh, on the Regional and Rural Affairs Transport Committee. And I thought we were a great team. Uh, we worked together strongly for the last five years. And just want to really share with you that uh, with all the things that he did for our country, you know, with working with the TWU, with the Australian Labor Party, uh, here in the Senate, uh, on behalf of all Australians, irrespective of whether people agreed or disagreed with him, uh, he was an outstanding person, uh, a generous, humble, fierce, fiercely strong, but someone that I greatly admired and, uh, and I'm deeply saddened by his loss. My sincere condolences to you, Paula, to the family, to the children and grandchildren, to your extended family and friends. On behalf of all my families in the Northern Territory, say Bawadji Bada, may you rest in peace. Senator, uh, Senator Canavan, Senator Roberts has just indicated on, that he wants to make a contribution remotely and then I'll come to you. Senator Roberts, you have the call. Thank you, Mr. President. Despite knowing of Senator Gallagher's illness and despite having discussed the progress of his treatment with him, I, like many, was shocked and saddened on hearing the sudden news of his passing. It's rare in Queensland that a senator from outside the state is known, let alone highly regarded. And Senator Gallagher, Gallagher and uh, Senator Stuhl are two such people. Yet concurrently, as well as the sadness, and I think the sadness was due to the, the uh, loss that we all felt, I'm also most appreciative for having met him and for having worked with him. He showed qualities that are rare in Parliament, a genuine love of and support for workers and for everyday Australians. A harking back for solid policies based upon data and facts, anchored in the real world, and that's something that's always struck me about Alex, He's anchored in the real world. A realism and a sense for getting to the core of an issue and nothing getting in the way of him getting there. A wry sense of humour that broke out suddenly with gems that punctuated whole issues. And I appreciated his willingness to listen to my views, my positions. Indeed, his quiet yet strong support for issues deeply important to me. In that, I enjoyed his frankness and his openness. He loved our country 
and like so many everyday Australians across our country, searched and hankered for a return to the basics. A traditional old school union leader, a real union delegate, the type for whom I have enormous regard, having dealt with them and worked with them in the mining industry, for their competence, their ability to listen to people, to really listen with genuine interest and genuine care, and to take real action in support. He was quietly assertive, the most effective type of assertiveness, a genuine, deep, grounded care for people and with common sense that showed his strength. Alex's party, our parliament and our nation have lost a caring, thoughtful, strong, practical contributor for whom I have enormous fondness and admiration. My condolences to Alex's family, to his mates and particularly to Glenn and to our whole nation. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I would just like to briefly associate myself with uh, the sentiments of this chamber and the remarks that have been given uh, in, in tribute to uh, Senator Alex Gallagher. Uh, he, uh, he was uh, the type of person that does make this the, the best club in the country. Uh, uh, despite being on the other side of the chamber, he, I know, was always someone that would. Uh, would, would, would engage with everybody in this place, uh, uh, would deal with everybody as an individual, show them respect and, and listen to them, uh, but then go away and, and, and fight for uh, the things that he held true uh, as, a, as a union leader, uh, as a member of the Australian Labor Party and as a senator for South Australia. I hope, I hope that um, Senator Gallagher's passing uh, doesn't let us lose something from this place too. It's, 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 it's sometimes I, I think that the senators like him aren't made anymore, but hopefully that's not the case. Uh, 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 he, he represented uh, something that is, that is great about our nation, uh, uh, a down-to-earth uh, spirit, uh, a a love of uh, egalitarian and fair go culture that we're about, uh, uh, and, and a real defence of uh, honest, hard-working men and women uh, of, of this country. Uh, I didn't get time to work with Alex on, a, on, on many issues. Uh, I just note that uh, today we're, 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 we're paying tribute to Senator Gallagher on the same day that uh, the next step has been taken on the radioactive waste uh, journey. I, uh, that was one issue I dealt with Alex a little bit on, and I really respected his, his uh, no-nonsense attitude to issues like that, uh, where he saw that there was the interest in the advancement of this country to support. Uh, he will be a great loss, or he is a great loss, uh, to this chamber, but uh, his, his legacy and memory uh, should inspire all of us to ensure uh, uh, we do not lose his spirit uh, from this chamber. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I seek leave to in have incorporated into Hansa the speeches from Senators Carr, Senator Carol Brown, and Senator um, Katrina Billick. There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, I wish to also add just a few short remarks uh, to this condolence motion. Uh, Senator Gallagher's journey and I, as, as Senator Stirl said, um, paralleled each other for a little while. Um, we served on a number of committees together, the, the Murray-Darling Committee, uh, 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 but most particularly the Economics Committee, uh, where he was my deputy chair on the Legislation Committee and I was his deputy chair on the References Committee. Uh, and I, I will... I didn't know Senator... Gallagher well. We, we had met on the Rural and Regional Committee, but uh, we probably spent a lot of time together on the Economics Committee in that first six months, uh, uh, the, the, the second half of 2019. And, uh, we were down in Taralgon uh, in Victoria, and we'd had the long drive out and a day's hearings where we heard of the many serious problems faced by that region. Uh, and the committee hearing ended and Alex disappeared. And I thought, oh, it's a long drive home. You know, he and Matthew have got to get back to Melbourne and then back to Adelaide. So I thought, yeah, he's, 
He's jumped in the car and gone. I chatted to a couple of the witnesses and then I went, the, uh, the hearing was held in the RSL. And I went upstairs out of the uh, hearing room. And there was Alex sitting at the bar. He'd already won one bet and he had another one on. And that will be an enduring memory I have of a wonderful senator, a wonderful contributor to this place and my sincere condolences to his family, his friends, his colleagues and his staff. I will now ask you all to rise to join me in a moment's silence to acknowledge the passing of Senator Alex Gallagher, remembering the contribution which he made to the Senate and to signify assent to the motion. Minister. Mr President, Mr President, I move that as a mark of respect to the memory of the late Senator Alex McGackian Gallagher, uh, the Senate do now adjourn. The question is that the Senate do now adjourn. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The Senate stands adjourned until midday tomorrow. <laughs>